little of the Buchenwald touch. The United States also chose to seek Nazi expertise. In 1945, the U.S. State Department, Army Intelligence, and the OSS, the immediate forerunner of the CIA, recruited former Third Reich scientists, granting them immunity, jobs, and new identities in a resettlement program for Nazi scientists. It was named Operation Paperclip for the mode of identifying potential recruits, a simple paperclip placed on each of their dossiers. In exchange, the State Department asked that the scientists resume their old habits, working on secret, non-consensual research projects, many of which exploited patients, but this time throughout the United States. Many scientists, from rocket pioneer Dr. Werner von Braun to former Gestapo chief Klaus Barbie, the butcher of Lyon, entered the country under the aegis of Operation Paperclip. Between 1951 and 1956, for example, German physiologist and former Nazi Herbert Gerstner supervised a total body irradiation, TBI, project of 263 cancer patients at M.D. Anderson Hospital for Cancer Research in Houston, courtesy of Operation Paperclip. Gerstner irradiated the entire bodies of 30 of the hospital's 263 patients, whose ethnicities were not specified. The irradiation destroyed their bone marrow, resulting in fatal anemia and other complications. The patients died rapidly, and the hospital abandoned the experimental approach. In a 1950 memo to senior AEC staff, Dr. Joseph Hamilton warned that radioactive experimentation on the unwitting was unethical and illegal, a flouting of the recently adopted Nuremberg Code of 1947. Among other tenets, the Code required that all human subjects be fully informed of experiments conducted on them, that animal studies be done first, and that no tests be conducted that might harm human subjects. Hamilton warned that the public would be outraged to find American scientists engaged in the very research for which American military lawyers and physicians had condemned the Nazis, as admittedly this would have a little of the Buchenwald touch. Via Operation Paperclip, the U.S. government supplied American hospitals and clinics with 700 Nazi scientists. Because the scientists conducted so many disparate studies, all in secret, no racial breakdown of the Operation Paperclip subjects is possible. By 1947, AEC's Colonel E.E. E. Kirkpatrick expanded the radiation programs when he secretly ordered radioactive injections be given unsuspecting patients and institution inmates throughout America. But why, when the dangers of radiation were already widely known? My father, Elmer Allen, was injected with plutonium a year and eleven months after the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Why, demands Elmerine Whitfield Bell. You had people exposed to high doses of radiation there. Why study here? Scientists did learn much from wartime injuries, but many expressed a need for a more precise, quantitative understanding, which would allow researchers and military forces to avoid harm while working with radiation. However, the strongest clamor for the studies came from the military. Government scientists insisted that a detailed knowledge of radiation's dangers was necessary in order to protect soldiers who were thought to face radiation exposure from the Soviets. Robert Stone, for example, cited an underwater atomic detonation as part of Operation Crossroads in 1947, when radiologists could not reach a consensus about the exact radiation doses that would produce illness in the exposed humans. Experimentation was necessary to settle these questions once and for all, and animal experiments were thought inadequate. As Lawrence Altman's fascinating book, Who Goes First? The Story of Self-Experimentation in Medicine, documents, Western physicians 
have adhered to a long and noble tradition of following animal studies with limited self-experimentation by researchers. This tradition may not always have been prudent, but by testing substances or procedures on themselves before experimenting with appreciable numbers of human subjects, doctors symbolically conveyed their belief that the measures were not inordinately harmful and also signaled a researcher's willingness to share the risks as well as the glory of discovery. But in the 1940s, radiation researchers declined to experiment on themselves. Wright Langham observed, We considered doing such experiments at one time, but plutonium is considered to be sufficiently potentially dangerous to discourage our doing absorption experiments upon ourselves. These doctors needed human subjects, and they turned to the clinic out of habit. But by what ethical rules were the government scientists bound when exposing unwitting patients to dangerous radiation? Robert Stone, the same doctor who crowed about injecting the nigger truck driver, was a passionate advocate of human experiments, and he offered an elegantly written set of ethical guidelines. He suggested that using only the moribund, prisoners serving life sentences, military personnel, and terminally ill cancer patients was morally acceptable. So, in hospitals, schools, and other institutions across the nation, doctors administered exposures to plutonium, X-rays, gamma rays, and radium that far exceeded established tolerance limits. Each time, they claimed to be using subjects in Stone's categories. But as we have seen, Stone and others stretched his morally acceptable categories, casting Cade, Allen, and other hardy but uninformed subjects as frail or terminally ill for the sake of convenience. In June 1947, the Medical Board of Review a blue-ribbon panel of Manhattan Project scientists and university faculty, convened to examine AEC research. It emerged three days later with an official AEC policy that offered extraordinary protections and was given the blessing of the U.S. Advisory Committee on Biology and Medicine. No substance known to be or suspected of being poisonous or harmful could be utilized in research on human subjects unless each one of the following conditions were met. A. That a reasonable hope exists that the administration of such a substance will improve the condition of the patient. B. That the patient gives his complete and informed consent in writing. And C. That the responsible next of kin give in writing a similarly complete and informed consent revocable at any time during the course of treatment. This document represented a quiet revolution in standards. It is the first occurrence of the term informed consent in ethical policy, which meant it was now not enough to gain the assent of radiation subjects. They also had to understand clearly what they were being exposed to and whether this application constituted treatment, research, or both. However, there is even more in the AEC policy. The requirement that the next of kin also give consent was truly progressive. It was important because many of the subjects were too desperate, too poorly educated, or too poorly informed to appreciate what their doctors proposed to do to them. Abusive experiments of the post-war era are often excused on the grounds that critics are wielding present-day standards to judge decades-old research. But this 1947 policy demonstrates that such abusive experiments were as morally unacceptable in their time as they are in ours. Unfortunately, the sweeping protections of the AEC policy were not widely distributed, and scientists routinely flouted their own policy. Stone and his colleagues cited military expediency as the justification for involuntary medical experimentation. But with the exception of AEC physician Shields Warren, 
they did not seem to realize that they were invoking the same justification that Nazi doctors used in conscripting prisoners and concentration camp victims for horrific experimental exposures. Shields Warren, however, observed in 1950, It's not long since we got through trying Germans for doing exactly the same thing. In October 1952, the United States Air Force Military Personnel Center, AFMPC, decided to adopt the Ten Rules of the Nuremberg Code on the advice of Pentagon personnel lawyer Stephen S. Jackson. In 1953, Secretary of Defense Charles Wilson issued a memo that established the Nuremberg Code as Defense Department DOD policy. Wilson now required experimental subjects to sign an informed consent statement setting out the nature, duration, and purpose of the experiment, the method and means by which it is to be conducted, all inconveniences and hazards reasonably to be expected, and effects upon his health or person which may possibly come from his participation in the experiment. But despite the adoption of the Nuremberg Code, scientists persisted in approximately 50 experimental radiation abuses within hospital corridors from Los Angeles to Rochester, New York. The Manhattan Project and the Atomic Energy Commission spearheaded research, some of which persisted through the 1970s. Between 1963 and 1971, a Dr. Heller irradiated the gonads of 131 prisoners in Oregon, including at least 66 Negro volunteers, with radioactive thymidine. Vanderbilt University physicians administered radioactive cocktails to pregnant women in Nashville. The University of Chicago fed the radioactive elements strontium and cesium to 102 unwitting patients at state schools. One Dickensian institution, the Fernald School in Waltham, Massachusetts, added radioactive oatmeal to the menus of 30 orphans in a program sponsored by the AEC with the support of the Quaker Oats Company. Old videotapes reveal that some of these Fernald boys were African American, but no records with racial identifiers were ever released. When victims died, government scientists obtained their bodies and autopsied them carefully, measuring the levels of radioactivity and biological damage. To enable large numbers of these grim assessments, at least 15,000 bodies were exposed and collected for one project alone, Operation Sunshine. Until the mid-1980s, and without the knowledge of patients or their next of kin, this program shipped the bodies and body parts of radiation experiment victims to be dissected at headquarters in Los Alamos, New Mexico. Between 1960 and 1972, University of Cincinnati radiologist Eugene L. Sanger, M.D., directed experimental high-dose TBI on a total of 200 cancer patients, of whom 150 were black. The TBI method was dangerous, utilizing magnavolt X-rays, cobalt-60 or cesium-137, to administer the equivalent of 15,000 chest X-rays to the entire body. Patients typically received from 100 to 400 rads. A rad is a unit of absorbed radiation with a complex definition. 150 rads, a common TBI dosage, is equivalent to 400 mammograms. 42% of the subjects given higher doses died within weeks, and some within days. However, a minority of the subjects received partial body radiation, PBI, which spared some portions of the body. When he proposed the experiments in hopes of funding and support from the Army Director of Nuclear Medicine in 1958, Sanger gave an experimental rationale, explaining, These studies are designed to obtain new information about the metabolic effects of total body and partial body irradiation, so as to have a better understanding of the acute and subacute effects of irradiation in the human he deemed such information necessary to allow scientists to protect military personnel 
who might be irradiated during a war. The army agreed to fund his experiments, but it expressed doubts, because doctors already knew there were radiosensitive cancers, which responded to radiation treatment, and radio-resistant cancers, which typically did not. By the 1940s, TBI was found effective against some radiosensitive cancers, which were disseminated widely throughout the body, such as leukemia and lymphoma, but not against the localized radio-resistant cancers that Sanger studied. However, the subjects in Sanger's experiments, such as the 82 patients in Cincinnati General Hospital, 51 of whom were black, were told only that the TBI was a treatment for their cancers. Among their catastrophic effects, these high doses destroyed the subject's bone marrow, and because bone marrow produces red blood cells, the TBI proved quickly fatal to one out of every four subjects who died within about a month after suffering anemia, vomiting, and falling white blood cell counts, which left them open to a variety of infections. If one also counts patients who received PBI, 85 of the 111 people Sanger irradiated at Cincinnati General were black. TBI experiments were also conducted by doctors at other Cincinnati hospitals, at Sloan Kettering Memorial Cancer Center in New York, at Texas's Baylor University College of Medicine, at the Naval Hospital in Bethesda, Maryland, and at the AEC Hospital in Oak Ridge. Only one of the administering physicians was an African-American, Howard Perry, M.D., who vigorously denied that the experiments had any racial component. He died before this book was conceived, so I had no opportunity to interview him. However, his lawyer, Brian Hurley, wrote to Martha Stevens, author of The Treatment, that Perry was a compassionate man who had been falsely accused of targeting other blacks for radiation experiments. Other radiation scientists assailed the description given by Sanger and his deputy Dr. Clarence Lushbaugh of TBI for radio-resistant cancers as therapy, and insisted that his experiments were too dangerous. Carl Morgan, who had considered Sanger a friend and had worked with Lushbaugh at Oak Ridge, said in 1994, I think the case of Clarence Lushbaugh's treatment of humans as guinea pigs and Eugene Sanger's at the hospital in Cincinnati are some of the most terrible human studies I ever heard of, other than those that took place in Germany and a few in Japan during the war. Sanger at first insisted to AEC interviewers in 1994 that written informed consent had been unnecessary for his experiments. Later, Cincinnati General produced consent signatures for TBI subjects, but the subject's survivors questioned them. For example, Gloria Nelson, the granddaughter of subject Amelia Jackson, pointed out that a signed consent form was produced from her grandmother's file, but that Jackson had never learned to read or write. Dr. Eugene Sanger stated in congressional hearings that race, IQ, or socioeconomic standing were not selection factors. Officially, he explained the racial disparity by saying that the experimental population merely reflected the racial component of the hospital populations where they worked. His testimony, however, is contradicted by his research partner, Clarence Lushbaugh, who explained in 1995 that they chose slum patients because these persons don't have any money and they're black and they're poorly washed. These persons were available in the University of Cincinnati to Dr. Sanger. I did review what he was doing, and I thought it was actually well done. In 1972, Sanger's TBI projects ended when the DOD cut funding for them, after the university had accrued more than $850,000. Sanger no longer referred to his work as investigative, he defended his experiments as cancer treatments and pointed out that such radiation treatments are used today for cancer treatment. They are used in extreme cases, but today's irradiations, including bone marrow transplants, bear little resemblance to the experiments carried out by Sanger. Today's procedures are therapeutic 
and reserved for those whose cancer is widely spread and non-responsive to other methods. Because the irradiation destroys the bone marrow, marrow for transplant is acquired for reinfusion after the procedure. Unfortunately, it is more difficult to match the bone marrow of African Americans, who tend to have a richer complement of antibodies than do most whites. This means that, like Marion Sims's enslaved vesicovaginal fistula patients, the black TBI subjects' experiences eventually enabled cancer treatments from which blacks are less likely to profit than are whites. Moreover, Sanger's patients did not have to die to provide such information. Researchers had known at least since 1956 that TBI destroys the bone marrow, but now they could calibrate the lethal doses more precisely. Sanger, who was still a professor emeritus at the University of Cincinnati Medical School as this book went to press, did not reply to my telephoned interview requests through the UC Press Relations Office or to emails in which I asked him to discuss his work. But in his public statements, he defends his research as therapeutic and consensual. The venerable American College of Radiology agreed, exonerating Sanger of wrongdoing on the basis of his denials and by ignoring the rules that governed experimentation during his tenure as a DOD researcher. The trajectory of Sanger's medical career did not falter, and he never faced criminal charges. Martha Stevens, a University of Cincinnati English professor, has written The Treatment, a comprehensive and unflinching history of the TBI tests. Its chapters describe the long, bitter fight for justice that finally culminated in a $5 million 1999 settlement between 13 researchers and the subject's survivors. The agreement also stipulated that the university would erect a permanent memorial naming the victims. And in June 2000, it complied by installing a small, curiously dated plaque labeled Dedicated to the Patients of the Radiation Experimentation, 1973 to 1974, and listing the names of over 170 patients. The plaque was placed on the medical school grounds behind a dumpster and nestled between the kitchen and the parking garage. Sanger's use of mostly black subjects was a matter of convenience and culture, but other radiation experiments offered scientific rationales for deliberately targeting black subjects. Like the scientific racists of a century earlier, investigators wished to demonstrate that blacks would respond differently to radiation's medical dangers. The design of such experiments required African-American subjects. Many such experiments were conducted at the Medical College of Virginia, MCV, part of Virginia Commonwealth University. Between 1949 and 1960, the MCV was home to a secret metabolic laboratory whose principal focus was the Army's preparation for massive nuclear casualties. MCV was chosen in part because it was a heavily research-oriented school in the South, and the government had a particular interest in black subjects. For example, one MCV experiment sought to determine whether radiation inflicted different degrees of damage on the skins of black people than on that of whites. In 1947, Everett Idris Evans, at the behest of the Surgeon General of the Army, set up the nation's first civilian burn unit at MCV, funded by the Army. Evans planned to compare the burn injuries radiation caused in whites to those it caused in blacks. Some were charity patients who had been severely burned in accidents and whose use as experimental material constituted payment for their care by MCV staff. But MCV researchers deliberately caused third-degree burns to the skins of other patients at Dooley, a charity hospital for black children, and at St. Philip, its sister hospital for black adults. These hospitals eventually yielded 100 black subjects a year between the ages of 6 months and 90 years for similar MCV burn experiments. 
doctors used radiation emitted at graduated levels to measure the precise amount of energy necessary to induce specific levels of first to third degree burns. Investigators also produced the radiation burns on the arms of 44 whites at different area hospitals, and at least in some cases, scientists acknowledged that these were produced for investigational purposes. The doctors and radiation physicians used their data to calculate the numbers of people who would die at specific distances from a nuclear bomb, like that detonated over Hiroshima, approximately 20 kilotons. Evans's team deduced that blacks suffered more intense burns than whites after the same exposure, and from this, researchers concluded that radiation burns from a nuclear event would injure blacks much more severely than whites. Another experimental group of 460 black and 770 white patients in the Medical College of Virginia was injected with a variety of radioactive substances. Including phosphorus 32, without their consent. Blacks made up 37 percent of these experimental subjects, nearly four times their representation in the population. The AEC also sponsored 15 other radiation studies on 300 black patients at New Orleans Charity Hospital. The studies were conducted by Tulane University physicians. The most toxic of these experiments involved dispensing mercury, in yet another study of disparate racial reactions to radiation. Twenty-two black patients were made to swallow radioactive mercury in order to calibrate its symptoms and the length of time the body took to excrete the toxic metal. In another Tulane experiment, doctors surreptitiously placed radioactive mercury into the open sores. That remained just after they had removed blisters from a dozen colored and three white patients, in order to judge the metal's effects on healing times. They amassed no clinically meaningful data. Despite the MCV findings that blacks were more vulnerable to radiation burn damage, an illogical belief persisted among doctors and radiologic technicians that African Americans could tolerate increased amounts of radiation than could whites. Without ill effect, like the belief that blacks better tolerate pain than do whites, this stubborn myth gave license to conduct painful and dangerous experimental radiation practices. In 1968, consumer activist Ralph Nader complained to the Washington Post about the nationwide practice of giving Negroes 25 to 50 percent stronger X-ray doses than white patients. G. J. Tarleton, a professor of radiology at the predominantly black Meharry Medical College in Nashville, Tennessee, swiftly dismissed the claim as a fantastic charge. But California radiologic technicians, conducting a 1966 survey, revealed that 72 percent of the state's X-ray technicians had opted on their own initiative to administer these higher X-ray exposures to blacks. Because of their vague beliefs that African Americans were physiologically different, their bones are harder and denser, their skin is darker, their flesh is tougher. Physicians from the Public Health Service and the American College of Radiology denied ever issuing such advisories to doctors, but it was technicians, not doctors, who were making the experimental adjustments, without citing their actions in the official medical records. Also, despite the denials, physicians were being taught to administer higher than indicated radiation doses to blacks. For example, the 1963 edition of X-ray Technology by Charles A. Jacoby and Don Q. Paris, a standard textbook, contained a charted recommendation that the standard radiation doses should be increased for Negro X-ray patients. In 1968. A study commissioned by Bernard Goldman, director of the New York State Bureau of X-ray, also found that a significant portion of technicians had exposed blacks to higher radiation doses than whites, leading the New York State Health Department to specifically prohibit the practice. 
there were many other racially mediated radiation experiments. For example, the AEC irradiated 235 African American newborns in 1953 to 1954 in various hospitals across the nation. But the released radiation records give very sparse details. However, we know that biophysics professor Dr. Lester Van Middlesworth injected each of six black newborns with 1.5 microcuries of radioactive iodine-131 in a 1940 program at Vanderbilt University in Nashville. Records also reveal that six of the seven infants injected at John Gaston Hospital, a now defunct public hospital in Memphis, were also black, and their doctors measured their uptake of iodine, which targets the thyroid gland, 24 hours later, so they could learn more about how the gland functions in infants. Today, radioactive tracers are used for therapeutic or screening purposes in smaller, safer amounts. No one should avoid such tests, which trade a low radiation risk for significant health benefits. But these were not therapeutic injections, and their risks were unjustifiable. The experimental use of radiation to harm and to stigmatize African Americans is not entirely relegated to the distant past. In 1978, scientists revisited an experiment that had been conducted between 1940 and 1959 at several sites, including New York University Hospital. There, scientists irradiated the scalps of 2,500 children, 625 of them black, to treat their tinea capitis, or ringworm. Without notification to their parents, children were taken from classrooms for the x-ray treatments, and their burns and side effects were carefully assessed, raising the question whether the x-ray treatments were chiefly experimental rather than therapeutic in nature. Blacks made up 9.8% of the U.S. population in 1940. So these children were represented at two and a half times their rate in the population. Between 1910 and 1959, before effective topical medications were developed, 200,000 children around the world received about 175 rads each for treatment of ringworm. But by 1940, when NYU irradiated children, researchers had known for over 25 years that this level of radiation was extremely dangerous, and the standard treatment for ringworm was not irradiation, but ultraviolet light or topical chemotherapy. In 1978, the American Journal of Public Health published an article in which NYU researchers assessed the psychiatric results this irradiation had had on the developing brains of 177 of the subjects. They administered the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory, MMPI, to 118 whites and 59 blacks. NYU had included in the experiment a control group of 1,800 children who had been treated with chemotherapy, 450 of whom, or 25%, were black. Researchers found more psychological symptoms and deviant personality scores among the adult whites who had been treated by irradiation than among those who had been treated with topical medication. But they found that the radiation-treated black subjects had no more psychiatric symptoms than medically treated blacks, and this suggested to them that radiation levels that could cause brain damage in whites did not affect blacks. Some researchers have suggested brain insults at birth have relatively less impact among blacks on the risk of subsequent neuropsychiatric disorders than among whites, the article stated. This conclusion recalls both the baseless belief that higher doses of radiation were needed in blacks to produce the same effects as in whites, and the previously discussed belief that some disorders, such as syphilis and tuberculosis, affect blacks in a manner that spares their nervous systems and brains. However, investigators admitted to serious flaws in their experimental design. The MMPI is ethnically biased and less sensitive in discerning pathology among African Americans. Also, 
researchers tested fewer than 10% of the original subjects, and this small sample size may also have distorted the results. Black Body Radiation In more cases than not, the victims are African Americans. You're dealing with the majority of people of African American descent. My mother thinks it's a grand-scale plan, insists Elmarine Whitfield-Bell. Is she right? For some radiation research programs, the racial breakdown has been obscured by the engineered atmosphere of deceit and secrecy. Even patient names are missing, lost forever with case records. But all extant data indicate that a higher number of African Americans than whites were used in many clandestine radiation experiments. As mentioned earlier, subject advocate E. Cooper Brown of the National Committee for Radiation Victims estimated that three of every five radiation victims were people of color. Seventy-five percent of the subjects in the University of Cincinnati irradiation experiments were African American. But the real significance is the fact that African Americans were typically used in significantly greater proportions than the 10 to 12 percent of the population they have constituted. In 1993, DOE Secretary Hazel O'Leary, the first African American to hold that position, displayed refreshing candor as she reacted to graphic press allegations of the government's experimentation on its own citizens. She admitted the agency's guilt and ordered the selective declassification of vital nuclear information. In December 1993, she ordered the opening of all DOE records of the 435 human radiation experiments conducted between 1944 and the 1990s. O'Leary's investigation ushered in a new atmosphere of openness to replace decades of Machiavellian Cold War secretiveness. As she explained, we've learned that openness helps to bring a corrective to government, and quickly. She ordered 665 cubic feet of original declassified documents and investigation results stored in the National Archives and mounted on DOE websites. This is the sort of forthrightness that would have prevented the investigative failures of the Tuskegee Ad Hoc Committee. On January 15, 1994, President Clinton created the Advisory Committee on Human Radiation Experiments, ACHRE, to investigate fully the genesis of these experiments and to judge them. The committee was also charged with making sure that these abuses could never be repeated. Clinton also issued an apology on October 3, 1995, but few seem to know this. It was drowned out by the din that accompanied the O.J. Simpson verdict, which was announced a few hours later. Clinton's brief remarks did not mention any racial component of the studies. The revelations of the committee facilitated civil lawsuits brought against the government and universities by hundreds of victims and survivors. Some cases have been successful, such as those mounted by the chiefly black victims of the Cincinnati TBI experiments. Others are still being contested. However, the ACHRE chose to interview the researchers and publish the resultant oral histories instead of charging them with crimes. None of the physicians conducting the radiation experiments were ever placed on trial. The radiation experiments capture the moment when an important group of physician scientists ceased to view themselves as healers and benefactors first, with disastrous results for their victims and for American medicine. For African Americans, the full costs in lost health and lost trust are still being reckoned. Even today, events occasionally remind us that racism and radiation experimentation remain linked at locations such as the Savannah River site. Locals call it simply the SRS. Located just outside Aiken, South Carolina, owned by the DOE, and managed by South Carolina's Westinghouse Savannah River Company, WSRC. This high-tech manufacturing facility once produced tritium and plutonium-239 for nuclear weapons. Now that the Cold War has abated, 
it processes nuclear waste. Approximately 2,800 of SRS's 14,000 employees are black, and by 2002, they had filed at least 22 lawsuits. These complain that black employees were denied promotions, were subjected to racist graffiti, found nooses hanging in their lockers, and were subjected to higher radiation levels than were whites. We have disciplined employees, including terminating an employee for incidents involving nooses, WSRC President Robert Peaty confirmed for the Augusta Chronicle in 2002. In 1997, the Department of Labor ordered Westinghouse to compensate seven black SRS workers. But even worse, blacks complain that they are relegated to the high radiation areas of the plant, dubbed the Coon Areas by whites. James Ruttenberg of the University of Colorado School of Medicine assessed employee radiation readings between 1991 and 1998 using their dosimeters, individual radiation counters. His findings corroborate these workers' claims. When all annual dose measurements are grouped by race, the doses for blacks are higher than for whites in all dose categories. The annual penetrating doses for blacks are about 1.8 times as high as the doses for whites. The analyses support the hypothesis that these differences are due to job placement practices that put blacks in jobs that have higher radiation exposures than whites. Yet their requests for transfer to safer areas have been denied. Jimmy Walker, for example, inhaled plutonium at the plant in 1977. This drove his exposure beyond the permitted lifetime dose of 50 rems. A rem is a measure of radiation dose, essentially a rad that is adjusted for its biological effect. In 2002, after multiple permanent transfer requests were ignored, his radiation level soared to more than 80 rems, nearly twice the permitted lifetime exposure, and he retired at age 48 in poor health. The exposures also placed Walker at risk of becoming an experimental subject. At a 2002 checkup, a company doctor pressed into Walker's hands a leaflet suggesting he donate his body to a radiation research project at Washington State University. In return, his family would receive $500. I feel betrayed by the company, by the government, Walker told London's independent newspaper in 2002. Now they have admitted the radiation causes cancer. All the time they were telling me there was nothing to worry about. By 2002, the DOE had paid out $25 million to black workers in 62 settlements, but the company admits no wrongdoing. African-American radiation victims are neither silent nor passive. Elmer Allen's daughter, Elmerine Whitfield Bell, is an activist who challenges abusive experimentation and refuses to let the memory of her father and the other radiation victims fade from memory with the headlines. What I really want to come from this, Bell says, is some type of coalition of victims and survivors of radiation treatments and experiments so that we can get together and really speak to the issue on a national and on an international basis. I'm determined that as long as I breathe, I will address the issue of radiation and how to eradicate this sort of experimentation from the earth. It will always be used against poor folk. We have to do something. Chapter 10. Caged Subjects Research on Black Prisoners I am disturbed that the World Medical Association is now hedging on its claws about not using criminals as experimental material. The American influence has been at work on its suspension. One of the nicest American scientists I know was heard to say, Criminals in our penitentiaries are fine experimental material and much cheaper than chimpanzees. Pertinax, British Medical Journal, 
January 1963. On a brightly promising early spring day in 2004, Jesse Williams and I share brunch in a Philadelphia seafood house splashed with bright jewel-like colors. Against a backdrop of sunny seascapes and murmuring besuited executives, Williams affably recited his resume, detailing the grim expertise in pain and survival he had accrued during his four decades imprisoned in the Holmesburg prison system, the Stygian scientific kingdom of University of Pennsylvania dermatologist Dr. Albert M. Kligman. The evening before, Williams a massive, imposing man with a boxer's build, a bald head, a piercing gaze, and stentorian delivery, had spoken eloquently at a showing of Acres of Skin, the documentary based upon Alan Hornblum's incisive book of the same title, an expose of the decades of Kligman's medical experimentation at Holmesburg. Williams told the audience of being burned by radiation and sulfuric acid, of immersing his arms in chemicals that had tanned his skin like leather, and of how physicians and technicians had rubbed acid into his scrotum until the skin fell away, all for three dollars a session. Researchers had cut his armpits to study the glands, and laced his back with scars in an attempt to induce the disfiguring ropey overgrowths called keloids. Not only patches of poison oak and ivy, but also cadaveric tissue had been implanted in his back, and he had inhaled vapors infused with influenza and other viruses. Patch tests of various harsh chemicals and ointments had left a checkerboard of rectangular scars on his back. Detergents, whose names he did not know, had removed his hair and abraded his scalp. Williams had offered himself up for as many as twelve experiments at once, bringing in from thirty to fifty dollars for each multi-session research study. Yet, he said, we were never told what was going on. We never had witnesses or a receipt for, copy of, anything we signed. Before the audience, Williams had been practiced and powerful. But I shared a tete-a-tete with a more subdued man, one invested with a gentle but direct manner, and who spoke with complete candor about a violent past that included jail stints for robbery and assault. I've done it all, he admitted quietly. He is now a Christian, and he spoke sadly of the many former inmates who died in broken health, and of his concern for another seriously ill subject. Only after being prodded to speak of his own plight did he lament his myriad physical problems, from leg ulcers to mental changes to chronic skin problems, which he ascribed to the testing. The doctors can't tell me what it is. They don't know what I was tested with. Williams confided his regret of never having achieved the education he desperately wanted, and he voiced ambivalence about displaying his scars, physical and mental, for strangers in order to gain support for an inmate's lawsuit. I feel I'm on display in the zoo sometimes. He sat back and sighed softly. No one should ever have to go through what we went through. Not again. Not in a civilized country. When Robert Boyle, the 17th century father of chemistry, mused upon the feasibility of scientific research with humans, he proposed, Trial might be made on some genuine human bodies, especially those of malefactors. From the testing of inoculation practices, to the use of cadavers for dissection and display. The medical community has turned to jail inmates first when it sought experimental subjects. Even a 1910 editorial in the Black Physician's chief publication, the fledgling Journal of the National Medical Association, proposed that prisoners were the most appropriate medical research subjects. JNMA suggested that prisoners might simultaneously expiate their debt to society and protect others, especially African Americans, by substituting for them as unwilling research subjects. Black physicians wish to pursue research while protecting their African American patients, and the use of prisoners was an alternative with which everyone, black and white, could be comfortable. 
But why are prisoners such universally desirable subjects for medical research? Boyle was only adhering to the inexorable logic of his profession when he suggested that medical experimentation was most acceptable when practiced upon prisoners. In his time, prisoners were vulnerable, stigmatized, and expendable. They tended to be poor and uneducated. They were likely to belong to despised and powerless minority groups. They had already lost most important civil rights and their crimes, or alleged crimes, made them feared and hated. They were barred from assuming any useful role in society, which, in turn, begrudged them even the sparsest expenditures for their room and board, for which some 18th-century prisoners were billed. Few had families or much support from the family they had. In Boyle's time, as in our own, prisoners were viewed as dangerous parasites, who would not be missed should something happen to them. Boyle's shrewd suggestion has even been shared by prisoners, as some clamor for inclusion in medical investigations for reasons that are examined hereafter. But in our time, there has been another motivation. Prisoners are ideal subjects for Phase I trials. Federal regulations dictate that modern human medical experiments consist of at least three formal phases. Highly simplified, these are Phase 1, which asks, how safe is this drug? Phase 2, which continues evaluating safety while also seeking to determine how effective is this drug? And if the treatment seems safe and effective, the trial proceeds to Phase 3, which compares the treatment to the standard treatment, using subjects treated with the investigative therapy and the control group treated with the current standard of care, if one exists. If not, the control group may be given a placebo, an inert sham treatment to enable a comparison with the new therapy. Phase I trials use healthy volunteers to test the safety of the treatment, looking for side effects and the best mode of administration. Because they are the first human tests, Phase I trials carry a higher risk of problems, such as side effects, than do other trials. For this reason, companies prefer Phase I trials to take place in institutions where subjects can be carefully monitored and are unlikely to be lost to follow-up. If serious problems develop, the researchers want to know. Prisoners fit the bill nicely. Around 1963, Robert Batterman, M.D., an expert in pharmaceutical experimentation, said, Phase I is very big in prisons. The FDA prefers Phase I to be on an inpatient basis. The only place available for large-scale toxicity studies is prison. He also added, The vast majority of new drugs, more than 90%, never get into medical practice. They prove too toxic and fall by the wayside in Phase II. That Jesse Williams and thousands of his fellow incarcerated research subjects were African American is no accident. African Americans have always been dramatically overrepresented in jails and prisons, at national rates of 40 to 61 percent of all the incarcerated. So any discussion of U.S. inmates is closely bound up with race, and medical experimentation behind bars is no exception. Some influential white scientists such as Italian physician Cesar Lombroso, whose theories were discussed in Chapter 3, did not distinguish between blacks and criminals. In 1911, Lombroso observed, There exists a group of criminals, born for evil, against whom all social cures break as though against a rock, emphasis added, a fact which compels us to eliminate them completely, even if by death. This group consisted of men who were inherently, immutably evil because of their deranged physiology. They were also, in his view, more likely to be black than white. When Lombroso sought to illustrate his theories of criminal man, he unhesitatingly chose an African society, the Dinka of the Upper Nile, as the perfect example of born savage criminals. The Dinka were no more bellicose than many other societies on other continents, but their dark skin was enough to qualify them for this distinction. 
Among the physical stigmata that conclusively signaled their criminal nature were dark skin and the concomitant inability to blush. Inability to blush has always been considered the accompaniment of crime and shamelessness, warned Lombroso. Blushing is very rare among idiots and savages. Medical theories of criminality are important because medicine has long claimed a special provenance over criminality. The very frequent reference to a prison as a site of rehabilitation and treatment is the sine qua non of modern penology. Illegal behavior was medicalized in an 1870 statement of the Congress of the American Prison Association. A criminal is a man who has suffered under a disease evinced by the perpetration of a crime, and who may reasonably be held to be under the dominion of such disease, until his conduct has afforded very strong presumption not only that he is free from its immediate influence, but that the chances of its recurrence have become exceedingly remote. Dr. Carl Menninger, often called the Dean of American Psychiatry, was a psychoanalyst, Harvard professor, and scion of the dynasty of psychiatrists who founded the Menninger Clinic in Topeka, Kansas. His lectures and readable books helped bring mental disorders out of the dark closet of shame and secrecy in which they had languished until the mid-20th century. He also had a special sympathy for prisoners, but he attributed criminal behavior not to the constitutional evil of Lombroso's conscious-deprived criminal man, but to a limited psyche, the spasms and struggles of a sub-marginal human being trying to make it in our complex society with inadequate equipment. African-American behavior has long been pathologized in a similar manner. In fact, the imaginary black diseases dreamed up by the American School of Pathology are psychiatric disorders with a strong forensic bias. As described in Chapter 1, they ascribed illegal behavior as well as pathological behavior to blacks, and the medicine Dr. Samuel A. Cartwright prescribed was punishment by whips or hard labor. 20th century corrections personnel perpetuated this medical pathologizing of behavior by making references to borderline personality disorders, antisocial personalities, and sociopaths within their walls who had never been so diagnosed by a medical professional. San Quentin prison psychiatrist Dr. Harvey Powelson, for example, discussed how in the 1950s staff recklessly made diagnoses of inmates from Rorschach tests, a then popular diagnostic tool that involved interpreting responses to inkblot patterns. My sense of the situation is that adult authority used the tests for rationalizations for what they'd already decided based upon their own intuition. Dark Days at Holmesburg Prison In 1998, Alan Hornblum published Acres of Skin, which documents the abusive experimentation conducted at Philadelphia's Holmesburg Prison Complex by Dr. Albert M. Kligman between the 1950s and 1970s. Most of this research was practiced upon African-American men, says Hornblum. Not only that, but they were used for the worst, most dangerous experiments. Kligman, a dermatologist, was initially invited to Holmesburg Prison in 1951 to treat an outbreak of athlete's foot. But his initial reaction to Holmesburg was far from therapeutic and gave Hornblum's book its title. All I saw before me were acres of skin. It was like a farmer seeing a fertile field for the first time. Soon, Kligman was inducing foot fungus, not treating it, because he saw the opportunity to conduct lucrative experiments upon thousands of captive bodies for at least 33 major pharmaceutical and cosmetic companies, such as Johnson & Johnson, Merck, Helena Rubinstein, and DuPont. During World War II, prisoners had been commonly used as research subjects, and after the war, the United States was the only nation in the world continuing to legally use prisoners in clinical trials. Federal, pharmaceutical, and cosmetic companies' money catalyzed a 30-year boom in research with prisoners. 
Throughout the 1950s and 1960s, Kligman gained exclusive experimental use of inmate bodies, testing 153 experimental drugs between 1962 and 1966 alone. 75% of Holmesburg's inmate population, including Jesse Williams, were administered cosmetics, powders, and shampoos that caused baldness, extensive scarring, and permanent skin and nail injury. Fingernails were removed or deformed by punch biopsies, in which a physician employs a special forceps or a biopsy punch to obtain a full thickness circular sample of skin or nail. The subject's backs were so covered by flailed, discolored, and scarred skin from various patch tests of chemicals that the distinctive checkerboard or striped skin was a sure tip off that the man was an ex con. If you ever saw guys on the beach, you would know where the hell they've been, explained former guard Joseph Dade. Withers Ponton, a lifer in his eighties, complained of a back all marked up with bad blackheads and scars after a quarter century of patch tests. That first test nearly killed me. It was so painful I nearly went through the wall. But he eventually participated in more than fifty tests during a forty month stint at a county jail. For which he earned seven thousand dollars. When Kligman used prisoners to devise the anti-acne medication Retin A, it made him a millionaire. Jailed subjects were also inoculated with herpes, vaccinia, and wart viruses, and were exposed to Staphylococcus and Manilia. Their skin was exposed to everything from radioisotopes to temperature extremes. Dow Chemical Company also paid Kligman to test dioxin, a suspected carcinogen, which he applied to the skin of seventy prisoners, mostly black. He also inoculated men with syphilis, gonorrhea, malaria, and amoebic dysentery. Each participant earned anywhere from ten to seven hundred dollars, depending upon the length, danger, and unpleasantness of the research. But in the fall of 1965. The FDA became alarmed when the Journal of American Medical Association (JAMA) published Kligman's article based on research in which he covered inmates' torsos with the banned substance dimethyl sulfoxide (DSMO), an oily industrial solvent. The FDA began scrutinizing his work, and its documents cite irregularities and falsification of reports, alarm over Kligman's extremely large number of investigations. And concern that he was dabbling in areas far removed from his specialty, dermatology. FDA documents also condemned Kligman's practice of routinely enrolling inmates in multiple studies simultaneously, which multiplied their health risks and clouded the source of any adverse effects. What's more, Kligman's record-keeping discrepancies were rife. He, like many other prison investigators, destroyed or lost medical files. This allowed them to claim later, among other things, that African Americans were not disproportionately represented in abusive procedures. On July 19th, the FDA removed Kligman from its list of approved researchers and notified sponsors that he no longer was eligible to perform drug testing. But just a month later, the FDA restored his privileges. The FDA's concern that Kligman was venturing too far afield of dermatology. His area of expertise was certainly warranted. He began performing chemical warfare tests for the army and the CIA using psychotropic agents. Perhaps the most harrowing experimental accounts are those of CIA mind control experiments, in which psychoactive substances, including Schedule II drugs, those with a high abuse risk, were administered to inmates as part of the MK Ultra program. A CIA research program conducted from 1953 through the 1970s to produce the perfect truth drug for interrogating Soviet intelligence operatives. According to Kligman's own statements, he was operating essentially unregulated, and with inmates who participated because they had been told neither the nature of the tests nor the risks they were taking. In 1972, he enthused. It was years before the authorities knew that I was conducting various studies on prisoner volunteers.
Things were simple then. Informed consent was unheard of. No one asked me what I was doing. It was a wonderful time. The government tests were conducted from three trailers on the prison grounds. Some inmates gave these tests a wide berth because it was rumored that they involved LSD and drove men crazy. But others eventually entered them, drawn by the money, which was more than what was paid for skin tests. Half of these subjects reported frightening hallucinations that lasted for days. But prisoners say that they were never given consent forms or told what drugs they were being given. Edward Anthony, a black Holmesburg inmate during the mid-1960s, said that after he suffered rashes from the skin tests, he moved on to the more lucrative army experiments. I don't remember much of what happened after I was given the injection, he said. But I know once it wore off, I was a different person than before. I used to be a mild-mannered person, but now I have drastic mood swings and have trouble controlling my temper. Jesse Williams gives a similar account of his time in the trailers. I used to be into non-confrontational crimes, burglary, stealing cars. But after the mind tests, I was a different person, more confrontational. I would go to bars actively seeking trouble. I was never like that before. Some drugs caused temporary paralysis or helplessness, or even placed the subject into a catatonic state from which he could neither communicate nor react to his surroundings. Others caused prolonged nausea, and still others, such as the drugs Williams and Anthony took, provoked long-term violent behavior. We still cannot know which drugs the men were given because they were investigational and identified only by number. The test results are classified, but the Army acknowledges that it conducted such experiments at Holmesburg. There was limited Army involvement with the University of Pennsylvania many years ago, admitted Lieutenant Colonel Bill Wheelahan, a Pentagon spokesman. The Army does not engage in this type of medical research today. In a 1973 congressional hearing on human experimentation, the Senate Labor and Public Welfare Committee's Health Subcommittee heard testimony from former Holmesburg inmates Leotis Jones and Alan Lawson who charged the university was deceptive in the handling of consent procedures and informing inmates of possible risks. In January 1974, the Philadelphia Prison System's Board of Trustees terminated the program. Twenty-four years later, when Acres of Skin was published, many former subjects realized for the first time that they had rights as experimental subjects and could sue the University of Pennsylvania Quigman's home institution, despite the indemnification waivers that some had signed. In September 2000, 298 former Holmesburg prisoners filed a class action lawsuit against the university, Johnson & Johnson, Dow Chemical Company, Dr. Kligman and his company, Ivy Research Labs, and the city of Philadelphia. But the years and the experiments had taken their physical toll. Most subjects are dead, and their survivors, now in their fifties and sixties, suffer from skin and nail problems, breathing difficulties, cancers, and stubborn, sometimes unidentified infections. Seventy former inmates have joined as Community Assistance for Prisoners to pursue legal redress, heartened by the $2.4 million settlement awarded in 2000 to Washington State prison inmates, whose testicles had been cut and irradiated between 1963 and 1973. But the Holmesburg suit has been stymied by the statute of limitations. The University of Pennsylvania insists that its research was ethical because the inmates gave informed consent, signed waivers, and took payment. Senior Vice Dean Richard Tannen, M.D., of the University Medical Center, contends that because human research was widely accepted at the time of the Holmesburg experiments, Kligman was not considered to be in violation of any Hippocratic ideals. The hospital offered the men free evaluations and treatment, should its doctors find a causal relationship between the experiments and their current ailments. Jesse Williams responded, We don't trust them. How can we? 
Kligman doesn't respond to interview requests, but he defended his work in a prepared 1997 statement. To the best of my knowledge, the result of those experiments advanced our knowledge of the pathogenesis of skin disease, and no long-term harm was done to any person who voluntarily participated in the research program. Holmesburg was no anomaly. In 1952, Chester M. Southam of the Sloan Kettering Institute injected at least 396 inmates at Ohio State Prison, more than 180 of them black, with live human cancer cells. Southam said he wished to study the process by which healthy bodies neutralized and killed off cancer cells. One of the sponsors for Southam's research was the National Institutes of Health, which also sponsored the PHS syphilis study at Tuskegee. Southam assured inmates that the experiments were perfectly safe because any cancer that took would spread slowly and could be removed surgically. Inmates also were used in flawed blood plasma trials, testing high-volume plasmapheresis, transfusions utilizing large amounts of plasma, between 1967 and 1969 throughout the state of Alabama. The study was managed by Dr. Austin R. Stowe at Kilby, Draper, and McAllister prisons, very sloppily by all accounts. According to the New York Times, there was no informed consent and no accurate records were kept, so no racial breakdowns of his subjects are available. The record-keeping and the management of the study were so poor that many men sickened and died not from experimental risks, but from simple poor hygiene and from plasma transfusions of the wrong blood type. Sterile technique was all but ignored by the poorly trained technicians, and the laboratory, where blood and fluids pooled on the floors and stained every available surface, was filthy. As a result, 28% of the subjects developed hepatitis, in contrast to only 1% of inmates who were not subjects. Dr. Stowe was expelled several times from hospitals and prisons after his subjects sickened and died from a variety of diseases, but not before he netted roughly $2 million in profits. In other prisons across the nation, hundreds of black and white inmates were subjected to flash burns, burns caused by excessive skin or corneal exposure to heat radiation, rather than the direct application of heated tools. Burns were specifically inflicted upon African Americans at sites such as the cornea of the eyes, where they sometimes led to permanent vision problems, forearms, and backs, because scientists wished to learn how thermal radiation affected darker skins as opposed to white skin. Some of these experiments duplicated the experiments conducted by the Medical College of Virginia, which were described in Chapter 9. Often under the guise of treatment, psychiatric experimentation with imprisoned African Americans has spanned the poles of barbarity and sophisticated personality destruction. In the 1950s, Tulane University psychiatrist Dr. Robert Heath selected black prisoners specifically for use in psychosurgery experiments. These involved implanting electrodes into inmates' brains to repeatedly stimulate their pleasure centers. Heath also conducted CIA-funded drug experiments, which included LSD and a drug called bulbocapnine. In high doses, bulbocapnine produces catatonia and stupor, a statue-like state, which Heath and his associate Harry Bailey, M.D., thought would be useful for controlling violent prisoners. According to one memo, the CIA sought information as to whether the drug could cause loss of speech, loss of sensitivity to pain, loss of memory, loss of willpower, and an increase in toxicity in persons with a weak type of central nervous system. They tested the drug exclusively on African American prisoners, whom Bailey routinely referred to as niggers, at the Louisiana State Penitentiary. Engineered Invisibility? Despite the extensive history of using black bodies as research subjects, despite the consistently high African-American population in prisons, despite the popularity of research studies with a racial emphasis, 
and despite the penchant for using blacks in the most dangerous or distasteful experiments, jailed African American research subjects remained largely invisible in the medical and popular literature until the 1960s. In his book *Undue Risk*, Jonathan Moreno writes that African Americans were usually excluded from earlier prison studies. Ironically, prison research in the United States, including the testicular irradiation research conducted by Dr. Carl G. Heller and his colleagues during the 1960s, was generally confined to white men, because participating in prison research was considered a privilege. It was denied to minorities, at least until the civil rights movement succeeded in equalizing social opportunities for African Americans, including research opportunities. Even the report of the Advisory Committee on Human Radiation Experiments (ACHRE), discussed in Chapter Nine, agreed, noting, "In 1975, the National Commission carefully examined the racial composition of the research subjects at a prison with a major drug testing program. The commission found that African Americans made up only 31 percent of the subject population." While this racial minority comprised 68 percent of the general prison population, the ACHRE's broad suggestion that blacks were underrepresented in prison medical experimentation is fatally weakened by the fact that the commission looked at only one unnamed prison experiment at one point in time, and thus was not representative. But even the straw man the ACHRE set up. Demonstrates the disproportionate use of African Americans in prison research. Black Americans in 1975 constituted only about 11 percent of the U.S. population, so that the 31 percent utilized in this prison's experiment meant that African Americans were subjected to research at a rate just under three times higher than their presence in the nation's population. The ACHRE. Looked at this high black experimentation rate, only in comparison to the even higher black incarceration rate. This is myopic, because it looks only at the artificial universe of prisons, rather than at the entire community of African Americans. This is an essentially communitarian fallacy, which means that the analyses have ignored the most cohesive affected community, the community of African Americans. Not the community of prison inmates. Moreover, although scientists' early prison research records were notoriously sloppy and frequently lost, extant records do make specific references to black prison subjects. Also, those researchers who had a dearth of black subjects, such as Heller, complained of their frustrations in gaining a more diverse subject population. Suggesting that they considered the inclusion of African American prisoners in research the norm. However, various prison studies had different racial compositions, and a few recorded experiments were designed as all white, just as some used only blacks or mostly blacks. Chapter six has already described how Joseph Goldberger, M.D., chose to induce pellagra only in white prison inmates. To dramatize that pellagra was not a black disease, but would strike malnourished whites as well. Other medical experiments were reserved for African Americans, and these were often the most risky and painful, explains Hornblum. At the Holmesburg prison complex, where decisions about who participated in particular experiments were often left to inmate assistants, he explains, "It is possible." That the racism in American culture was reflected in the inmates' decisions about who participated in a given test. For example, only healthy colored male volunteers were permitted to enroll in a protocol for one 1957 Philadelphia experiment to promote the inoculation of human skin with herpes simplex and herpes zoster, which were painful, incurable viral infections. However. Another Holmesburg experiment, which targeted young white volunteers, required only that they lower an arm into a detergent, sodium lauryl sulfate found in many shampoos, for an hour daily over 55 consecutive days. 
prison researchers often veiled the racial composition of their research population for the same reason that Marion Sims once hid the racial composition of his vesicovaginal fistula patients, concerned that scientists would appear to exploit powerless black patients. For example, when researchers wrote journal articles about the approximately 15,000 Maryland inmates of state juvenile institutions subjected to genetic tests for XYY syndrome, 85% of whom were black, they focused upon the mostly white minority subset of this research program to hide this true racial composition of the experiment, as will be detailed in Chapter 11. Perhaps the belief that black prisoners were exempt from early experimentation can best be understood as emanating from such carefully maintained invisibility. Stripped of their freedom, their civil rights, and their family and community connections, black prison subjects were almost as legally invisible as the slaves in the antebellum experiments. Their invisibility was perpetuated in no small measure by the news media, which gave most Americans their only window into prison research. Until the 1970s, the early news coverage of prison research was almost universally laudatory. Researchers and prison administrators welcomed journalists' determination to celebrate the heroism of criminals who submitted themselves to medical experimentation. New York Times profiles of incarcerated volunteers are all of white men, such as Sing Sing lifer Louis Boy. In 1949, the Times sympathetically chronicled the risky and medically unsubstantiated experiment to which Boy submitted in an attempt to save the life of an eight-year-old cancer-ridden girl. Boy lay on a gurney next to the dying girl while their circulatory systems were joined by rubber tubing so that his body could act as a filter for her poisoned blood. The girl died, but Boy survived, and news articles strongly suggested that his selfless act had helped to expiate his crimes. The press attention generated intense human interest, culminating in Boy's Christmas-time pardon. In Illinois, Statesville inmate Nathan Leopold half of the infamous Leopold and Loeb thrill-killing duo, had been the nefarious architect of the highly publicized crime of the century, the coolly executed 1924 kidnapping and murder of 14-year-old Bobby Franks, whom they dispassionately bludgeoned to death and discarded in a marsh on Chicago's south side. But profiles in the New York Times and other newspapers detailed his key role in recruiting other inmates to join malaria experiments and in signing inmates up for potentially sight-saving corneal donations. In his memoir, Life Plus 99 Years, Leopold boasted of his prison research roles, and this coverage helped to transform his thrill-killer image and boosted his successful parole bid in 1958. But this hagiographic approach to inmate subjects had the curious effect of effacing the participation of black prisoners in medical research from the period between the World Wars until the mid-1970s. News accounts do not refer to black participation, and the images gracing these peons to social redemption are of white inmates lying on gurneys. In Life magazine's profile of Dr. Kligman's laboratories, and New York Times photos of inmates queued up to give blood or tissue. No discernibly black bodies appear. Black volunteers may have been ignored because physicians were nearly always white males who, when approached for the name of an inmate to profile, proffered a white male for several reasons. The inmate, like Boy and Leopold, would be treated to a laudatory profile and would reap glory and other advantages including a possible parole, so doctors cited the names of prisoners whom they thought worthy of such advantages and whose freedom they could anticipate with comfort, essentially prisoners with whom they could most easily identify. Mainstream journalists, too, were nearly universally white until the late 1960s, and they also identified with Leopold's articulateness, intellectual attainments, and socioeconomic level, in a manner they could never have identified with Jesse Williams. 
white volunteers were also more likely, like Leopold, to have obtained good educations, and thus were more likely to find an audience for their memoirs, which, not surprisingly, cast them in the most sympathetic light. Among some researchers, especially in southern prisons, frank racism also precluded black medical volunteers from reaping positive publicity. Volunteer Medical Slavery But were prisoners, black or white, really volunteers? In 1947, the International Military Tribunal in Nuremberg charged Nazi doctors with war crimes, including experimentation upon prisoners of war. The Germans' ably conducted defense hinged upon Dr. Gerhard Rose's contention that U.S. doctors were guilty of exactly the same abuses, regularly subjecting prisoners to dangerous, painful, involuntary experiments. The trials culminated not only in the conviction and execution of many accused physicians, but also in the Nuremberg Code, which was devised to govern future medical experimentation. The U.S. delegation to the Nuremberg trials included Andrew Ivey, M.D., the American Medical Association representative. He offered an idealistic view of American prison research, assuring the public that the highest standards were upheld. Ivey specifically claimed that American prisoners had never been abused or used involuntarily. But he was wrong. In fact, a mere year after Nuremberg, the Journal of the American Medical Association praised the Statesville prison malaria experiments, which violated the Nuremberg prescription against experimentation by using prisoners. Unfortunately, American researchers have never thought of the code as pertinent to their own research. Yale Law School ethicist J. Katz, M.D., avers that in the eyes of many American researchers, it was a good code for barbarians, but an unnecessary code for ordinary physicians. In The Nazi Doctors and the Nuremberg Code, George Annas and Michael Groden analyze how U.S. investigators rejected Nuremberg and replaced it with naught but hollow assurances that American medical researchers needed no such constraints. The Nuremberg Code is also toothless, carrying no penalties for its breach, and so it is widely ignored. The vague, unsubstantiated claims proposed by Ivy stood in opposition to the judgments of all the pertinent medical organizations, which by the end of World War II had already weighed experimentation with prisoners in their ethical balances and found it wanting. Even a specially appointed research committee of the AMA denounced experimentation with prisoners as a human rights violation, despite the AMA's praise of the malaria experiments. In 1952, this AMA House of Delegates accordingly issued a resolution entitled Disapproval of Participation in Scientific Experiments by Inmates of Penal Institutions. Physicians, universities, or jails could not claim to be unaware of this position because the AMA sent copies of the resolution to governors, state and federal prison officials, and parole boards. Similarly, the Ethical Committee of the World Medical Association, in its 1961 Code of Ethics on Human Experimentation, declared, Persons detained in prisons, penitentiaries, or reformatories, being captive groups, should not be used as subjects of human experiment, nor persons in a position in which they are incapable of exercising the power of free choice. But none of these prohibitions on medical experimentation with prisoners was ever enforced, so they were blithely ignored by researchers, who were allowed to police themselves. Researchers, wardens, pharmaceutical companies, and universities echoed Ivy's claim that prisoners chose to participate voluntarily and even clamored for inclusion in experiments. Were prison subjects, black and white, willing volunteers, 
who freely consented to inoculation with deadly infectious diseases and to testing that removed or damaged their skin, hair, and nails? Did they voluntarily submit to castration for a few dollars and the transplantation of animal tissue or cancer cells, as well as exposure to chemical warfare agents and untried psychoactive drugs? Usually, no. The supposedly free consent of American prisoners was circumscribed in several ways. In the most extreme cases, some prisoners' right to say no simply did not exist. For example, between January 1967 and April 1968, imprisoned subjects at the California Medical Facility were paralyzed with succinylcholine, also known then as an ectin, a neuromuscular compound that paralyzed muscles so that the prisoner could not move or breathe. Many likened the terrifying experience to drowning in fetters. When five of the 64 selected prisoners refused to participate in the experiment, the institution's special treatment board gave permission on behalf of the recalcitrant men for them to be injected, against their will. But prison administrations usually exerted subtler pressure, in the form of authority figures and even prisoner advocates, such as social workers, who steered penniless inmates to research studies. Former Holmesburg social worker Priscilla B. Croft recalls, If somebody didn't have money for the commissary and wasn't on the list for a job, the social worker would say, You can go to the U of P testing operation. Another social worker admitted harboring doubts about the medical studies to which he referred inmates. We questioned it among ourselves, but nobody looked into it. The medical personnel walked around in white coats and looked very official and authoritative. Parole boards exerted considerable pressure as well. The well-publicized releases of volunteers such as Louis Boy, Nathan Leopold, and the 59 survivors of the Statesville malaria experiment dangled a tantalizing carrot of freedom before potential subjects. Although volunteers usually did not receive parole, administrators often placed letters of thanks or commendation in volunteers' files, which might have raised their hopes. But parole boards sometimes exerted strong negative pressure as well, according to inmates such as Nick Despoldo of the Arizona State Prison, who claimed in a New York Times article that parole boards routinely held a refusal to participate in research against inmates seeking release from his institution. The prisoner's ability to consent freely was also compromised by a lack of essential information. Informed consent is mandatory for research subjects in all venues, but researchers often did not divulge the true nature of the risks and often did not even explain the actual nature of the experiments. A New York Times expose of the multi-prison debacle by Dr. Austin Stowe, mentioned earlier, reveals that there was no informed consent and that no accurate records were kept. Some researchers who claimed to have consent forms could not produce them. Jesse Williams, veteran of scores of experiments, has repeatedly insisted, I was never given a consent form. I never saw a consent form. Consent forms made sporadic appearances in prison research, but the average black prisoner was poorly educated or even illiterate, so even when presented with a consent form, he was unlikely to be able to read or understand it. Former black inmate Edward Anthony, for example, insists that he had no idea what researchers meant by terms such as toxicity or efficacy. Consent forms often were so vague, misleading, and replete with technical data and scientific language that the physicians themselves could not understand them. Although consent forms made only sporadic appearances, legal releases were de rigueur. Lots of men were burned or scarred and wanted to sue, but they had signed releases and waivers and thought they couldn't, recalls white former Philadelphia inmate Al Zabala. Investigators went to remarkable lengths to deceive inmates about the harms inherent in the tests. 
Jesse Williams spoke of participating in what had been described to him as a footwear experiment, in which he had to wear boots taped to his feet nonstop for a week. This actually was an experimental attempt to induce a har to eradicate foot fungus. When white inmate J. Bios worked as a laboratory assistant, doctors suggested that to allay inmates' fear about the test's safety, Bios affixed cotton balls and dummy patches to his own back and arms. In order to heighten the deception, the researchers even paid Bios as if he were a participant. Prisoners at Holmesburg were often reassured that the shampoos or lotions that were tested on them were perfectly safe and could cause only minor irritation. Thirty to fifty years later, the men remain bald, scarred, or suffer skin and internal organ damage. But what of other volunteers, those who were neither physically forced nor strongly guided by the prison administration? When they participated, did they offer themselves up voluntarily? The answer hinges upon the meaning of voluntary. Copious evidence exists that coercion was a key element of the supposed consent given by most African American prisoners. Today's clinical medical ethicists tend to define coercion in medical research very narrowly and without much precision. So many would argue that the inmates may have been induced, but were not coerced. However, such critics fail to take into account the coercive features of the prison's special environment. The hell of prison life made the research laboratory, feared and abhorred by African Americans on the outside, an irresistible haven, even a life support unit, for the African American prisoner. Except for a few memoirs by famous inmates such as Leopold, the description of inmates' motives for volunteering emanated from researchers and prison administrators. They agreed that the inmates were motivated by money, with which they could purchase items such as cigarettes, radios, and the meager delicacies of the commissary. Researchers also sometimes noted for the press that prisoners enjoyed the special amenities of the prison ward, such as more frequent showers, better meals, and calmer, more secure surroundings. The news media unquestioningly echoed these supposed motivations, subtly sabotaging images of inmate heroism. But researchers and prison administrators were hardly disinterested observers, and they did not tell everything they knew about prisoners' true motives. Being admitted to the research unit allowed the inmate to avoid the legion of institutional predators. A stint in the lab offered a respite from the ever-present threat of gang rape, shakedowns, racial strife from prison gangs, and deadly assaults for a thousand petty slights. Taking meals in the laboratory unit allowed the subject to escape the mess hall, the dreaded site of frequent melees and stabbings. The inmates did speak with relish of the better meals and calmer atmosphere of the research laboratory, and freely acknowledged their need for money. There is no question that men participated for the $300 to $400 a month, or up to $1,500 per experiment they could earn. Because the few dollars a week the unskilled could earn in the prison laundry or kitchen offered no competition. But a cultural dissonance separated the hostile, violent chaos of the inmates' world and the benign, orderly environment of the university researcher or journalist. Money had a very different meaning for inmates than it had for outsiders. Inmates sought not only commissary baubles and delicacies to brighten life, but, more important, the price of freedom, or at least, of safety. Poverty, not criminal behavior, is the most common feature of the imprisoned. Jails are full of people, both guilty and innocent, who are there only because they are too poor to make bail. By the 1970s, most prisoners in Holmesburg, for example, were legally innocent men awaiting trial. Between the 1940s and 1970s, bail bondsmen typically would spring an inmate for a down payment of 10% of his bail, so that a man jailed in lieu of a $500 bond 
could buy his freedom within weeks with the fifty dollars he earned from a single medical experiment. Several inmates also mention a motivation about which the news media kept silent. The human landscape of prison is largely devoid of affection, and incarcerated men described time in the research laboratory as a respite for the psyche, a place where one could go for a while to be addressed and touched with kindness, dignity, and concern. Researchers such as Kligman knew this, and he imparted the knowledge to medical proteges during lectures. Many of the prisoners, for the first time in their lives, find themselves in the role of important human beings. We say to them, "You're important. We need you." Once this is established, these guys will knock their brains out to please you. If the experiment does not pan out, they get depressed. They become emotionally involved with the projects. The capacity to respond to love is greater than most people realize. I feel almost like a scoundrel, like Machiavelli, because of what I can do to them. Solomon McBride, Doctor Kligman's chief scientific assistant, was African American. Although he had no formal education in pharmacology, Acres of Skin describes how he managed the Holmesburg testing program on a daily basis for twenty years. Once again, illustrating how some blacks participated in experimental injuries to black subjects. However, McBride described the studies as non-invasive procedures, and claimed nobody was injured in those tests. When confronted about the lifelong injuries to inmates, he denied knowledge of such practices. "I wasn't aware of that," said McBride. "I don't think it ever happened." When asked about the use of radioactive isotopes, he is quick to respond, "No, that wasn't done. I don't think the prison would permit it." Informed that documents from the Atomic Energy Commission verify the use of isotopes at Holmesburg, he admits, "I heard about it, but I don't know anything about it. I was opposed to things that were not kosher. If I saw something wrong, I tell them to stop. I told the residents not to do stuff that was dangerous." If they hurt those black brothers, I wouldn't let them do it. Despite McBride's denials, Holmesburg prisoners suffered psychiatric damage and physical injuries that crippled them for life. Many inmates believe that research physicians had sown the seeds of deadly cancers during their time in the laboratory. But this claim cannot be proven because inmates do not know to what they were exposed. Inmates also volunteered for experiments because the laboratory was often the inmates' sole point of entry to medical care, which was sketchy. On evenings and weekends, medical staff were often simply unavailable, and guards or even trusted inmates performed triage on a sick call model, assessing who was ill, who was malingering, and who was sick enough to justify the inconvenience of arranging transport to distant medical care. Continuous medical care, such as quality cancer chemotherapy and regular diabetes maintenance, apart from blood glucose drugs, were simply unavailable. Prisons purge research. By the 1970s, research in prisons began to disappear, succumbing to scandals that unmask the racially unbalanced, abusive, dangerous, and scientifically sloppy nature of experimentation with prisoners. The exploitation of large numbers of black male prisoners caused public relations problems for researchers and institutions, in the wake of the increasingly violent and bitter civil rights battles, and the revelations of the syphilis study at Tuskegee. The thalidomide scandal, in which thousands of deformed children were born to European women who took the poorly tested drug, was another important catalyst in tainting the American perception of medical research. Furthermore, Harvard researcher Henry K. Beecher, M.D., had published an article in the New England Journal of Medicine that criticized 22 cases of exploitative experimentation. An early version of the article had detailed 50 abusive cases. The journal was able to induce Dr. Beecher not to identify the physicians, but the pharmaceutical industry feared that next time, a researcher of Beecher's stature might name names. The very next year, British physician 
Morris Papworth did so. The formerly fawning news media delivered the coup de grace by thrusting researcher after researcher into the harsh light of public exposure. On July 29, 1969, the New York Times published a page one article that exposed Dr. Austin Stowe's ethically and scientifically sloppy drug testing program, which had crippled and killed unknown numbers of men throughout the state prisons of Alabama. Unlike the earlier articles, which had praised the experiments, this account suggested that most of his victims were black. In the early 1970s, the Washington Star exposed the use of approximately 15,000 black boys in Maryland juvenile institutions in XYY experiments. These are further described in Chapter 11. The malaria experiments that had been lauded as daring a few decades earlier were roundly condemned in the mid-70s as deadly. Some of the bitterest prison battles were physical as well as verbal, causing the almost universally white investigators to fear for their safety. Dr. Sigmund Weitzman described being slammed against a wall by six-foot-four-inch, 250-pound Roy Tiger Williams, a black inmate at Holmesburg, who had lost his hair after testing a shampoo formulation. I was scared to death. He threatened to kill me. Physicians grew frightened of working with the increasingly distrustful inmates and felt intimidated by the growing influence of the black Muslims, who cast a jaundiced eye on prison experimentation. Bert Kahn, M.D., who worked at Holmesburg Prison from 1959 to 1965, says he left in part because he feared for his personal safety. I became concerned about the growth of the Muslim movement. The deaths of 29 inmates and 11 white authority figures in the 1971 Attica prison riot also sent a chill through prison medical research programs. Such programs suffered legal repercussions as well. Attica inmates won damages for suffering ill treatment and assaults. In 1979, nine Oregon prison subjects shared $2,215 in damages. When a lawsuit by one medical experimentation victim at Holmesburg Prison resulted in a monetary settlement, whose terms are confidential, other pharmaceutical company researchers realized that they, too, could become targets of successful inmate legal action. Charles Miller, a prison research administrator for pharmaceutical giant Eli Lilly, lamented, The reason we closed the doggone thing down was that we were getting too much hassle and heat from the press. It just didn't seem worth it. A January 1973 Atlantic Monthly cover story by investigative journalist Jessica Mitford proved even more powerful. She explained that prison medical research consisted of exploitation of the lowest, most vulnerable classes by members of the most privileged. This article became a chapter entitled Cheaper Than Chimpanzees in her 1973 book Kind and Usual Punishment, a dissection of the U.S. prison system. Soon afterward, Senator Edward Kennedy held hearings that led to the National Commission for the Protection of Biomedical and Behavioral Research, CPBBR, which investigated medical experimentation on prisoners. It considered banning such research outright, as most other Western industrialized countries had done decades earlier. Despite headlines such as Government to Ban Medical Research on Federal Inmates, it decided against this in 1976, partly because not only pharmaceutical companies, but also many prisoners opposed a ban. Inmates wished to have the opportunity to participate for several reasons. They could make real money no other way. They sometimes could obtain health care no other way. They missed the safety and amenities of the research laboratory. And they wanted to feel they were contributing to society. In 1979, state prison of southern Michigan inmates even filed suit to prevent the FDA from excluding them from research studies. Instead of banning prison research outright, the CPBBR proposed a detailed accreditation scheme 
that Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare Joseph Califano, in consultation with the American Correctional Association, rejected as impractical. In 1978, ATW produced stringent human experimentation regulations, which remain in effect today. So did the CPBBR's 1979 report, known as the Belmont Report, which placed the onus on researchers for ensuring that research with prisoners provides informed consent and is therapeutic under what is called the Common Rule. The Common Rule sets strict limits on non-therapeutic research and research done with prisoners, and requires the review of proposed studies by institutional review boards. No study in a prison can present more than a minimal risk to the inmate. In sum, there remain four types of permissible prison research: that on the cause and effect of incarceration and crime, the study of prisons or of incarcerated persons, investigations of conditions that affect prisoners on mass, and therapeutic studies. Although these reforms were necessary and laudable, they are imperfect, especially because the language is vague. What, for example, constitutes minimal risk? Even the definition of therapeutic research has come into question. Still, research at most prisons, including Holmesburg, ceased by 1976 as a result of public outrage and lawsuits. Research Renaissance. Most people don't realize that prison medical research, which all but died out in the 1970s, is enjoying a quiet renaissance. Since the late 1980s, investigators in Arkansas, Maryland, South Carolina, Texas, Florida, Connecticut, and Rhode Island have been conducting and proposing research in prisons. Even more crucial to understand than the past exploitation of African Americans in prisons. Is the future medical use and possible abuse of African Americans, because they are the single fastest growing group in prison populations. Today, research with prisoners means research with blacks, because in 2004, African Americans constituted 44 to 46 percent of all prisoners, which is almost four times their proportion of the general population. Clearly. Prison experimental abuse is likely to affect African Americans disproportionately. Thanks in large part to mandatory sentencing for drug infractions, women are not spared. Black women make up the fastest growing population in American prisons. The HIV pandemic and the more recently recognized hepatitis C epidemic have attracted federal dollars and the support of pharmaceutical companies. This has renewed the interest in prisoners as subjects, because 17 percent of the incarcerated have HIV, six times the rate on the outside. Because most HIV-positive people in the United States and in U.S. prisons are black, the question of HIV research in prisons is a question of blacks being used in such research. For hepatitis C virus (HCV). The statistics are even more dire. Inmates have the highest HCV infection rate in the country. Two percent of all Americans, but twenty percent of inmates are HCV infected. For imprisoned black men, the HCV infection rate is much higher, as high as sixty percent. But prison research today is not restricted to these ailments, because inmates suffering from disorders ranging from asthma to cancer. Have attracted the attention of U.S. researchers, who are conducting 10,000 biomedical research programs. Most of these researchers are funded by the Department of Health and Human Services (HHS), which, for example, supports the Yale School of Medicine with 178.7 million dollars, and the University of Miami Medical Center with 191 million dollars. In 1999. Brown University researchers even mounted a lawsuit to gain access to prisons for HIV research. They cited the high rates of HIV and other infectious diseases in prisons, and the need of inmates for cutting-edge treatments, 
casting their desire to do research as a plea for therapy. They are correct in pointing out that too little attention has been paid to prisoners' health. As early as 1962, physicians complained of a dearth of medical care and therapeutic research aimed at prisoners' ills. But why, if securing badly needed AIDS, TB, and hepatitis C therapy is the goal, do proposed prison medical programs focus upon the theoretical benefits of research rather than on the known demonstrated benefits of the best available therapy? Few jailed men receive the standard of care for AIDS and HCV, such as protease inhibitors, heart therapy, or interferon for hepatitis C. Prisons have even failed to take simple public health measures to reduce the high incidence of anal rape and blood-borne contamination and to restore infectious disease control to prisons, which would also seem to be a cornerstone of any HIV, HCV, or TB eradication policy. Brown University researchers have conflated HIV treatment and experimentation, leading one to question whether the real concern is for prisoners' health or whether researchers wish to resume the lucrative jailhouse research of yesterday. The pharmaceutical industry requires research with humans, and the nation's 45,000 researchers are hungrily eyeing the 2 million Americans behind bars. Today, arguments over the ethical codes have been replaced by utilitarian rationales, focusing upon the medical benefits to society and invoking the vague right of prisoners to experimentation. But is prison research, which will take place disproportionately with African Americans, really likely to focus upon therapy and to benefit prisoners? Or will experimental treatments again expose prisoners to dangerous illegal medical risks despite the federal regulations? Perhaps the best indication of researchers' actual intentions is a glance at some current protocols for research initiatives in American prisons. Researchers are currently conducting studies that involve inducing labor in pregnant inmates, testing different methods of obtaining biopsies, conducting a clinical trial of an experimental HIV vaccine, testing delivery of a potent new cancer chemotherapy agent directly into the liver, and artificially inducing hypothermia to treat lung cancer. A St. Petersburg Times report offered direct evidence that some of the therapeutic HIV approaches with HIV-positive inmates may not be centered on the inmate's need for therapy because participating inmates complained that they felt coerced to participate in such studies and agreed to do so only in order to escape poor medical care, abusive conditions, and lack of access to up-to-date HIV drugs at other Florida prisons. One particularly troubling study among those mentioned above is Dr. Joseph Zwischenberger's radical new approach to lung cancer, which is to heat the subject's blood to a temperature where the errant cancer cells theoretically would not thrive. To test his theory... He sedates inmates and connects them to a machine called the Biologic HT system, which removes blood via venous and cervical tubes. The blood is heated, then returned to the inmate's body, which is kept at a very dangerous elevated temperature of 108.5 degrees. Any adult taken to a hospital with a temperature of 105 degrees would be considered an emergency case, and cooling strategies would immediately be undertaken. But in Zwischenberger's protocol, inmates' 108.5 temperatures are sustained for two hours. Subjects sign a consent form that lists death, seizures, congestive heart failure, burns, heart attack, and limb loss as possible complications. Even if the subjects are in the late stage of lung cancer, where the cure rates are infinitesimal, this doesn't excuse such a risky procedure. Although putatively therapeutic, this research surely poses greater than minimal risk. The consent form includes a waiver that states, in part, I understand that I cannot receive financial remuneration for any injuries resulting from my participation in this project. However, 
the law specifically prohibits language in an informed consent document that appears to waive a subject's rights or to release an investigator from liability for negligence or assault. In July 2000, the Office of Human Research Protections, OHRP, suspended 300 studies by the University of Texas Medical Branch, UTMB, in Galveston, including Zwischenberger's, after the researchers flouted federal regulations. 195 of these studies, mostly HIV and AIDS trials, were conducted in Texas prisons, according to the Austin American Statesman. In a September 14, 2000 letter, the OHRP listed numerous UTMB research projects conducted outside of the permissible categories for prison research and cited scant evidence that Galveston's Institutional Review Board had adhered to federal law. The OHRP had approved more than 400 federally funded studies with prisoners since 2000, but when it froze the UTMB's research projects, a chill once again crept over prison research. However, now that the inmate population has leapt from 200,000 in the 1970s to 2 million, researchers once again seek entrance to prisons, wishing to undertake a wider range of medical studies. The Institute of Medicine, which provides the federal government guidance on biomedical issues, has appointed the Committee on Ethical Considerations for Protection of Prisoners Involved in Research to study the issue. It is headed by the brilliant public health law scholar Lawrence O. Gostin, J.D., professor and director of the Center for Law and the Public's Health at Johns Hopkins and Georgetown Universities. The committee will determine whether it is possible to ensure true informed consent in prisons, and whether research on prisoners should be confined to the therapeutic realm. As this book went to press in late 2006, Gostin's group was still weighing the relaxation of the regulations that have muted medical research in prisons since the 1970s, and decisions may result in dramatic modification of prison research policy as early as 2007. If the doors are flung wide to investigators, will they admit in therapy or exploitation. How can we best protect sick prisoners, many of whom are black, from abusive research without completely banning prison research? As early as 1999, Anne S. DeGroot, M.D., suggested that the best way to give prisoners with AIDS access to cutting-edge clinical studies, while protecting them from abuse, is to ensure that research is done only in prisons that already provide high-quality medical care. This way, prisoners can participate in research without feeling forced into trials. However, this chapter has demonstrated that the laws enacted to protect prisoners' rights and health consistently have failed to do so. There are no guarantees that today's promises of humane therapeutic research, which often conflates research and care, will protect inmates more effectively. Until American medicine achieves a better record of providing care while avoiding abuse, an utter ban on prison research may be the only protection. However, prisoners are not the only group of African Americans who live with the threat of being involuntarily subjected to research in the name of therapy. The next chapter chronicles the plight of black children who are forced into service as experimental subjects. Chapter 11 The Children's Crusade Research targets young African Americans. What's done to children, they will do to society. Carl A. Menninger, M.D. Like many other parents struggling to bring up children in Brooklyn's Bedford-Stuyvesant area, Sharice Johnson and her husband felt besieged. Neighborhood children ran a gauntlet of ne'er-do-wells and drug dealers on their way to school, and bullets wounded even the innocent who ventured out after dusk. Gang members hounded young children. Her greatest fear was losing her sons to the streets. 
Already, her 16-year-old was being held in a detention center in upstate New York. Was he on a slippery slope to adult incarceration? She felt he must avoid this at all costs. Shortly afterward, in 1992, representatives from Columbia University appeared at Johnson's door, explaining that they wanted her other son, six-year-old Isaac, to go to its hospital for a series of simple interviews and tests, culminating in a one-time overnight stay involving a single dose of harmless medication. The worker explained that Columbia University was offering a safe, free test for Isaac in order to discover whether he might have any medical problems. They would pay her approximately $100, and they had something for Isaac as well, a gift certificate for Toys R Us, if he agreed to participate. Johnson hesitated briefly, but eventually she signed. She explained why during a congressional hearing. At first... I did not understand how and from what source they obtained my name and knew I had a six-year-old son. I later came to the conclusion that this information came to them because of my 16-year-old's involvement with the juvenile justice system. Needless to say, I decided to cooperate with the experimenters. I felt at the time that if they could find me and knew I had a six-year-old son, they had enough power to affect the well-being of my 16-year-old son who was being held in a detention facility. American medicine has not spared black children its very worst abuses in the name of scientific research. This chapter will discuss some of the many experiments that recruited black children primarily or exclusively, that stigmatized black children, and whose agendas were specifically racial. These have harmed not only children, but also the image of all African Americans. Over a decade ago, Isaac became ensnared in such a research initiative tailored specifically for children of color. Between 1992 and 1997, New York City's New York State Psychiatric Institute, NYSPI, and Columbia University's Lowenstein Center for the Study and Prevention of Childhood Disruptive Behavior Disorders, conducted several research studies that sought to establish a link between genetics and violence. They performed experiments upon at least 126 boys, most of whom were between the ages of 6 and 10, utilizing the drug fenfluramine. Columbia described the population of boys who were given the drug as 44% black and 56% Hispanic. But this is misleading. Hispanic is an ethnic category, encompassing people of white, black, and mixed race. And all the Hispanic boys lived in the Washington Heights area and were black Dominicans, observed Rudy M. Brown, Sharice Johnson's lawyer. The boys were all black, and this was by design. The experimental protocol specifies that eligible participants must be African American or Hispanic, and specifically excludes whites from participation. In 1998, I asked psychiatrist Timothy Walsh, M.D., who headed the Institutional Review Board, IRB, that approved the study, why. He explained that the protocol simply reflected the ethnic component of Columbia Medical Center's nearby catchment area, from which it drew its subjects. But this is untrue. Not only are there numerous white enclaves in Washington Heights, but some of the black boys, including Isaac Johnson, were drawn from as far away as Brooklyn. The boys had something in common besides their dark skins. As Sharice Johnson suspected, they had been selected because their older brothers had had contact with the probation system. Although it is illegal to breach the confidentiality of juvenile court records in this manner, a Department of Probation internal memo dated August 30th, 1991, states, We are participating in a research project being conducted by Professor Gail Wasserman of Columbia University regarding younger brothers of male offenders in an effort to identify early predictors of antisocial behavior. The probation department identified them to researchers. Researchers sought to investigate whether violent behavior might run in families 
and to identify a biological basis for such behavior. The researchers claimed that the drug fenfluramine could suggest a genetic basis for aggressive or violent behavior in boys because it is a precursor of the neurotransmitter serotonin. Abnormal serotonin levels are implicated in many psychological states. Administering fenfluramine once or for a very short period normally causes one's serotonin levels to increase, which in turn increases the amount of hormone prolactin in the blood. The researchers measured the blood prolactin to indirectly assess how much serotonin levels rose. But if prolactin levels increased too dramatically in response, this suggested to Columbia researchers a biological brain dysfunction that may signal a tendency toward aggression. On the strength of this tenuous connection, the investigators claimed that by monitoring how precipitously the boy's prolactin levels increase after an infusion of fenfluramine, they could measure the boy's propensity for aggressive behavior. Why not simply measure the boy's serotonin levels? This might not reveal pathology, because the blood serotonin concentration might not reflect brain levels. Prolactin, however, is produced only in the central nervous system. But Wasserman and her colleagues claimed that another risk factor fed the boy's purported violent propensities, bad parenting. Black boys were fated to be the violent products of parental psychopathology, or adverse rearing environments. Why? According to the researchers, because of their poverty and their ethnicity. To bolster this deterministic claim, researchers interview parents to establish their worthiness, or lack thereof. But the interviewers were hardly blind or objective. They knew that the researchers sought evidence of pathological child-rearing and of aggressive or violent propensities. As Cherise Johnson recalled, on the campus of Columbia University, we were subjected to a series of intimate, degrading questions, tests, and interviews. The experimenters also took advantage of my fears for the well-being of my 16-year-old son to intrude on the privacy of my home. After such interviews, psychological assessments, and physical screenings, the researchers winnowed the original 126 study candidates to 66 boys, including Isaac, in several related fenfluramine studies. They did this by carefully selecting only those boys who were perfectly healthy, both physically and mentally, and did not display signs of questionable behavior. Thirty-four of the boys in Isaac's group were given fenfluramine. If the drug fenfluramine sounds familiar, it is because it constituted half of the notoriously cardiotoxic fenfen weight loss combination introduced to the U.S. market in 1973, associated with heart valve damage and deaths among dieters in the 1990s. By the time the FDA banned it in 1997, concern was also circulating among physicians about the brain damage that low doses of fenfluramine induced in experimental animals. Medical reports of these injuries circulated well before the FDA ban and during Columbia's studies. American researchers have focused intense scrutiny into the genetics of violence among black boys. To their families and communities, the index cases, who first bring a family to the researcher's attention, including Isaac's older brother, might have been misbehaving, acting out, or testing boundaries by breaking minor laws against fighting and shoplifting. However, to Walsh and his colleagues, they were mentally ill. University psychiatrists had diagnosed these boys with such psychiatric ailments as conduct disorder, oppositional defiant disorder, and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Diagnoses that describe children's disagreeable behaviors and that are often assigned to children who break the law. Such a psychiatric diagnosis, whether it describes an actual mental illness or not, can consign a child to limbo between the law and psychiatric medicine, making him vulnerable to stigmatization by both. In fact, one legal observer, Leonard Glantz, remarked, Indeed, 
it appears the only diagnosis these children had was the one conferred on them by the investigators. Such a diagnosis also moves a child from the free world of the normal into the civil rights desert of the mentally ill. The press raised a hue and cry when it discovered the nature of the experiment, but failed to recognize it as part of a pattern. This was just one of many psychiatric experiments in a movement to expand diagnoses of mental illness from one family member to others by positing a putative genetic root of the illness, often on very thin evidence. At institutions such as the Harvard School of Public Health, the brothers and sisters of schizophrenics have been closely scrutinized and labeled with mental illness in initiatives that aim to expand the phenotype, the physical or mental manifestations of a genetic condition, of schizophrenia. Because the focus is upon identifying, not treating, the putative disorders, such experiments are powerfully stigmatizing. In the cases of Isaac and others, scientists wished to discover whether these boys shared their brother's purported violent tendencies and the so-called mean gene. To accomplish this, the researchers did much more than simply give the boys a dose of fenfluramine. More than a dozen of the boys were withdrawn from all their medications for a month, including medications for such life-threatening chronic conditions as asthma. For four days, they ate a special low-monoamine diet, basically a low-protein diet, because monoamines affect serotonin levels. The boys were hospitalized the night before, and once they were out of sight of their parents, food was withheld for the duration of the experiment. The next morning, water was withheld as well. At 8.30 a.m., physicians inserted a catheter and gave each boy fenfluramine hydrochloride by mouth. Fenfluramine had never been given to children under 12 before this experiment began. 90% of adults given a single dose experience side effects ranging from anxiety, fatigue, headache, lightheadedness, difficulty concentrating, visual impairment, diarrhea, nausea, irritability, to a feeling of being high. Up to 30% of adults who take fenfluramine develop heart valve damage, and it can trigger a life-threatening form of high blood pressure called pulmonary hypertension. One boy complained of a severe headache, and others complained of lightheadedness, but they were not released. Beginning at 10 a.m., blood was drawn hourly from the boys' catheters and tested to determine fluctuations in serotonin. The researchers' claim that serotonin levels reveal aggressive tendencies is based upon questionable science. Walsh characterized the causal association of serotonin levels and aggression as widely accepted, which is incorrect. The correlation has been heavily criticized. In a 1996 Journal of Neurogenetics article, Dr. E. Balaban illuminated the specious nature of the research behind the genetics of aggressiveness when he conducted a devastating meta-analysis of 39 scientific studies. It revealed that no relationship between serotonin and violence was sustained anywhere in the body of research. The results confirm an association between low 5-HIAA, a serotonin metabolite, levels, and psychiatric disorders, but fail to support any specific relationship between low 5-HIAA levels and impulsive aggression or criminality. It is premature and misleading to speak of mean genes or a specific neurochemistry of aggressive behavior. The fictive nature of this cherished correlation proved merely the first layer of logical and design error. Leaving aside for a moment the egregious social fallout of selecting only black and Hispanic boys, this racial selection also created a serious scientific error. When only one ethnicity is considered in an experiment to elicit general information about a heterogeneous population, an unacknowledged set of socioeconomic variables are introduced. The boys were not only darker, but poorer, and they also lived in less healthy physical environments than do most white boys. 
This distortion is magnified when the majority group is excluded. Most American boys are white, so excluding white boys is a very serious scientific misstep. Furthermore, the study design described no control group, a staple of such research. Finally, the researchers gave no coherent explanation of how they proposed to dissect any serotonergic effects of genetics from those caused by supposedly adverse rearing. The experimental results should have dealt a death blow to this sloppily conceived and executed research, because the boys who were ostensibly predisposed to aggression and violence by their adverse rearing and biological propensities actually exhibited normal or elevated serotonin levels in response to the brief fenfluramine challenge. However, Wasserman's group responded by reversing themselves. Until the mid 1990s, they stated that low serotonin levels are a marker for violent propensities in children, and after their 1997 study, they wrote that elevated levels signal violent propensities. These scientific errors were legion, but it is difficult to know where to begin in listing the ethical outrages of this study. And it is very hard to believe that it was conducted fairly recently by one of the nation's most prestigious universities. The experiment is rife with instances of undue inducement, from baiting children with $25 toy certificates to luring their parents with $100. No insignificant sum on the streets of Washington Heights and Bedford Stuyvesant. Such racial selection could stigmatize not only the participants, but all black and Hispanic boys as born criminals. The element of stigmatization is key in understanding certain racial disparities in research with children, because such research is not an egregious exception for black children. Rather, it is the norm. In 2003, the journal Pediatrics published an analysis by University of Chicago researchers of 192 research studies in major U.S. pediatric journals between July 1999 and June 2000. The authors found that when compared with research participation of child subjects generally, black children were overrepresented and Hispanic children. Were underrepresented in clinical trials, and both were underrepresented in therapeutic research. Black and Hispanic children were overrepresented in potentially stigmatizing research. From 52 to 54 percent of the children in non-therapeutic studies were white. This number was far lower than their 69 to 73 percent representation in the population. In contrast. 26 to 32 percent of child subjects of non-therapeutic studies are black, twice to almost three times their 13 percent presence in the population. An element of intimidation, if not coercion, was introduced by the use of juvenile justice system officers to identify subjects to the medical researchers. Middle-class white Americans may appreciate police and probation officers as guardians who serve and protect, but inner-city blacks often have hostile relationships with police. These important abuses raise the question of whether it is morally right to use healthy children in a study that is non-therapeutic, dangerous, and stigmatizing. The Department of Health and Human Services (DHHS) would seem to prohibit this. Its Code of Federal Regulations (CFR) Title 45, Part 46, governs the protection of human experimental subjects, and specifically prohibits experiments on healthy children that convey more than minimal risk. I would contend that fasting, hospitalization, low monoamine diet, fenfluramine challenge, serial blood sampling, and exhaustive psychological and educational testing. Is clearly more than minimal risk," observed Ernest D. Prentice, Ph.D., associate dean for research at the University of Nebraska. That protocol was not approvable under the regulations. When the Hearing Committee on Governmental Reform and Oversight convened to examine the FDA role in the fenfluramine research, Dr. Walsh, 
chair of the NYSPI, IRB, defended the study by invoking the recent deadly shootings at schools across our country. John Oldham, NYSPI executive director, shared these concerns. With the disasters in Littleton and elsewhere, it has become abundantly clear that studies of aggressive behavior in children are imperative. However, the shootings in question had been carried out by white boys, who were clearly troubled and violent, but who were specifically excluded from these studies in favor of children of color. Why were such studies not conducted in suburban or rural, mostly white school systems? Despite the violation of confidentiality, the undue inducement, the medically risky non-therapeutic research on healthy children that clearly violated federal guidelines, and the racially discriminatory recruitment, the Office for Protection from Research Risks, OPRR, investigation exonerated the research institutions. This sent a clear message that no penalties would be ascribed to dangerous research if it were conducted on black children, declared lawyer and children's advocate Cliff Zucker. In cities like New York, where the poor are disproportionately minorities, OPRR's decision has a discriminatory impact on children of color. These children will be subject to experiments that may not be conducted on middle-class or Caucasian children. A 2004 study revealed that the fenfluramine experiments may have damaged more than these children's physical health and legal rights. A relatively low single dose of the drug has been implicated in brain damage in humans as well as in animals. Fenfluramine may actually trigger such behavior changes as increased aggression. Sadly, this is not news to Sharice Johnson and Isaac. Two weeks after he was given the drug, he started having sharp, painful headaches. Then as the headaches became more unbearable, he started having anxiety attacks and hyperventilating. He would start gasping for breath as if he couldn't breathe, as with someone who was having an asthma attack. He started having horrible nightmares. He would wake up in the night screaming, thinking that someone was in his room. To this day, my son continues to suffer the severe consequences of the reckless disregard for him as a human being by those experimenters. To them, he was just another guinea pig. Johnson has filed a lawsuit for the violation of Isaac's rights. And the other boys? Daniel S. Pine, M.D., the study's principal investigator, told New York's Amsterdam News in 1998 that families overwhelmingly reported that the research experience was a positive one. But no family members have come forward in response to legal and media questions, so we cannot know whether their children suffered serious side effects from the drug. Johnson's lawyer, Rudy Brown, believes that the other families are intimidated by the OPRR decision and the juvenile justice system, too afraid of what might happen to the older brothers of the subjects should they speak out. And despite Johnson's insight and courage, justice has proven elusive for her as well. Her civil suit for $60 million against the city, the researchers, the NYSPI, and Columbia Presbyterian Hospital alleged breach of confidentiality and civil rights violations. But it languished for three years in the teeming files of Judge George B. Daniels of Federal District Court in Manhattan. Daniels, who is black, was profiled by the New York Times in December 2004 as the unchallenged king of delayed decisions, with 289 civil case motions pending for longer than six months, more than any other judge in the nation. By the time Brown was able to force a decision through the appellate court in November 2003, Isaac was 17, and Columbia was released as a defendant. As this book went to press, Johnson's case was scheduled for late 2006. The fenfluramine experiments are not without precedent. Thirty years earlier, the National Institutes of Mental Health's Center for Crime and Delinquency awarded a three-year, $300,000 grant to de Gumber Bergonker, Ph.D., under the aegis of Johns Hopkins University, he undertook a large study to investigate 
whether adolescent boys, many of whom were wards of Maryland's juvenile justice system, gave indications of a genetic anomaly, XYY. The XYY syndrome was first discovered in 1961, when Dr. A. Sandberg described a six-foot white male who exhibited no mental or physical abnormalities, but who had an unusual chromosomal complement, called an aneuploidy. This condition affected not the workaday somatic chromosomes, but the sex chromosomes that determine maleness and femaleness. A normal male inherits one X chromosome from his mother and one Y chromosome from his father. Women inherit two Xs, one from each parent. But this man's karyotype, or chromosome chart, showed that he had one X and two Ys, an accident of reproduction. The man looked normal except for his height, a little extra abdominal girth, and troubled skin. Most XYY males look so normal that they tend to be detected by accident while doctors are looking for something else. The mere presence of a genetic variation such as XYY does not necessarily result in any appreciable difference in physiology or behavior. But visceral reactions about the presence of two Y chromosomes led scientists to postulate that such men must be super males, possessed of unusual degrees of aggressiveness. For example, in 1973, Dr. L. F. Jarvik opined in the pages of the Journal of the American Medical Association that the Y chromosome is the male determining chromosome. Therefore, it should come out as no surprise that an extra Y chromosome can produce an individual with heightened masculinity, evinced by characteristics such as unusual tallness, increased fertility, and powerful, aggressive tendencies. A wealth of other differences were quickly ascribed to XYY as well, including low intelligence, abdominal fat, large teeth, and acne. But by the mid-1970s, only tallness, adult acne, and abdominal fat persisted as demonstrated XYY traits. The belief that XYY males, with their extra Y chromosome, were aggressive, even violent, and more likely to become criminals than genetically normal males, was bolstered by a finding that XYY males were also found in mental penal institutions at a higher rate than other men. The XYY males were not imprisoned for violent crimes, or found more frequently in regular prisons than were the typical XY males. Burgaunker sought to discover the prevalence of XYY males in the U.S. population and to determine whether the XYY genetic anomaly might be responsible for aggressiveness and violent behavior. To do this, he selected 6,000 boys, approximately 85% of whom were black, and most of whom were housed in Maryland state institutions for abandoned or delinquent children. He also selected 500 more affluent boys in Edgemead, a Maryland private psychiatric treatment center, 80% of whom were white. For normal controls, the investigator selected 7,500 East Baltimore boys who were enrolled in a free child care program at Johns Hopkins University. These boys lived in a housing project for low-income families that was 95% black. Like the fenfluramine victims, these boys were subjected to stigmatizing testing, psychological assessments, and blood draws in a three-year experiment that could brand them as latent criminals for life. Parents were told that the blood samples were taken to test for anemia and other medical problems, but it was actually drawn to screen for boys with the extra Y chromosome that made them XYY males instead of normal XY males. As with the fenfluramine study, the justice system played an active role in study recruitment. A Washington Daily News article observed, Maryland juvenile court probation officers will probably be used to persuade resisting parents to sign a permission slip for them to take a blood sample. No evidence had been offered of genetic assortment of XYY by race, yet racially distinct populations of boys were selected, 
approximately 85% were African American, at a time when African Americans constituted only 10.8% of the population. This means that had an association been proven between XYY males and violence, it would have emerged from the data as an association between black boys with XYY and violence. What's more, Burgaunker often culled his subjects from incarcerated populations, and no evidence of consent, written or verbal, was found for most of the enrolled boys. The XYY study suffered from the same glaring logical flaws as the fenfluramine study. Similar XYY dragnets were instituted using black infants in New York City and in Boston, supported by Harvard University. But in Boston, ethically responsible researchers were able to derail the study before it began. One of the most effective and vocal critics was pioneering Harvard University geneticist Jonathan Beckwith, who declared, The whole premise of the study was based on terribly faulty science. It seems strange that accomplished scientists at several major universities would embrace science that was so deeply flawed. However, if one looks beyond the narrowly stated purpose of the studies to the real utility of any data that might result from them, a logical reason emerges for this apparent design error, because a darker logic lurks behind the study's selection of black males. The studies fit the period's pattern of intense focus on violence in black populations. Between 1960 and 1972, fed by the baby boom, U.S. crime rates soared exponentially. After 1967, the relatively peaceful civil rights movement gave way to spurts of urban violence, race riots, which escalated after the 1968 slaying of the Reverend Martin Luther King, Jr., some researchers reacted by medicalizing this violence. Beginning in the 1970s, the Centers for Disease Control, CDC, reported that annual homicide rates for young African American males were from five to eight times greater than those for young white males. These data have led to conclusions that violence is a peculiarly African American problem. But such conclusions tend to ignore how racism and poverty confound the relationship between violence and race. They also ignore the fact that violence is an American problem, not an African-American one. The United States is the industrialized world's most violent society. Scotland is a distant second, with a murder rate that is only one-fourth of the U.S. rate. The trend toward the medicalization of violence in blacks fed the popularity of genetic violence studies of black boys, but nature failed to cooperate with the politics. Burgaunker's research and subsequent studies determined that XYY, the supposed marker for violence, is a white marker, not a black one, in that it is found more commonly in white men than in blacks. If the extra chromosome were indeed the violence gene, white men would be from 1.5 to 3 times as likely to harbor a propensity for violence. But it is not. No scientific basis for any propensity to violence or criminality in XYY males was found, and the theory, which was always thin and circumstantial, was discredited. However, the XYY theory of hyper-male criminality still thrives in popular culture because the news media which had widely trumpeted the criminal gene controversy, largely failed to publicize the findings that exonerated XYY. As a result, people still think of XYY men as harboring a criminal gene. Journalists muse on the chromosomal status of the serial killer du jour, and such murderers as Richard Speck and Arthur Shawcross have often raised a supposed XYY anomaly as a defense in murder trials sometimes successfully. Novels and films celebrate hyper-males, such as those in the film Alien 3, whose prison planet is populated by double Y chromo felons, so violent that they require off-world incarceration. Racially discriminating recruitment strategies in the search for the criminal gene helped to solidify a precedent of using captive, 
or coerced populations of African American children, a sparsely examined subtext of American experimental design. We cannot excuse the XYY experiments by suggesting that no rules forbade such experiments. By 1970, HEW regulations required informed consent be obtained before any federally funded project use humans as research subjects. Johns Hopkins University's policy also required it. In 1961, the relevant rule read, in part, persons retained in prisons, penitentiaries, or reformatories, being captive groups, should not be used as subjects of experimentation, nor persons incapable of giving consent because of age, mental capacity, or of being in a position where they are incapable of exercising the power of free choice. The boys in the XYY study fell into most of these protected groups. Although they were separated by nearly 30 years, the fenfluramine and XYY experiments had much in common. Both sought biological determinants of violence, and both chose to look no further than very young black boys with no history of mental illness or of violent or criminal behavior. A minority of white boys with psychiatric problems were victimized in Baltimore as well. Both studies were non-therapeutic, invasive experiments that could brand boys, via poorly constructed experimental protocols, as potential criminals for life. The fact that these experiments were approved by investigational review boards is especially chilling evidence that IRBs have not afforded the desired protections. The 1970s XYY experiment and the fenfluramine experiments of the 1990s were simply nodes in a continuous series of abusive experimentation that reflected the social realities of segregation and discrimination. Scientists loaded the statistical dice in the simplest manner, by testing blacks exclusively, to locate the supposed biological propensity toward violence in the hereditary apparatus of blacks. But, As the late naturalist Stephen Jay Gould mused, why should the violent behavior of some desperate and discouraged people point to a specific disorder of their brain, while the corruption and violence of some congressmen and presidents provokes no similar theory? Perhaps the answer lies not in the scientific philosophy, but in the social effects of such research. Locating black violence in the genetic complement of black boys nourishes excuses to abandon social therapeutic approaches. What good is better education, better nutrition, safe, clean housing, social and psychological support, and a more nurturing home and school environment to a born monster? But this hereditarianism fallacy is specious. An inborn racial propensity to violence has often been postulated, but has never been demonstrated, despite a bewildering variety of attempts. Even if such a tendency were discovered, it would in no way negate the mitigating value of social, psychological, and educational interventions, certainly not without trying them first. Murder of the Black Mind But another medical trend fueled by the born criminal image posed a much more immediate danger to boys crude, often experimental brain surgeries, backed by a quite coarse understanding of brain function, to excise the alleged seat of violence. Between 1936 and 1960, an estimated 50,000 lobotomies severed neuronal connections between the frontal lobes and the midbrain of mental patients, both adults and children. Psychiatrists and neurosurgeons who practiced these blind-cut lobotomies simply inserted crude tools such as the ice piccolon and blindly swept them back and forth within the brain, cutting all the connecting nerves, sight unseen, at one fell swoop. Nothing could be more violent than this clumsy and nightmarish destruction of brain tissue. These acts of unbelievable surgical hostility, which obliterated a child's very seat of thought, ability, and personality, nothing less than a murder of the mind, were forced upon black boys as young as five. 
From the 1960s through the early 1970s, disenchantment with the widespread use of tranquilizers fostered interest in brain surgery as an alternative to quiet patients. University of Mississippi neurosurgeon Orlando J. Andy, M.D., capitalized on this trend, performing many types of brain ablations, including thalamotomies, destruction of the thalamus, which controls emotions and analyzes sensations, on African-American children as young as six, who, he decided, were aggressive and hyperactive. Witness his published approach to the behavior of a child he refers to as J.M. J.M., a boy of nine, had seizures and behavioral disorder, hyperactive, aggressive, combative, explosive, destructive, sadistic. Bilateral thalamotomy was done, left January 12, 1962, right January 20, 1962. Right thalamotomy was repeated on September 16, 1962. The patient's behavior was markedly improved and enabled him to return to special education school. After one year, symptoms of hyper-irritability, aggressiveness, negativism, and combativeness slowly reappeared. A fornicotomy, removal of a fornix, a small, paired brain structure that connects areas of the brain that are key to emotions, was performed on January 15, 1965. Impaired memory for recent events developed, and the patient became much more irritable, negativistic, and combative, emphasis added. Consequently, a simultaneous bilateral thalamotomy was done one month later, on February 16, 1965. The patient has again adjusted to his environments and has displayed marked improvement in behavior and memory. Andy removed six areas of the boy's brain in five surgeries over three years, areas that were then known to be important to emotions, expression, and cognitive function. He also implanted electrodes in the child's brain in a vague, unspecified experimental venture. The surgeon did not explain how he arrived at his assessment of J.M.'s behavior disorder and why he thought the extreme remedy of brain surgery was indicated. Therefore, we do not know whether the child had serious behavior problems or whether he was exhibiting the same annoying behaviors displayed by most nine-year-old boys at some point. Andy is not a psychiatrist, and J.M. received no bona fide psychiatric diagnosis. We have no description of the effects or duration of the child's behavior, nor what his parents thought of it. There is no indication that the parents were informed of the surgery or whether their permission was asked. In short, Andy did not even take the trouble to convince us that J.M. needed medical intervention of any kind, to say nothing of having parts of his brain removed. In pondering these shocking acts, it is important to remember that Andy wrote up this case in medical journals, twice, because he was proud of it as an example of his work. According to Andy's own chronology, the fornicotomy appears to have caused memory impairment, combativeness, and other unwelcome behavior changes. Andy's response was to remove more brain tissue, which left the child adjusted with marked improvement in behavior. The boy may have been adjusted because he had too little brain function left to irritate anyone. Andy seems to have consigned most of J.M.'s personality to the wastebasket, and he expressed concern only with the purported behavior problems. He never mentioned the seizure disorder after the first line. And he often boasted of his successes in controlling children with such surgeries. But a subsequent report on J.M.'s progress noted that, intellectually, however, the patient is deteriorating. These surgeries, performed throughout the South by white neurosurgeons like Andy, are imbued with racist barbarity. The unacceptable behavior of black boys, girls are rarely mentioned in the juvenile psychosurgery literature of the period, triggers neither psychotherapy nor counseling, but a violent medical response. The child's unacceptable behavior must also be considered in the context of the very narrow range of acceptable behaviors for black men and boys in the segregated South. 
When the 1955 lynching case of Emmett Till was reopened in 2004, it reminded us that young black boys could be savagely tortured and murdered on suspicion of whistling at a white woman. What transgressions triggered Andy's characterization of a nine-year-old as so unacceptable that the appropriate response was to cut out portions of his brain repeatedly? The surgeon leaves this to no one's reeling imagination. Today, Andy is revered as a neurosurgical pioneer, one whose work was never challenged in his lifetime and who never suffered any disciplinary action. This may have reflected the powerlessness of his institutionalized black subjects in pre-civil rights era Mississippi, or it may reflect the white male perspective of segregated Mississippi neurosurgery in the 1960s, or both. However, Andy did not restrict his lobotomy recommendations to black children. He also observed that the kind of brain damage that could necessitate such radical surgery might be manifested by participation in the Watts uprising. Its rioters, he hypothesized, could have abnormal pathological brains. He was not alone in this conjecture, as brain destruction was employed not only for misbehaving black boys, but to ensure the docility of prisoners and, in the 1960s, as a government-funded cure for urban rioters. Three American physicians proposed that such urban uprisings were caused by men who could be cured by psychosurgery. Dr. Vernon Mark, director of neurosurgery at Boston City Hospital, and his colleagues, doctors Frank Irvin and William Sweet, swept aside social factors such as poverty, slum housing, and poor education in a 1967 proposal in the Journal of the American Medical Association. The obviousness of these causes may have blinded us to the more subtle role of other possible factors, including brain dysfunction, emphasis added. The real lesson of the urban rioting is that, besides the need to study the social fabric that creates the riot atmosphere, we need intensive research and clinical studies of the individuals committing the violence to pinpoint, diagnose, and treat these people with low violence thresholds before they contribute to further tragedies. The National Institutes of Mental Health, NIMH, and the Law Enforcement Assistance Administration granted the three surgeons $600,000 for brain research on urban rioters. Lobotomies have fallen out of favor except for narrowly defined causes. 5,000 lobotomies were performed annually in the late 1940s, but by 1980, fewer than 500 were performed. Laws severely curtailing the surgeries in California and Michigan had a chilling effect, discouraging the practice. Dr. William B. Scoville of Hartford, Connecticut, for example, performed 750 lobotomies a year at state hospitals in the 1950s, but did only seven or eight a year by 1980. Today, some psychiatrists still practice several types of lobotomies. However, the crude abuse of early lobotomies has been eclipsed by a wide variety of therapeutic brain surgeries, both subtle and bold, that save lives and minds. It would be a terrible mistake to condemn all extensive brain surgeries, even experimental ones, in children. This confuses the life-saving genius of some modern techniques with the abuses of the past. For example, African-American neurosurgeon Dr. Benjamin S. Carson Sr., the chief of pediatric neurosurgery at Johns Hopkins, has devised innovative surgical techniques that use a sophisticated understanding of the brain, maintain a therapeutic focus, and incorporate informed consent. His successful innovations in separating craniopagus conjoined twins, Siamese twins who are joined only at the skull, and employing hemispherectomies to quell life-threatening epileptic seizures, have restored health, not mere docility, to an entire generation of children. But the obsession of American psychiatry with black boys continued, and took center stage in February 1992, when Frederick Goodwin, then chief of the Alcohol, Drug Abuse, and Mental Health Administration of the NIMH, appeared before the National Health Advisory Council to champion the Violence Initiative, 
a group of urban violence studies. He did so by comparing inner-city boys, young blacks, to rhesus monkeys in the jungle. If you look, for example, at male monkeys, especially in the wild, roughly half of them survive to adulthood. The other half die by violence. That is the natural way of it for males, to knock each other off, and, and in fact, there are some interesting evolutionary implications of that, because the same hyper-aggressive monkeys who kill each other are also hypersexual, so they copulate more and therefore they reproduce more to offset the fact that half of them are dying. Now, one could say that if some of the loss of social structure in this society, and particularly within the high-impact inner-city areas, has removed some of the civilizing evolutionary things that we have built up, and that maybe it isn't just the careless use of the word when people call certain areas of certain cities jungles, that we may have gone back to what might be more natural, without all of the social controls that we have imposed upon ourselves as a civilization over thousands of years in our own evolution. Many were deeply and vociferously offended by this characterization of young black men. And the then Secretary of Health and Human Services, Dr. Lewis Sullivan, who is African American, criticized his remarks. But despite the many calls for Goodwin's removal, Sullivan appointed him head of the National Institutes of Mental Health, from which influential post Goodwin continued to champion violence initiative research, such as the New York City fenfluramine studies, and to influence other U.S. medical research policy. What's notable about Goodwin's statement is the implication that these black children poison their environment with their atavistic behaviors, instead of a belief that they fall victim to the dangerous, impoverished, and desolate urban landscape into which they are born. In the relentless quest for black pathology, the influence of unusually harmful and violent environments of many black children has often been given short shrift in deference to genetic studies. But more incisive medical investigations of violence are appearing, often conducted by African-American physicians. For example, in 1991, Harvard School of Public Health professor Deborah Prothro Stith, M.D., wrote Deadly Consequences, an insightful analysis of youth, race, and American violence. Prothro Stith used her training as a physician, health policy expert, and mathematician to make incisive statistical analyses of the myths surrounding violence in black children and to propose solutions that entail transforming obviously pathological environments, not to offer thinly supported speculation about genes. When a coalition of public health academics, police, physicians, and ministers made a concerted attack on Boston's youth violence in 1998, violent crime fell precipitously, and that year the teenage murder rate fell to zero, although, as Prothero Stith observed, we didn't change the gene pool. What sort of research will future scientists be encouraged to pursue with our tax dollars? Racist mythology or investigations of violence as an American problem, not a black one? As Stephen Jay Gould warned in 1982, we have a choice to make. Shall we concentrate upon unfounded speculation for the violence of some, one that follows the deterministic philosophy of blaming the victim? Or shall we try to eliminate the oppression that builds ghettos and saps the spirit of the unemployed in the first place? The National Commission for the Protection of Human Subjects of Biomedical and Behavioral Research concluded in 1977 that children were an especially vulnerable population because they could not offer consent. Yet, children today are more likely to become research subjects now that federal policies begun in the mid-1990s have changed the face of the typical research subject. The National Institutes of Health, NIH, Research Revitalization Act, mandated the inclusion of women and minorities in all research in 1994, and added children in 1998. So far, the new FDA and NIH policies have placed stress not on protecting children, but on ensuring children's access to research. Unfortunately, 
This, too, often means researchers' access to children. This is an ominous paradigm shift for black children, who already are overrepresented in non-therapeutic and stigmatizing medical research. Parental consent. Informed consent is a special concern for African American children. Children are required to give assent for some experiments, which is simply a verbal agreement. But we have seen that children, such as the six-year-old fenfluorine subjects, will give assent in exchange for a toy. They simply cannot be expected to make good judgments about their health. Certainly, children cannot give informed consent because they cannot understand the medical procedures. Or weigh the risks and benefits of participating in medical research. Therefore, researchers substitute parental consent, which is spoken of as the ne plus ultra of subject protection. But as we saw in the fenfluorine experiments, obtaining parental consent opens a child to experimentation, but does not always protect him. The first stumbling block to parental permission is legal. Researchers and legislators assume that parents can give consent for their child to join a research study, but as Leonard Glantz points out, the legal authority of parents or guardians to volunteer their children to participate as research subjects is unclear. In the case of non-therapeutic and risk-laden experiments, such as the fenfluorine and XYY studies, parental permission is ethically questionable as well. Although we expect parents to act in the best interests of their sick or well child, recent history teaches us that they often cannot or will not do so. Parents have, for example, agreed to fenfluorine administration and to X Y Y tests during which their children's blood was drawn by unqualified undergraduate students, exposing the child to the risk of infection. Such injudicious parental consent. Is garnered because parents are inadequately educated about research studies. To give just one example, a 2004 study of children with leukemia conducted at six U.S. children's hospitals showed that parents who consent to their sick child's participation in medical research often misunderstand the term randomization, which means that children are randomly assigned to receive either the standard treatment or the unproven experimental one being tested. A computer, not their doctor, decides which child will receive which drug, but parents tend not to understand this. Parents who do understand randomization are less likely to give consent. But even well-informed parents do not always fulfill our expectation that they will act in the best interests of the child. Parents may be at the mercy of conflicting motives, especially if a child's illness is causing stress and disruption for the rest of the family. Also, poor parents may find financial incentives for study participation too tempting to resist, even if those incentives consist only of free care for a sick child in a research program. The psychological stress of caring for a sick or dying child may cause parents to grasp at quixotic research straws, as Baby Faye's parents did. She was born on October fourteenth, nineteen eighty-four, with hypoplastic left heart syndrome. A fatally undeveloped heart. Leonard L. Bailey, M.D., chief of surgery at Loma Linda University, convinced her young, unmarried, poor white parents to allow him to implant the heart of a baboon in their twelve-day-old infant, although no one had ever survived a cross-species organ transplant. Unsurprisingly, baby Fay died a few weeks later. A 1992 study suggests that parental consent to medical research is inauspicious for a child, partly because the parents who volunteer their children for research are less well educated, more likely to have substance abuse or other mental health problems, and possess lower self-esteem and less confidence than those who withhold permission. In short, the parents who consent are those least likely to make a good decision about study participation. Perhaps Baltimore's Kennedy Krieger Institute (KKI) best exemplified the dubious protections of parental consent, which it was careful to elicit when it began its repair and maintenance study in the mid-1990s. 
Researchers approached black families in 108 units of decrepit housing encrusted with crumbling, peeling lead paint. Lead paint is a notorious cause of acute illness and chronic mental retardation in young children, who inhale the lead borne on the air and nibble the peeling paint chips, drawn by the appealing sweet taste of the lead. That same sweet taste led Romans to infuse their wine with lead, courting mental devastation, which some historians believe hastened their civilization's decline. Today, it is poor children in crumbling inner-city housing who suffer most from lead. Fortunately, we know how to protect children by banning the use of lead paint and by offering lead abatement programs. But the agenda of the KKI scientists did not include removing children from lead exposure, because they plan to use these children to evaluate new, cheaper lead abatement techniques of unknown efficacy in old homes with peeling paint. Because scientists wish to explore cheaper ways of eliminating the lead threat in the future, they purposely arranged with landlords to have children inhabit lead-tainted housing so that they could monitor changes in the children's lead levels as well as the brain and developmental damage that resulted from different kinds of lead abatement programs. Scientists offered parents of children in these lead-laden homes incentives such as $15 payments to cooperate with the study without divulging that it placed their children at risk of lead exposure. The literature given the parents implied that the study was protecting their children from lead damage and promised to inform parents of any hazards. KKI researchers simultaneously encouraged landlords of approximately 125 tainted housing units to rent to families with young children by paying for the lead abatement if the landlords rented to such families they met with chilling success. When the KKI drew blood from one-year-old Erica Grimes on April 9, 1993, for example, her reading was 9 micrograms per deciliter, which is a normal reading according to CDC guidelines. The KKI identified lead-imbued hot spots in the home but did not tell Erica's parents. When Erica was retested on September 15, 1994, her blood lead reading was 32 micrograms per deciliter, which CDC charts label a highly elevated reading. The KKI is affiliated with the prestigious Johns Hopkins University, whose IRB approved the protocol. On August 16, 2001, Maryland's top appellate court ruled against the researchers, drawing a parallel to the Tuskegee syphilis experiment. Judge J. Caffel noted, It can be argued that the researchers intended that the children be the canaries in the mines. His decision noted, The RIB was willing to aid researchers in getting around federal regulations designed to protect children used as subjects in non-therapeutic research. An IRB's primary role is to assure the safety of human research subjects not help researchers avoid safety or health-related requirements. This is bad news because the university, or corporation IRB, is considered the prime body charged with protecting the subjects of medical research. Each IRB is required by law to have at least five members, at least one of whom must be a non-scientist. One member must be non-affiliated with the university, and the board's composition must reflect the community's diversity. But as the Fenfluramine study also suggests, these boards are failing to provide the needed protections. However, if parents have proven to be hobbled protectors in the research setting, institutional abuses such as the XYY experiments suggest that parents still are more desirable guardians than institutional bureaucrats and are far better protectors than no guardian at all. Unfortunately, a black child is more likely than a white one to have his parent completely removed from the informed consent equation. Black children are far more likely than whites to be institutionalized, in which case the parents are often unable to consent freely or are not consulted at all. Black children throng juvenile detention centers in at least twice their proportion in the population. 
their sheer numbers place them at a special risk of being used for research studies there. Nationally, minority group members, especially blacks, represent 34% of children, but they constitute 67% of those committed to public facilities. In New York, blacks make up 41% of children, but 87% of those placed in public juvenile justice facilities. Today, one in 64 white boys are taken into custody before their eighth birthday, compared with one in 13 African-American boys. According to a 1999 National Juvenile Justice Report, black children are more likely to be incarcerated, not because their behavior is worse, but because of biased handling. Their cases are processed differently from those of whites from the very inception of a problem. Sociologists argue that these orphaning factors combine with the condemnation of blacks as indifferent parents to ensure that the parental consent of African Americans is held in scant regard. For example, Baltimore's 85% black XYY studies sought permission only from some 15-year-old subjects themselves. Perhaps the most infamous example of such parental bypass is the case of Bonner v. Moran. In 1941, the aunt of 15-year-old John Bonner, a colored boy residing in Washington City, took him to the charity clinic of Episcopal Hospital, where her daughter Clara, John's cousin, was being treated for extensive burns. Clara's plastic surgeon, Dr. Robert Moran, said that she needed skin grafts, and the doctor and the aunt appealed to John, a junior high school student, to provide some of his own skin. No one asked permission of John's mother, who was sick at home. In fact, she had no idea that John had been taken to the clinic. This surgical attempt at an experimental skin graft was no small matter. John was hospitalized while the plastic surgeon cut a tube of his flesh from his armpit to his waist, then attached the tube to his cousin's side. But the large area of skin failed to take, and John himself needed several blood transfusions and two months hospitalization. He emerged permanently and extensively scarred. When John's mother recovered, she sued Moran for battery, the legal consequence of non-consensual surgery. But the court exonerated him on the grounds that Bonner was a mature minor whose consent was legally binding. However, a federal appellate court reversed the ruling, noting that the surgery had not been for John's benefit. By his own testimony, it clearly appears that he, the physician, failed to explain, even to the infant, the nature or extent of the proposed first operation. Mrs. Bonner and the hospital eventually reached a settlement for damages. Infants and very young children are even more vulnerable. Not only can they not resist, they cannot even tell what is being done to them. In a 1925 Journal of the American Medical Association article, Dr. M. Hines Roberts made no mention of consulting parents or guardians when he wrote of subjecting 423 hospitalized Negro newborns in Atlanta, both sick and normal, to risky, painful spinal taps in order to study how such tests could cause injuries, trauma produced by the needle at the site of puncture. The taps introduced blood into the spinal fluid of some infants and exposed them all to the risks of infections such as meningitis, as well as motor injury, paralysis, and even death. In a 1956 nutrition study, black infants were covertly deprived of the essential nutrient linoleic acid, essential because, as the researchers already knew, the body cannot survive without it. In the late 1980s, many states, including New York, funded research initiatives that tested newborns for HIV infection without their mother's knowledge, then withheld the knowledge of their HIV status. 68% of HIV-positive infants were African American. The infants suffered irreparable, unnecessary harm because life-saving treatment was not instituted. The mothers had no idea that their newborns, and they themselves, were HIV-positive. 
The mothers were victimized because they remained unaware of their own HIV-positive status and thus could not seek treatment. It was the Tuskegee experiment all over again, says Nettie Meyerson, the New York Assemblywoman who shepherded legislation that would mandate HIV testing and reporting for newborns in New York State. However, in 2004, news emerged of another New York City study. In this case, HIV-positive children in foster care were given high doses of experimental, risky, antiretroviral drugs without their parents' knowledge or permission. This study is discussed in detail in Chapter 13. Even an NIH physician, Dr. Lema Fananapazir, bypassed parents when he implanted pacemakers in 55 black children to test a new treatment. The children had been diagnosed with a benign inherited condition that thickens the heart, and Fananapazir wished to see whether the pacemakers would lessen the thickening. But he never articulated a logical therapeutic motive, and the pacemakers did not improve the children's health, which was not threatened by their condition. Instead, the implantation exposed them to surgical risks of pain, infection, and heart damage. Fanana Pazir's surgeries puzzled his cardiologist colleagues, one of whom dismissed the study by saying, There's a lot of witchcraft here. Another type of research with children, experimental vaccines, has gained national notoriety. Today, highly publicized theories link vaccination to everything from autism to sudden death, and even parents who adhere to the vaccination schedules often do so uneasily. Although vaccine skeptics come in every color, recent revelations have sown a deeper-seated uneasiness among African Americans. Between 1987 and 1991, U.S. researchers administered as much as 500 times the approved dosage of the experimental Edmonton Zagreb EZ measles vaccine to African American and Hispanic babies in black neighborhoods of Los Angeles. The parents of these children did not know mammoth overdoses were being administered, nor that the vaccine was experimental. They also did not know that the vaccine had earlier been given to 2,000 Haitian children in Cité Soleil, the most desperately impoverished area of Port-au-Prince, with disastrous results. Easy vaccinated children, all poor, began to sicken and die by the hundreds there, and throughout countries in the Third World, including Senegal, Mexico, and Guinea-Bissau. Horrified by the disastrously high death rates, World Health Organization officials abandoned their plans to administer 250 million EZ doses throughout developing countries. But after these experimental deaths, the vaccine was administered to black and Hispanic Los Angeles children. Such outrages have prompted African-American groups to condemn vaccination. Dr. Abdul Alim Muhammad, Nation of Islam Minister of Health, recommended a moratorium on immunizations for all African-American members of the Muslim faith. However, shunning vaccines is itself dangerous. The vaccine debate encapsulates more than a scientific disagreement. It also reflects the lingering iatrophobia from the exploitative abuse of African-American children. This abuse has had a chilling effect on life-saving research because parents are withholding their permission from positive as well as abusive research. History has shown them how difficult it is to distinguish between the two. African-American children are still being harmed not only by abusive experimentation, but also by the fear of research that follows in its wake. For example, the African-American infant mortality rate is twice that of whites, and Congress has charged the NIH with much-needed research to investigate the reasons for this carnage. However, two years into the five-year project, the National Institutes of Health canceled the study. It gave no official explanation, although rumors flew that the project director had engaged in ethics violations in wangling support for the study. The surrounding community, hearing reports of research fraud, feared that their children would be harmed if they enrolled. 
The real victims of this abortive study are the millions of black infants who will die awaiting research into their mortality, while a plethora of studies explore supposed genetic links between violence and black children. Part 3. Race, Technology, and Medicine Chapter 12. Genetic Perdition The Rise of Molecular Bias In the age of the technological fix, this country is heading for genetic and behavioral control of society. Who will exercise the control? Who will make the decisions about which genes are defective and which behavior abnormal? Who will make the decisions about the genetic worth of prospective human beings? Jonathan Beckwith, 1974 When I went to prison, the concern and worry literally broke my mother's heart. She suffered a series of heart attacks and strokes and died in 1997. She knew I was innocent because I had been at home with my parents when the crime occurred. And over the years, things just wore her down. When you are in prison, if you are close to your family, your whole family is in prison. The burden of guilt is common coin in prison, but Calvin Johnson knows the crushing agony of innocence. The 25-year-old Atlanta resident had a bright future, a close-knit family, many friends, and a wedding date when he was convicted of raping a white woman in 1983. He had never seen his victim before, but he was convicted, although pubic hairs recovered from her body did not match his. They did come from an African-American man, and that, apparently, was enough. I still had faith in the system. I believed it would be just a matter of time before officials realized that they had made a mistake. I was really kind of naive. I didn't believe that I would be sentenced or convicted of the crimes. Although the woman identified photographs of someone else as her assailant, and although he did not match key elements of her description, the actual rapist had only a mustache and Johnson wore a full beard, Johnson was convicted by an all-white jury. For 17 years, Johnson fought to survive in the hardest work camp in the state of Georgia. I worked in snake-infested swamp waters up to my knees, he also had to stave off assailants. When you're in prison for a sex offense, if you're not physically strong, the guys around you, they'll try to pick at you. So I lifted weights and became a pretty good size. People left me alone. Johnson lost his youth, his fiance, and his naivete. But, he says, I always believed that God would save me. Faith in God sustained his spirit. And in 1986... Johnson finally found physical deliverance in DNA, which proved him innocent. He was 42 years old. Nearly all human cells contain genes, which, in turn, contain deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA, the molecule that encodes life itself. DNA's genetic code is composed of building blocks called nucleotides, and this code dictates and directs the development of a fertilized egg through processes of protein manufacture so complex that they remain incompletely understood. DNA is passed from parents to children, and it determines or influences many traits, from your eye color to many disease propensities. There is DNA in nearly all your cells, but there are several types of DNA, and less than 1% codes for differing traits such as eye color, height, or disease susceptibility. Unless you are an identical twin or the product of another such multiple birth, your DNA is unique. No one else on the planet has your exact genetic code, although humans share a great many genetic similarities. Today, DNA fingerprinting technology enables scientists to identify distinctive genetic patterns. 
In Johnson's case, the DNA samples from his body ultimately proved that the pubic hairs and other biological evidence left behind by the rapist were not his. At least three types of DNA fingerprinting are in use. But despite the terminology, none is as accurate an identification method as matching a fingerprint. The most popular method at the time of Johnson's conviction, Restriction Fragment Length Polymorphism, or RFLP analysis, compares the DNA of two or more individuals, which varies by only 0.1%. That's one difference in a thousand, useful for establishing paternity or guilt. A newer form of DNA comparison utilizing single nucleotide polymorphisms, SNP, has rapidly outstripped RFLP. Anyone who doubts that genetic technology can be an important blessing for African Americans should consider its pivotal role in freeing black men such as Calvin Johnson. Johnson was freed by the Innocence Project, the brainchild of O.J. Dream Team members Barry Sheck and Peter Neufeld, lawyers at the Cardozo School of Law in New York. So far, DNA evidence has helped them and the 15 to 20 similar projects they have inspired to exonerate more than 328 inmates, including Kirk Bloodsworth and Earl Washington, Jr., who were sentenced to die in Maryland and Virginia, respectively. These are mostly African-American men convicted of raping white women, says Neufeld. Only 10% of reported sex assaults are allegations of white women attacked by black men. Yet most, 54%, of all convictions proven to be unjust involve African-American men wrongfully convicted of assaulting white women. This is a crime that seems associated with many wrong convictions. So many men have been freed by DNA testing that laws ensuring prisoners' rights to DNA appeals have been passed in some states, including California, New York, and Illinois. Illinois declared a moratorium on capital punishment after an embarrassing string of investigations uncovered many innocent prisoners in its penal institutions. However, deployment of DNA technology is no panacea. Relatively few inmates can afford the requisite $5,000, and the backlash triggered by the Illinois embarrassment was swift. Some cities, such as Lansing, Michigan, passed laws restricting the use of DNA evidence in inmate appeals. Then again, some criminals leave no testable materials behind. And according to Barry Sheck, even when biological evidence exists, 70% of the time it is allowed to deteriorate is lost or is discarded during the decades an innocent person languishes in jail. Human error sometimes sabotages genetic wisdom, as when courts ignore compelling DNA evidence. Scientists and technicians in genetic laboratories have made errors and have even falsified DNA test results. For example, Chicago laboratory worker Pamela Fisher lied or made errors that bolstered at least one erroneous conviction, according to forensic experts who reviewed her testimony before the release of inmate John Willis. A study by University of Michigan law professor Samuel R. Gross determined that tens of thousands of innocent people are trapped in jail. If we reviewed all prison sentences with the same level of care that we devote to death sentences, there would have been more than 28,500 non-death row exonerations in the past 15 years, rather than the 255 that have in fact occurred. Even for freed men such as Johnson, justice remains elusive. How do you compensate a man for consigning him to spend his youth in hell, for the loss of his family, friends, income, and good name? States such as California offer a non-negotiable settlement of $100 for each day of unjust imprisonment. But two-thirds of those freed by DNA evidence get nothing. And money means nothing to some, such as Frank Lee Smith, a Fort Lauderdale man exonerated by DNA evidence nearly 15 years after he was sent to death row, and 11 months after he died there of cancer. 
Clearly, DNA testing is no substitute for justice. In fact, according to experts such as Neufeld, the real significance is not that DNA got them out, but that DNA provides a window into the criminal justice system to see what went wrong with the system to let so many innocent people be convicted. But DNA evidence has powerful uses beyond liberating the innocent. Shades of Gattaca The film Gattaca held a not-too-distant mirror up to a genetic dystopia in which human decisions and discretion are removed from all-encompassing judgments about men's worth. In this film, only one's DNA, recognized and assessed by machines, determines one's fate, leaving character, personality, drive, and intent all sublimated to the tyranny of the gene. The biometric dystopia of Gattaca doesn't exist yet, and perhaps it never will. But developments over the past few years evoke an unmistakable glimmer of recognition. The FBI, Secret Service, IRS, Social Security Administration, Census Bureau, and Department of Veterans Affairs all maintain extensive collections of genetic data. Since May 1998, sex offenders have been required to surrender DNA samples to federal databases. And today, every state maintains its own DNA database that contains the DNA profiles of felons and of others, including people merely suspected of crimes or even of innocent people rounded up in DNA sweeps. The samples of 450,000 convicts are stored with identifiers, such as the person's name, description, criminal record, social security number, and image. The government has also sponsored the creation of national databases, such as the FBI's Combined DNA Index System, CODIS, which stores DNA samples, most without identifying information. CODIS went online in 1998 with samples from 8,000 convicted child molesters, and by 2001, it contained the profiles of 1.5 million felons. In 2002, the U.S. Attorney General ordered the FBI to expand CODIS to 50 million profiles. And by 2004, CODIS stored 2.6 million samples containing the DNA of people convicted of almost any crime. In October 2005, the Senate Judiciary Committee approved a law, which was pending when this book went to print, to force anyone who was merely detained by federal authorities to provide DNA. And in August 2006, the database contained more than 3.5 million samples. The FBI predicts that CODIS will accommodate 50 million samples in the near future. Some scientists warn that the very DNA evidence and technology that has freed hundreds of African-American men like Johnson may soon be wielded by police to criminalize and convict black and Hispanic men. From California to London, DNA data banking has allowed the collection of genetic evidence for convicted felons on the premise that those who have been convicted have sacrificed some of their rights to privacy. But Troy Duster, a professor of sociology at Berkeley and author of Back Door to Eugenics, warned in 2001 the same technology that will exculpate people today is also being used to put people who have merely been stopped by the police into genetic databases. He is correct. In 2000, Miami police seeking a violent criminal described vaguely as black or Hispanic stopped 2,300 black and Hispanic men on the street and quickly took a buckle swab from each, swabbing the interior of each man's cheek. The police now had samples of their DNA, accompanied by identifying information, suspect profiles, and each man was free to go, for the time being. The samples were tested against DNA left by the rapist at the scene, but none of these men's DNA matched that of the putative assailant. Therefore, all these men have demonstrated their innocence, but police have stored their genetic data in a database to be tapped when they next seek a perp. This database of innocent black and Hispanic men 
constitutes a collective presumption of guilt. When weighing the ethical and scientific unacceptability of this tactic, it is important to realize that 1. The term DNA fingerprinting is a misnomer. The genetic profile is not as specific as a fingerprint and cannot provide a unique identifier. 2. The description of a black or a Hispanic suspect is so vague that it yields a racial dragnet, not a description of a suspect. And 3. Some rare differences that allow one to differentiate individuals based upon a genetic profile become less rare when one looks only within ethnic or kinship groups. DNA profiling has been questionably imposed upon white men too, but with important differences. For example, the ACLU of Massachusetts denounced DNA testing as a serious intrusion on personal privacy when police in Truro, Massachusetts, used it in investigating the 2002 killing of white fashion writer Krista Worthington. The ACLU also cited the technology's failures in sites such as Baton Rouge and Virginia when DNA samples were coerced from up to 800 area men, most of whom were white, in contrast to the thousands taken from black and Hispanic men. The ACLU also argued that the 7,000 forensic DNA samples tested in sweeps have resulted in only one arrest, making DNA sweeps a very expensive and inefficient way of targeting suspects. This is partly because guilty suspects typically refuse to give a sample, even under considerable pressure. It is the innocent who allow themselves to be cajoled or bullied into a buckle swab. A DNA sweep targeting all Caucasian men, in which police coerce men into supplying DNA to eliminate themselves as suspects, then store it for use the next time they seek a criminal, would be as ethically repugnant as a similar sweep of black men. However, in Truro, the donors were not exclusively white and were not targeted on the basis of skin color, so racial bias was not a factor. Truro police asked all local men over 18 years old to provide samples and recorded their various races. What's more, the police agreed to destroy the Truro samples after collection, unlike sites in Miami and Washington, D.C., where the police sought DNA only from men of color. The Truro sweep was still a privacy violation. Many white men felt pressured to give samples and complained that the demand for a DNA sample violated Fourth Amendment protections against unreasonable search and seizure. Moreover, a black man was arrested for Worthington's murder in April 2005 under troubling circumstances. According to the Boston Herald, this suspect, who had an extensive criminal history of violent crimes against women, had given the police permission to take his DNA in April 2002, but police declined to do so until March 2004. During the three years it took them to take, analyze, and act on his DNA analysis, the DNA dragnet of Truro's 800 adult men was completed. Some now complain that their privacy was invaded for no reason by DNA testing, because police failed to investigate an obviously promising suspect or even to analyze his DNA sample. California, too, is forcibly taking DNA samples from people presumed innocent, people who have been arrested but not tried and convicted. Defenders of the practice often say that taking and storing such samples is no more intrusive than the common practice of taking a suspect's fingerprints. It is true that fingerprints are taken of arrested persons without too much protest that the innocent are being stigmatized. But again, DNA markers are not fingerprints. They are less specific and far more invasive. In practice, a fingerprint is not a forensically infallible means of identification, but it verifies a person's identity with enough accuracy to satisfy the legal system. However, one's DNA contains intimate information not only about one's identity, but also about one's health, 
including one's future risks of becoming prematurely senile or developing Huntington's disease or a hard-to-cure cancer. Besides harboring the markers for 4,000 disease risks, DNA also contains information about the health and identity of one's forebears and descendants. With a sample of your DNA, a person can predict certain disease and disorder probabilities for you and for your children. George Annis, a law professor and bioethicist at Boston University, has referred to one's DNA profile as a future-coded diary, and with the completion of the Human Genome Project, the code has essentially been broken. Therefore, taking the fingerprints of an arrestee and taking a sample of his DNA are not comparable acts. The latter is far more intrusive and revealing, but far less likely to yield a uniquely definitive identification. In the United States, laws prevent the federal government from retaining DNA samples of the innocent. But the states are doing just this. In 1994, police took samples from 160 black men in Ann Arbor, Michigan, many of whom complained that they had been coerced by police officers who ignored their alibis and threatened to prosecute them if they refused to submit. San Diego police similarly pressured 800 black men in order to catch a serial killer described only as dark-skinned. Black Ann Arbor residents complained that the police tactics bordered on harassment and abuse. But the men who were approached in Truro often cited subtler peer pressure and vague fears that police would scrutinize them more heavily if they refused to give a sample. However, Ann Arbor law enforcement officials denied that their investigation was discriminatory. They insisted that police were simply targeting individuals who met the description of the perpetrator. The Ann Arbor killer, along with several other men, refused to provide police with a DNA sample and was identified only after he was arrested for an unrelated crime. In mid-April 2001, Syracuse University's Lubin Center hosted a program on forensic genetic technologies, moderated by television journalist Catherine Cryer and with a panel of experts that included NYU sociology professor Troy Duster and Howard Safer, the police commissioner of New York City under Mayor Rudolph Giuliani. Safer's new career as a proponent of high-technology security includes the promulgation of his view that police should soon be allowed to use brave new genetic technologies to stop people on the street, take a buckle swab with a portable device, run the database off a satellite, and use their portable computers to see whether they have a hit. Such on-the-spot DNA testing is not yet reality, but several biotechnology firms are endeavoring to perfect portable solutions that can allow cops to stop a person, obtain a quick DNA sample, and check it against a database in minutes. One such firm, located in San Diego, is called Nanogen. It utilizes single nucleotide polymerases, SNPs, small DNA fragments that are sites of genetic difference distinctive enough to identify a suspect. Nanogen can put SMPs on a microchip the size of a stamp, technology that scientists have taken to calling SNPs on chips. Or by analyzing and comparing small areas of DNA called short tandem repeats, or STRs, a police officer armed with DNA from a buckle swab can very speedily check 13 STRs within minutes. However, some critics argue that 13 STRs is too few for reliable identification. Police outfitted with portable computers will be able to access the DNA databanks to screen the profiles of thousands of men. The FBI felons database has samples from 8,000 unsolved crime scenes, and state law enforcement has accrued approximately 620,000 samples from lawbreakers, including those suspected or convicted of minor crimes. Every state now maintains genetic databases that are matched to genetic samples taken from crime scenes, such as blood traces, in order to facilitate finding the person who has committed the crime. 
Cryer echoed the sentiments of many present when she asked why being in the genetic database would be a problem for an innocent black man. If he is not guilty, what is the problem for a man in the database? He has nothing to worry about. But he does. Multiple levels of bias feed the all-black and Hispanic databases. And lawsuits, such as the Pamela Fish case cited earlier, already have verified that DNA evidence is no more immune to fraudulent or incompetent manipulation than is other evidence. Then, too, there is the issue of collective stigmatization. If only men of color are in the database, only men of color become suspects, and only they can be convicted. Databases that exclude white men, the numerical majority group, will miss most criminals. As the American Criminal Law Review points out, optimal effectiveness, however, would require a universal DNA database that contains the DNA fingerprint of every citizen. Otherwise, potential matches would be missed. Although a universal DNA database would be more efficient than one based upon skin color, it is also ethically unacceptable because it would necessitate coercion. The DNA sweeps from Miami to London to Truro have met with varying levels of resistance and resentment and so cannot be described as voluntary. Will the novel DNA fingerprinting technology lead to the imprisonment of more African American men than have been freed because of it? This technology's benevolent face has been seen most often, but it has another sinister visage. This dual nature holds true for almost every application of genetic science to African American health and welfare. Historically, every boon appears to have been accompanied by a stigmatizing threat to health or freedom. For American blacks, genetics has always been wielded as a two-edged sword. Sickle Cell Misstep African Americans are no strangers to genetic innovation, but unfortunately, genetic therapy has long been sabotaged by racial myths and bad science. The agenda-driven nature of much genetic research with African Americans has rendered many blacks wary of all genetic science. One of the most infamous examples within recent memory has been the family of troubled genetic initiatives surrounding sickle cell disease. Chapter 6 described how, in 1910, cardiologists James B. Herrick, M.D., and Ernest E. Irons first identified the thin, elongated, sickle-shaped red blood cells of a desperately ill 20-year-old dental student from Grenada. A year later, a Virginia medical journal published a description of a 25-year-old black woman with similar symptoms. Soon, reports of African Americans with sickle cell anemia, a constellation of dire conditions ascribed to misshapen, sickled red blood cells, began to flood medical journals. When people with the disorder are exposed to environmental insults, such as low oxygen environments, their red blood cells deform into a sickled shape and become adhesive, sabotaging the cell's ability to carry sufficient oxygen and causing them to block small blood vessels, including capillaries. These events trigger excruciatingly painful episodes, known as sickle cell crises. A sickle cell crisis can generate not merely anemia, but also bleeding ulcers, strokes, a heart attack, or the loss of limbs and tissues, depending upon the location of the compromised blood vessels. Thus, physicians often prefer the term sickle cell disease, pointing out that most of the sufferer's worst medical crises have little to do with anemia. By 1920, an erroneous belief had become firmly entrenched that sickle cell disease was a racial condition that struck only African Americans. However, it also affects people from Mediterranean, Middle Eastern, and West African regions, but not those from South Africa and East Asian regions. After the supposed post-war conquest of infectious disease via antibiotics, 
and after the discovery of DNA's double helical structure in 1951, genetics gained primacy as the preeminent mode of understanding and attacking disease. In 1949, sickle cell anemia became the very first molecular disease to be identified. Scientists learned that sickle cell anemia was the worst of several sickling cell disorders and that it struck one in every 400 African-American newborns. They also knew that sickle cell disease and a slew of closely related blood disorders called hemoglobinopathies struck not only blacks, but also persons of other races. For example, one such blood disease, thalassemia, affects people of Mediterranean, Middle Eastern, and African extraction. But sickle cell anemia's identity as a black disease was so firmly entrenched that blacks with thalassemia are still often misdiagnosed with sickle cell disease. Sickle cell disease is recessive. A person must carry two of the recessive genes for sickle cell disease to develop the illness. People with only one sickle cell gene are said to be heterozygotes, or carriers, who are essentially well. But if two heterozygotes for sickle cell disease marry, their offspring run a one in four chance of developing the disease. If a carrier marries a person without the gene, none of their children will develop sickle cell disease, but their children run a one in two chance of becoming carriers themselves. Carriers of sickle cell disease are sometimes referred to as having the sickle cell trait, but despite the connotation of illness that the word trait carries, they are well. Because of the potential for confusion, this chapter avoids the term sickle cell trait whenever possible. By the late 1960s, workplaces instituted genetic screening, ostensibly to protect vulnerable employees by avoiding their placement in work environments that could trigger illness, such as a sickle cell crisis. The federal government supported initiatives that encouraged widespread genetic screening of sickle cell disease, and African Americans themselves pushed for many of these initiatives to test for and counsel people at risk for sickle cell disease. So there is no doubt that many of the projects were well-intentioned. However, some were not, and in many cases, good intentions paved the medical road to perdition. Sickle cell screening created huge problems, recalls Vernelia Randall, professor of law at Dayton University. Airlines, for example, said pilots with the trait couldn't fly. Why not if they were healthy? In 1968 and 1969, doctors at Fort Bliss in El Paso, Texas, grew concerned that Army basic training was suddenly proving more than usually hazardous, even deadly. Within 11 months, four recruits had collapsed and died suddenly, all of them black. Even more alarming were the autopsy results, which showed the men's red blood cells were now sickle-shaped. The soldiers were black, and the high altitude of the boot camp, 4,060 feet, suggested that the deaths might have been due to sickle cell disease crises triggered by the low oxygen environment characteristic of high altitudes. But the New England Journal of Medicine report on the men's deaths noted that the sickled cells didn't necessarily mean that the men had sickle cell disease, because the misshapen cells could have been a consequence, not the cause, of their deaths. When the National Academy of Sciences studied the deaths, it could neither rule out sickle cell anemia nor prove that it had killed the men. But the U.S. Air Force Academy rushed to judgment, promptly issuing a directive barring the admission of all black sickle cell carriers, healthy people. Carriers were permanently grounded, were banned from co-piloting, and were reduced to ground jobs. It is worth noting that by banning black carriers from admission, the Academy was effecting a large-scale restoration of its long-standing, nakedly race-based ban on blacks entering the Academy. But now it could offer the rationale of protecting them. Strangely, scientists as well as laypersons confused well sickle cell carriers 
with the homozygotes who had both genes for sickle cell disease and therefore had the disease. However, this confusion was no accident. It resulted in profits for Ortho Pharmaceutical Company of McNeil Laboratories, the company that sold the so-called sickle cell screening test, which did not differentiate between the sickle cell trait and sickle cell disease. Ortho was promoting and distributing a test it called SickleDex that could not discriminate between sickle cell carriers and people with sickle cell disease. That is, SickleDex detected the presence of the gene, but not whether one or two genes existed. In order to market the test, employers, military hospitals, and the government extended to carriers the same advice and restrictions that apply to people genuinely ill with sickle cell anemia. Otherwise, these agencies would have had to admit that the test was of extremely limited therapeutic value because it could not tell a sick person from a well person. The National Institutes of Health, hospitals, and private organizations disseminated brochures and booklets equating carrier status with the disease, and millions of well black people were informed that they were ill and genetically tainted. Some were told that they had a life expectancy of 20 years. The very first sentence of the preamble of the National Sickle Cell Anemia Control Act, enacted in 1972 to foster sickle cell research, screening, counseling, and education, is untrue. Two million Americans suffer from sickle cell disease. Actually, two million people were healthy carriers, and fewer than 100,000 Americans suffered from sickle cell anemia. The erroneous claim, coupled with its constantly reinforced perception of sickle cell disease as a black disorder, left Americans with the mistaken impression that a good portion, one in 12 of African Americans, suffered from sickle cell anemia. The perception of sickle cell heterozygosity as a disease state is an eloquent illustration of ethnocentrism. Because far from being unhealthy, this carrier status confers the distinct biological advantage of immunity to the deadliest strain of malaria. This helps sickle cell carriers and malarious areas to survive. At the 8th International Congress of Genetics in 1949, evolutionary biologist J.B.S. Haldane first proposed that people with one gene for sickle cell disease were more resistant to attacks by the sporozoa that cause malaria. In parts of Africa and other countries where malaria-carrying mosquitoes thrive, people who have one gene for sickle cell anemia and one gene for normal hemoglobin are not only healthier than people with sickle cell anemia, but also healthier than people without the trait, those with normal hemoglobin. Being a heterozygote for sickle cell anemia protects one from invasion by the deadly P. falciparum strain of malaria in several ways. A form of the malaria parasite, the plasmodium, infects the person's red blood cells, but in heterozygotes, the plasmodium causes only the infected red blood cells to sickle by making the cell environment more acidic. This increased acidity, in turn, makes the hemoglobin lose oxygen, which further escalates the sickling of the infected cells. However, the resulting lack of oxygen also depletes the infected cells of potassium, which kills the malaria parasites. Any surviving parasites are picked off by the person's immune system, and the sickled cells are taken out of circulation, destroyed, and eliminated from the body along with the parasites. The uninfected red blood cells do not sickle, and the person suffers neither from sickle cell disease nor from malaria. In malarious environments, sickle cell heterozygotes are 15% more likely to survive and to reproduce than their neighbors with normal hemoglobin. This is called the heterozygote advantage, and it helps to explain why the common denominator for groups carrying the sickle cell gene is not being black, but living in proximity to the malaria-bearing Anopheles mosquito. 
other genetic diseases that also are thought to confer a heterozygote advantage include cystic fibrosis, the most common genetic disease among people of European descent, which protects against the fatal dehydration of cholera and typhoid. And scientists have suggested that heterozygotes for Tay Sachs disease, which preferentially strikes Ashkenazi Jews, may enjoy increased protection against tuberculosis. Today, the United States sees only about 1,000 cases of malaria annually, so that the heterozygote advantage is not terribly useful to a North American, except for travelers to malarious areas, and as an object lesson in the interplay among genetics, disease, and culture. African Americans were among those confused by the erroneous medical advice the government was dispensing. Many states mounted compulsory genetic screening programs, which many blacks welcomed, but which caused others, including genetic experts, to feel stigmatized. For example, James Bowman, M.D., an African American professor of genetics at the University of Chicago, was the lone voice crying out in the genetic wilderness when he was invited to address a 1971 Black Panthers event. There. Sickle cell screening was being conducted by community leaders, who warned that anyone who tested positive could expect to live only twenty years longer. Bowman forcefully objected that the testing was unable to identify the genuinely ill, and that in any case, the clinical picture was far less dire. Despite Bowman's credentials and protests, the black and white organizers persisted in the erroneous testing and counseling. Seventeen states enacted sickle cell screening laws, often in response to requests from African Americans. But Black Americans did not clamor for workplace screenings, which threatened privacy and raised questions that could create a genetic underclass of workers. In 1971, almost 900 diseases were known to be genetic, yet screening tests could identify the carriers of only 50 genetic diseases. However, screening for sickle cell disease was the genetic test performed most often by employers. By 1975, tens of thousands had been screened for Tay Sachs and thalassemia, but half a million blacks had been screened for sickle cell disease. In the name of eugenics, a social history of genetics by Daniel Keflis notes: No one argued seriously for the screening of every possible parent. But some did urge the screening of people from groups at comparatively high risk for particular genetic diseases, notably blacks. The National Institutes of Health's policies and publications focused exclusively on African Americans, solidifying sickle cell anemia in the American psyche as a black disease. Unfortunately, the government policies still confused the disease state with being a carrier. Screenings were performed en masse at a variety of sites in an assembly line fashion, with agenda-driven, inaccurate counseling. When screening revealed that a person carried the trait for sickle cell disease, that information was dumped upon her. She was informed she was sick, given a brochure that erroneously equated the disease with the trait, then often dismissed without further support or answers. Except for the one piece of advice that was always dispensed, the inadvisability of marriage between two people with the trait, because they could produce children with sickle cell anemia. This was often the main informational point of the screening, to identify affected people, so that they would know not to have children. Such advice led many African Americans to accuse genetic counselors and counseling programs of genocide. Especially after 1973, that was the year amniocentesis allowed prenatal testing of the amniotic fluid, first for life-threatening disorders, then for genetic defects, and later for sickle cell anemia. This was also the year that Roe v. Wade gave American women access to legal abortion on demand. Genetic counselors. Who had dispensed pointed advice along with diagnoses since the 1950s, were supposed merely to provide diagnosis and disease information, 
but they still practiced virtually unregulated, and many recommended abortion on the basis of testing that could not discern the trait from the disease. For at-risk couples who conceived at that time, recalls Vernelia Randall, the advice was pregnancy termination. Some viewed these as attempts to limit the fertility of blacks. Discrimination against sickle cell carriers had been slow to dissipate, lagging well behind scientific knowledge. The U.S. Air Force Academy's admission bar and grounding of heterozygous pilots, for example, was ended only in 1981 by a lawsuit. Testing, testing. Today, unscrupulous employers continue to wield genetic screening, but they now do so surreptitiously, without employees' informed consent. In 2001, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission charged Burlington Northern Santa Fe Railroad with running genetic tests on workers who filed claims for carpal tunnel syndrome. If tests had shown them to have any genetic predisposition to the condition, the railroad could have argued that it should not be held liable. Some lawsuits spawned by such abuses allege racial bias. Perhaps the most egregious was the case of Norman Bloodsaw v. Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory, a research center that the federal government ran in cooperation with the University of California. In 1998, 172 employees, all but one of them black, sued LBL when they learned that they had secretly been tested for syphilis, pregnancy, and sickle cell trait without their knowledge that the blood and urine they had supplied during required physical examinations would be tested in this manner. These tests were insulting as well as intrusive and were illegal under the Americans with Disabilities Act. But what is particularly disquieting is the lack of scientific sophistication the laboratory demonstrated in testing only its black employees for the sickle cell trait. Scientists should have known that not only blacks were at risk, and they should also have known that carrier status imparted no reasonable disability risk. The blatantly racial nature of the screening was suggested when plaintiffs learned that the only white employee to have been tested for venereal disease was a white man married to a black woman. In August 2000, the University of California settled the $2.2 million suit brought by these black employees. The privacy of these workers was illegally assailed, and they could have been unfairly stigmatized. But there is another reason that being tested for genetic issues without one's consent is damaging. The price of genetic knowledge can be intolerably high. The health information contained in one's genes can give clues to prevention and self-care, but such information can also generate futile anxiety and lay one open to layers of medical and financial discrimination. If you know of a genetic condition and lie about it to your insurance company, they can refuse to cover you, observed Marion G. Secundi, Ph.D., the late director of the National Center for Bioethics in Research and Healthcare. If you learn you are at risk for a disease that cannot be treated, the information can be worse than useless. The knowledge will not enable you to protect yourself, and you will suffer mental anguish over an illness that you may never acquire. Employers who refuse to hire people when they learn of genetic indicators for a disease may relegate them to an unemployable biological underclass. And that's not just a concern for those with known genetic disorders, because everyone's genome harbors a few bad apples, genes that could but do not necessarily indicate a health problem. The more people are forced to reveal about their genome, the greater their risk of suffering genetic discrimination. Currently, black people are most likely to be subjected to such testing, in large part because testing for sickle cell disease is the most common genetic screen used by employers and insurers. A 2000 congressional report predicts that such discrimination may become widespread as employers are pressured to contain health care costs.
Already, black women, who have a higher than normal risk of the BRCA1 gene, which confers as much as a 70% higher risk of breast cancer, fear their insurers and employers may discover their status should they seek genetic testing. Some women seek gene testing on their own and pay for it out of their own pockets because they don't want their insurance company to know, noted Teen Hamilton, an Alabama genetic counselor. Might other genetic tests preclude African Americans from desirable jobs in the near future? Consider, for example, that a genetic mutation affecting resistance to chemotherapy occurs more frequently in African and African American populations than in Caucasian or Asian populations. A 1998 research study of African Americans and Hispanics living in Manhattan revealed that they harbor a genetic variant, APOE epsilon 4, that places them at a higher relative risk of developing Alzheimer's disease than whites. African Americans are more likely than whites to be healthy carriers of glucose 6 phosphate dehydrogenase G6PHD syndrome. Which can cause the loss of red blood cells and affects many medical risks and medication reactions. If this carrier status is detected by tests and is miscategorized as a disease state, will blacks be barred from desirable jobs? Of course, each of these genetic complements appears in other ethnic groups as well, but the rates, and thus the risks, are higher among African Americans. There is also the widespread misconception that simply having a disease gene means you have the disease. This is not so. Most common adult onset genetically influenced diseases, such as type 2 diabetes, hypertension, and cancer, typically result from several genetic factors, not from a single gene. It often also takes environmental triggers obesity, nutrient deficiency, Exposure to noxious chemicals, for example, to cause the disease to manifest. What's more, genes interact to temper one another's effects. All these factors complicate determining who is at risk, and they also hamper scientists' attempts at gene therapy. Less Than Global The Human Genome Project Used therapeutically, Genetics hold out promises of enormous improvements in African American health, but the promises have as yet gone unrealized. For example, research into sickle cell disorder, the first identified molecular disease, remains underfunded, and the disease still awaits an effective treatment. But effective genetic therapies were mounted within just a few years after the gene for cystic fibrosis was discovered in 1989. Whites are at much higher risk than blacks for cystic fibrosis. Therapeutic research sometimes bypasses blacks because finding a gene for an illness and curing an illness are two very different things, and decades may separate one from the other. Also, the interests of African Americans too often fall below the radar screen of mainstream genetic research, and much more quality research should be undertaken into blacks' genetic risks. This may seem an ironic concern for a book that has focused upon the experimental abuse of blacks, but it is merely the obverse of the research abuse coin. As research has become an important avenue of therapy, the proportionate inclusion of African American in ethical, therapeutic research has become imperative. Take the Human Genome Project, HGP, which has been touted as a unifying global enterprise. To map all of humanity's genes and has been sold to the public on the strength of its role in finding cures for many illnesses. The U.S. National Institutes of Health and London's Wellcome Trust have completed the vital arms of the project, which began in 1990. The 30,000 genes constituting the genetic makeup of a human being have all been identified and mapped. However, Dr. Georgia Dunstan, A geneticist at Howard University claimed in the mid 1990s that of the more than 60 families whose genes were analyzed by the project, there were no people of African descent. 
She lamented that severing the African branch of the family tree is a critical error, because African gene pools are the oldest and consequently the most diverse on the planet, due to human life's having evolved in Africa. Dunstan asked, "What picture of humankind can emerge without Africa?" Also, of the one hundred thousand professional HGP scientists from sixteen separate research universities in six countries, only a few, aside from laboratory assistants, were black. Dr. Betty G. Graham, program manager for the National Human Genome Research Institute at the National Institutes of Health. Told the Journal of Blacks in Higher Education, unfortunately, African Americans have not been involved in the first phase of the Human Genome Project. However, the relatively small numbers of blacks conducting biomedical research for the project also proved a factor. Howard University was, however, belatedly invited to contribute data, and has since received considerable support, which enabled it to open the National Human Genome Center. With Dunstan as its director, today the center is pursuing several projects of importance to African American health. Among them is a search for candidate genes of complex diseases that are common in African American populations. These include prostate cancer, breast cancer, asthma, type two diabetes, hypertension, and HIV/AIDS. The near homogeneity of the HGP is ironic. Because the stirring message of the Human Genome Project data is a ringing denunciation of race, analyses found so little variation among the genomes of what have been thought of as separate racial groups, and so many genetic characteristics in common, that race was found to have no basis in biology. This book uses the term race because it is accepted argot, a convenient. Commonly used way of designating ethnic groups that are perceived as distinct. We all know what we mean, or think we do, when we denote someone's race as black or white. In our nation, race is inarguably important in discussions of health and disease. However, the Human Genome Project has erased any lingering doubts. Biological race does not exist, because all humans share the same genes. Although the proportions of genes differ, meaning that genetic differences exist, these variations map very poorly onto what we think of as races. This seems to introduce a logical contradiction. If race is not real, how can we speak of race-based therapeutics? The answer is that race is real, but it is not biological; it is social. What correlates very closely to most racial differences in life expectancy, mortality, disease susceptibility, and survival is the race to which one is perceived as belonging. This is contrary to conventional wisdom, and at first blush seems easily refuted. The racial differences between an Icelander and a Nigerian seem obvious, but so do the differences between a dark-skinned Asian from southern India. And a pale North African, yet the former person is classified as Caucasian, and the latter as black. Historically, confusion has been sown by the fact that in the early days of the Republic and of African enslavement, the Africans who were imported represented only the polar opposite of pale-skinned Europeans in skin color and hair types. Africa is home to people of every skin color, hair type. Stature or other physical measure, but the rich diversity of Africa, and for that matter of Europe, was not represented in 17th century America. Only the dark-skinned denizens of West Africa and principally pale-skinned Anglo-Saxons populated the colonies. If our forebears had included dark-skinned Finns and Mediterraneans on the one hand, and North Africans, East Africans, Egyptians, and Somalians on the other. They would have had a better appreciation for the presence of similar phenotype traits in all ethnic groups. When one looks at the diverse bounty of all peoples, it is easier to appreciate that most of the various criteria we have for sorting people into races—skin color, eye color, hair texture, body type, blood types, disease susceptibility. 
map very poorly onto genetic frequencies, albeit with a few dramatic exceptions. For there are exceptions, and although they are rare, it is important from a medical point of view to recognize them when we see them, if we want to devise the best possible medical treatments. However, many genetic diseases are no respecters of race. As we have seen, sickle cell disease affects Mediterranean peoples, Africans, and South Asians, among others. The autoimmune disorder sarcoidosis afflicts principally African Americans and Scandinavians. Some genetic risk factors for diseases such as heart disease, prostate cancer, and low birth weight are present in African Americans, but not in Nigerians and West Indians, suggesting that factors other than African heredity are at work. Today, the commercial marketing of genetic theories is being undertaken with data from the HGP, with African American markets very much in mind. A vital part of this marketing plan involves African American pharmacogenomics, the custom tailoring of medications to exploit genetic variations. But statistically, only a small percentage of genetic variations, about 0.1 percent, one in a thousand. Can be laid to race, exploiting that real one genetic difference in a thousand to develop more effective medications for African Americans or for any other group, is an exciting, very positive tool, especially if it can focus upon major killers such as cancer, heart disease, stroke, and HIV. However, most genetically distinct diseases and differences between ethnic groups. Account for only a small fraction of the illness and death in any community. Heart of Darkness. In the late 1990s, the Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America (Pharma) boasted that its members had 99 medications in development that addressed the particular medical needs of African American patients. By 2004, that number had grown to 249 medicines. But these were not drugs tailored specifically to black patients' medical needs. Nearly all of these medications treated illnesses that African Americans suffer at higher rates than whites, which encompasses nearly every serious ailment. It is certainly laudable that drug companies are producing medications that address black health needs. However, the implication that these were tailored to racial needs is easily recognizable as a marketing ploy. The case of Bital, a heart drug approved by the FDA in July 2005, is different. Bital is an oral combination of two drugs, hydralazine and isosorbid dinitrate, that acts as antioxidants, widen blood vessels, and produce nitric oxide, which Bital makers say provides beneficial effects for African American heart failure patients. It was developed for its potential to reduce deaths and serious illness among African Americans diagnosed with congestive heart failure. CHF is a condition in which the heart muscle, which has been weakened or otherwise compromised by injury or disease, fails to maintain circulation properly. The overwhelmed heart triggers a cascade of functional deterioration that culminates in a slow death. It is commonly fatal within a decade of diagnosis. People with congestive heart failure may suffer from constant fatigue, swollen legs, and respiratory problems. Or heart failure may be insidiously asymptomatic. Bidel's patent holders say their medication's mechanism of action addresses a genetic anomaly that makes African Americans particularly susceptible to CHF. This medication is in the vanguard of new commercial marketing of genetic therapies for blacks. Nitromed, the Cambridge, Massachusetts biotechnology firm that developed Bidel, claims that it is the first specifically tailored medication to treat congestive heart failure in an estimated 750,000 African American patients. Clearly, Bidel should be embraced. And supported if it works to decrease death and disability due to CHF. But its marketing as an exclusively African American genetic medication 
is just as clearly troubling for both scientific and social reasons. First, is the medication driven by a true biological dimorphism in black heart patients, or is it the product of a fertile market? In an illuminating analysis in the Yale Journal of Health Policy, Law, and Ethics, Jonathan Kahn has weighed the medical evidence and found it wanting. His investigation reveals that Bidel began life not as a specialized medication tailored for African American heart patients, but as a heart drug aimed at the general public. Neither its first clinical trials in 1987, nor its patent application in 1988, mentioned racial applications. And only after the FDA Advisory Committee refused to approve Bidel's use for a general population in 1997 did Nitromed reanalyze 20-year-old data from its first trials, looking for possible special applications that might allow it to approach the FDA with a revised application. The Food and Drug Administration's Modernization Act had recently required inclusion of racial minorities and women in clinical trials, and in 1997, Surgeon General David Satcher drafted the resolution that made resolving racial health disparities a national priority. In 1998, Bidel was reborn as a black medication, rescuing the drug from pharmaceutical oblivion. But how did Nitromed make a case for Bidel's transformation from a medication for everyone to a genetic drug that addresses specific weaknesses in African Americans, even before clinical trials were conducted? Was it based upon a proven special utility for black patients? In part, Nitromed achieved this by creating a perception of CHF in blacks as a racially distinctive disease, then supplying the medication that was necessary to address this biological dimorphism. First, as Kahn has pointed out, Bidil's makers made a case for CHF as a racial disease claiming that there is a huge difference in the mortality rate between black and white patients with CHF. Nitromed scientists claimed that CHF kills blacks at twice the rate it does whites, and publications from Science to Today in Cardiology, as well as press releases from the Association of Black Cardiologists, affirmed this disparity. But the data contradict this claim. It is true that proportionately twice as many blacks as whites died of CHF in 1988, but reducing the rate of heart failure in African Americans has been a medical success story, and by 2003, the gap had nearly closed. Most recent CDC figures indicate that the racial ratio of heart failure deaths is 1.1 blacks for every one white. They are almost identical. Kahn traced the provenance of Nitromed's widely disseminated figures and found that they were based upon very old studies, including National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, NHLBI, data collected in 1995. At the time Nitromed was using this data, it was already woefully outdated and no longer accurate. Nitromed's researchers used numbers that were not only old, but also inappropriate, because they cited National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, NHANES, data from 1988 that described prevalence, the number of people suffering from CHF, which is very different from mortality, the number of deaths from CHF. One 1987 study does not seem at first blush to support the Nitromed figures because it indicated that 1.8 black men died of CHF for every affected white man, and that 2.4 black women with CHF died for every afflicted white woman. But in addition to being old, superseded figures, these figures describe deaths within a specific age range, from 35 to 74. Thus they reveal a serious disparity in the age at death, not in absolute deaths, the same percentage of blacks and whites die of CHF. But 50% of blacks who die of CHF are between the ages of 35 and 74, while only 30% of whites who die of CHF are 74 or younger. Most whites who die of CHF 
do so quite late in life. In short, bad data helped Bidel boosters to portray CHF as a racial disease by exaggerating its death rates in blacks and raising the specious question of why so many more blacks than whites die of the disease. Nitromed explained that only physiology could explain such a dramatic disparity in the death rate. In doing so, Beidel's promoters discount the well-substantiated research into myriad non-genetic factors that drive CHF death rates. Non-genetic interventions in the form of better access to medical care, more preventive lifestyle changes, and high-tech interventions have already cut the African-American CHF death rates from twice that of whites in 1988 to essentially the same as whites in 2003. This fairly quick reduction didn't emanate from genetic techniques or changes, and thus strongly suggests that non-genetic factors are most important. So does recent research that suggests heart failure is fed by hypertension and kidney disease. Hypertension in blacks, in turn, has been shown to be driven by stress, including the stress of racism, by diets that are high in fat, possibly by salt sensitivity, by overweight, and by obesity. There is even evidence that hantavirus infection spread by rodents in urban settings can cause kidney disease and hypertension. So can exposures to some poisons in such urban settings. A slew of reports, beginning with those published by the New England Journal of Medicine in February 1998, have shown that limited access to high-tech care has also fed blacks higher mortality from heart disease. But researchers and news articles that discuss the merits of Beidel tend to give the non-genetic factors short shrift. As Kahn points out, Clyde Yancey, a black cardiologist on the steering committee of Beidel's trial, says that the data do not support socioeconomic factors as important contributors to the excess mortality rate seen in African Americans affected with heart failure. Bidel patent holder J. Cohn, M.D., and his colleagues wrote papers positing a genetic mechanism for CHF in blacks, a pathophysiology found primarily in black patients that may involve nitric oxide insufficiency, which makes the cause of their heart failure different from that of whites. Clyde Yancey agreed, saying, Heart failure in blacks is likely to be a different disease, and adds, the emerging field of genomic medicine has provided insight into potential mechanisms to explain racial variability in disease expression. But even if the putative difference in nitric oxide metabolism were found primarily in African American patients, this would not mean that all African American patients in heart failure harbor it, or even most African American patients nor would it mean that such an anomaly is restricted to blacks. Since the publication of Kahn's analysis, Nitromed has quietly revised the numbers in its promotional materials. It no longer claims that African-American CHF deaths are double those of whites. But the alarm sounded by its earlier claims already served its purpose. The FDA gave the drug another opportunity in clinical trials. This time, to prove that the drug is efficacious against CHF in African Americans. In 2003, Nitromed, with the Association of Black Cardiologists as a highly visible participant and supporter, mounted a clinical trial. Nitromed enrolled 1,050 African Americans for the trial of Bidel as a treatment for heart failure in African American subjects. The trial was called AHEFT, an acronym for the African American Heart Failure Trials, and it tested Bidel not on its own, but in conjunction with fully approved heart medications. In August 2004, the clinical trials to demonstrate Bidel's safety and efficacy were halted because, its makers say, the results were clearly beneficial to blacks suffering from heart failure. The results showed that 6.2% of patients given Bidel died. 10.2% of patients who did not receive Bidel died, 
constituting a 43% survival advantage for those taking the medications. The FDA has approved Vital's race-based labeling. This means that although a doctor may choose to prescribe it for non-African Americans in an off-label use, insurers will not have to cover its cost for them. The study should have included whites in order to provide evidence that the drug works differently in blacks. But because the patents for use in all races will expire in 2007, there is no economic incentive to test the drug in whites. Nitromed will hold the patent for the use of Bidil in blacks until 2020. In an ironic twist, whites are being subjected to racial exclusion by being denied access to testing or use of a heart drug that could benefit them or even save their lives. Nitromed stock rode the good news from the AHEF trials to a 73% leap in share price. Because it was tested only with other drugs, Bidil typically will be prescribed for use in concert with other drugs, not instead of them, so that Bidil will not compete in the marketplace with established heart medications. This will help Bidil sales, and this could even explain why Bidil was tested only against a placebo. Had Bidil been tested alone, researchers would have run the risk that the study results could have been different, finding that Bidil provided less protection to black patients than standard medications. Because heart disease is the number two killer of blacks and whites, Bidil should be embraced if it indeed conveys a racial benefit to blacks with CHF. So should any therapy that accurately targets clinically meaningful disease vulnerabilities in African Americans. But the development of a genetic drug for what has been newly dubbed a racial disease also raises long-term issues that temper its immediate benefits. We soon will see other medications marketed for genetically distinct populations of African Americans. The glaucoma medication, Travitan, is being promoted to African Americans as the first glaucoma drug to demonstrate greater effectiveness in black patients, although the FDA required informational insert indicates in fine print that eye color may be a better indicator of its effectiveness than race. Prostate cancer therapies genetically tailored for African American men are in the pipeline. Recently, 89% of breast cancer tumors from African American women tested positive for a newly found gene, BP1, compared with 57% of those from Caucasian women. Can a special medication tailored to the black breast be far behind? It will also be important for African Americans to study and, where applicable, to support such research efforts by joining ethical therapeutic trials that offer the best possible safety protections. To find these trials, African Americans should discuss them with their personal physicians and consult resources available online that offer how-to primers on joining clinical trials. But unsurprisingly, given the subject of this book, I also advise African Americans to look before they leap. Although many black cardiologists and many in the African American news media applaud the Bidil innovation, the specter of neo-racial disease based upon questionable genetics should give one pause for many reasons. African Americans must actively support the search for disease risks and therapies, but they must also be conscious of the long-term import of funneling scarce resources into race-based medications unless they provide the best therapeutic approaches. A genetic fix for a non-genetic disease is unlikely to be the most efficient approach. What's more, racializing CHF allows scientists and policymakers to ignore the environmental factors that are the chief causes of the racial heart disease disparity. Racial genomics also raises profound social questions. If physicians fall back into the antebellum habit of treating black ailments according to race, will not this condemn many to poorer, stereotyped, less appropriate care? Because race is not a biological reality, medications based upon group biological differences will work only for some African Americans. This will lead to a false sense of security and will stymie the search for more inclusive, more efficacious, and in a word, 
better treatments. We must recognize the powerful stigmatizing potential of genetic approaches to disease, especially when they are touted as the only approach. From tools that could release or convict to the troubled history of genetic disease fixes that may provide cures or mere stigmatization, genetics offers a cornucopia of medical answers and pitfalls to blacks. The next chapter gives the history of another mixed blessing, research into infectious diseases. Chapter 13. Infection and Inequity Illness as Crime Unhealthy places and decadent times infect us by their contagion. Joseph Joubert In April 1992, 34-year-old Milton Ellison made the front page of the New York Times after being unshackled. They had me chained to the bed for three weeks, he told the Times. Ellison was not held for assault, rape, or murder. His crime was more subtle. He had tuberculosis and had not complied with his doctor's orders to take medication. He was jailed not in a cell at New York City's Rikers Island prison, but in an Orange County, New York hospital. Health officials had summoned sheriff's deputies, who transported him to the hospital, where his wrist and ankles were shackled to a hospital bed, and he was given his medication under the observation of not doctors, but deputies. After his weeks-long ordeal, Ellison, who was a schizophrenic, asked, Why was that necessary? If I were ill, I couldn't go anywhere. Ellison was not the only patient to be incarcerated. Other major cities, including Boston, San Francisco, Atlanta, and Washington, D.C., have taken the same steps. Public health expert Georges Benjamin, M.D., who now serves as the editor of the American Journal of Public Health, said, There are rules on the books that allow caregivers to get court orders to force individuals to be hospitalized. You hospitalize them until they are no longer infectious. However, these rules are public health laws that require a hearing before involuntary commitment, a hearing that Allison was not given. A disquieting racial disparity characterizes the patient profiles of those forced to undergo such containment therapy. Between 1988 and April 1991, the New York City Health Commissioner ordered 33 tuberculosis patients to be held in hospitals against their will until they were no longer infectious. 79% were black. As we have heard, blacks have long been perceived as particularly vulnerable to some infectious diseases. So perhaps it should not surprise us that when emerging diseases such as AIDS and hepatitis C appeared, these were racialized as well. What's more, blacks are also frequently presented as vectors of disease, posing a threat of infection to whites. In the 1930s and 1940s, African-American public health advocates, following in the footsteps of Booker T. Washington, promoted such initiatives as Negro Health Week, to provide tuberculosis prevention and care to blacks, who rarely gained entree to quality medical care. But white support of such initiatives was predicated on concerns that the black domestics who cared for their children, cleaned their homes, drove their cars, and prepared their meals might import tuberculosis into white households. Tuberculosis, often referred to as TB, is an ancient infectious disease that usually attacks the lungs and is often fatal if not treated properly. It was once feared mightily, just as AIDS displaced cancer in our bestiary of medical horrors, cancer once displaced tuberculosis, after antibiotics seemed to vanquish TB. In the developing world, many deaths from AIDS are still due to the tuberculosis that accompanies it. In the United States, Half of incarcerated TB sufferers are not only black, but also homeless, and many have a history of mental illness, alcohol and drug abuse, or all of the above risk factors. Until recently, we have consigned infectious diseases to the past. This is because, 50 years ago, the discovery of antibiotics 
and the development of vaccines, armed scientists with magic bullets against disease-causing microbes such as bacteria and viruses. The Sabin vaccine had tamed polio, and antibiotics such as rifampin promised to eradicate tuberculosis. Bubonic plague and bacterial meningitis were being controlled for the first time. The diseases tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussis, once mass murderers, were already memories. Unfortunately, we then seem to lose our respect for infective organisms, because we had the antibiotic cure handy in a pill or a syringe. The apparent conquest of infectious diseases fostered an ominous hubris, as health systems abandoned public health measures designed to prevent infection. Antibiotics replaced hygiene and basic public health measures. Hospital wards no longer boasted pathogen-killing ultraviolet lights and special ventilation that constrained the movement of airborne pathogen-laden air. Secure medical wards to quarantine the ill disappeared, as did regular testing in schools and workplaces. Education and case finding, the regular monitoring of the public to find people with tuberculosis, ended. The result? Over a decade ago, we realized that profligate use of antibiotics and short-sighted public health measures had combined to turn the common E. coli bacteria in hamburger into a killer, to transform the common Staphylococcus germ into flesh-eating variants, and to summon even deadlier manifestations of diseases like tuberculosis from their ashes. Tuberculosis underwent a horrible renaissance because when case finding was abandoned, people with TB went undiagnosed and untreated, at least not attended to in time to save their lives or those they infected. Also, people who should have been taking medication for TB were often non-compliant. That is, they did not take medications at the recommended doses for the necessary length of time. As a result, not all of their TB bacilli were killed, and the surviving TB bacilli were hardier and resistant to some of the drugs that had once vanquished them. TB is no longer easily cured with the drugs that worked so well 50 years ago, said Roscoe C. Young, M.D., a pulmonary specialist at Meharry Medical School. Instead of one drug taken for a short time, doctors now must use four drugs in a complicated schedule that can spread over years to treat this deadlier, multi-drug-resistant tuberculosis, MDRTB. We now have highly virulent strains of tuberculosis with the airborne propensity for spreading. AIDS has also abetted TB cases among African Americans. Two-thirds of people with AIDS die of lung disease. And if they are African American, that lung disease is more likely to be tuberculosis than pneumocystis carinii pneumonia. Doctors invoke disease resistance to explain why they must reluctantly force treatment upon the drug-resistant, such as Ellison. They explain that compared to the earlier, slow-progressing version that took years to contract and develop, today's TB bugs propagate quickly, promiscuously, and with greater lethality. TB patients who repeatedly abandon long, carefully orchestrated regimens of up to four drugs can die, but not before infecting others. Despite this rationale, 27% of the infectious persons locked away by New York City do not suffer from drug-resistant strains. George's Benjamin, who is African-American, emphasizes that locking up patients should be the last resort, and his reluctance to do so is obvious. There are policies and procedures in place that most public health officials would try first, he explains. For example, they try to do directly observed therapy, DOT, in which a nurse or other public health professional watches a patient to ensure that medications are correctly taken. But sadly, funds to support such intermediate measures have dwindled, leaving doctors with fewer options before detaining patients. Funding may also factor in some decisions to monitor patients closely or to confine them to hospital units, because health institutions earn more for patients undergoing DOT, or forced hospital treatment, than for voluntary patients. 
For example, in 1992, Medicaid paid only $38.82 per patient per week for routine doctor visits by the patient, but it paid $95.90 when a worker visited the patient's home for DOT. Hospitals could receive grants of as much as $50,000 to build DOT programs. However, the ethical problems of detaining TB patients, who are mostly black men, extend beyond any whiff of financial inducement. 34% of the TB cases in the United States affect blacks, who constitute only 12.3% of the population, a 300% greater TB risk for blacks than for whites. TB has always been more prevalent in blacks, but not due to genetic susceptibility. Explained Margaret Cadre, M.D., chief of infectious disease at Morehouse School of Medicine, but because of socio-economic conditions, we have been among the poorest people and often live in urban centers amidst crowded conditions and a lack of access to health care. One wonders whether, if tuberculosis singled out upper-class whites, less punitive solutions would abound. The history of a persistent TB epidemic at New York's Rikers Island prison may be instructive on that score. In 1982, the Legal Aid Society sued the city's corrections department, demanding that it address inmate illness and deaths resulting from its long-time tuberculosis epidemic. That year, there were 2,268 new TB cases. By late 1991. There were 4,426 cases. In January 1992, a new drug-resistant TB killed 27 inmates. Then, an infected white corrections officer died. The city responded with alacrity, signing a renovation contract within the month on February 8th with Mark Corrections Inc. of Maywood, New Jersey, and building a new high-tech tuberculosis isolation wing. Which was speedily erected at a cost of four million dollars. There is no easy answer to the multi-drug-resistant TB threat, but in light of its racially disparate containment approaches, we should give the shackles a rest and fund more medical approaches. Confining medically underserved TB sufferers fails to address impaired health, poor access to care, crowding, and homelessness. The root causes of the tuberculosis upswing. In fact, the fear of being locked up may dissuade people with TB from seeking treatment. There are also slippery slope issues. We jail people with TB today. Might we jail people with SARS tomorrow? Alcoholics, smokers. Less punitive practices and more medical solutions might include wide-scale vaccination. A step that the government has so far resisted funding, probably because the Bacillus calmet gyran vaccine, the world's most widely used, is imperfect, protecting only four out of five people vaccinated, and triggering a painful reaction called regional lymphadenopathy in a few. Policymakers might also consider a better coordination of public health systems to give immigrants, the homeless, prisoners. And migrant workers easier access to treatment. Currently, health policy simply abandons or incarcerates the infected as non-compliant when they fail to scale the formidable barriers of cost and access between themselves and good medical care. Drug-resistant tuberculosis proved to be merely a sentinel disease. Within the last few decades, new infectious diseases or reinvigorated old ones. Have materialized as global threats, from the AIDS pandemic to hepatitis C to SARS. An infectious disease represents far more than a physical ailment that is caused by pathogens and the organisms on which they travel, disease vectors in medical argot. Infectious diseases also pose a threat to entire populations. Their spread, prevalence, and treatment is closely linked to social factors. Including crowding, poverty, inequitable access to medications, incarceration rates, women's rights, and a host of other political and social stressors. 
These threats have played out very differently for African Americans than for whites, and a few examples illustrate how biased research and inequitable policies have shaped the uncomfortably close relationship between African Americans and infectious disease. AIDS. In 2002, HIV infection outstripped the Black Death as the single deadliest pandemic in recorded history. According to the Joint United Nations Program on HIV/AIDS, 40.3 million people across the globe are infected with HIV, and 3 million died of AIDS in 2005. Sub-Saharan Africa is the most heavily affected region. Because it is home to 64 percent of new HIV infections, closer to home, HIV now constitutes the third leading cause of death for young adult African Americans, those between 25 and 44 years of age. In 2004, the CDC determined that most of the AIDS cases in the United States were diagnosed in African Americans. As this book went to press. AIDS was being diagnosed in Black Americans at ten times the rate as in whites. It is twenty-five times more common in Black women than in white women, and ten times more common in Black men than in white men. Nearly all American children infected by HIV, approximately eighty-three percent, are Black or Hispanic. But one reads more about the tragic plight of Sub-Saharan African children than about the children in our own backyards. This observation plays into a perception by many African Americans that because AIDS strikes the marginalized, concern and sympathy have been largely replaced by stigmatization, moral judgment, and deadly indifference. In the 1980s, however, AIDS was first identified in what was then an equally marginalized group: gay white men. They were widely maligned as people with reprehensible lifestyles. Whose behaviors put them at risk for what was dubbed the gay plague. When it became clear that intimate relations between gay men and others were facilitating the spread of HIV into populations previously thought immune, such as straight whites, this misplaced moral disdain escalated into accusations that gays were sources of contagion, and that their behavior needed to be constrained by public health laws. The debate was encapsulated in San Francisco journalist Randy Schultz's controversial social history of the pandemic's early days, and the ban played on. Schultz detailed the role of Gaetan Duga, known as Patient Zero, who knowingly infected many other men. But gay men's behavior was not heavily circumscribed, because fierce debates over the human rights and dignity of gays ensued, and thus. Few of the proposed constraints were enacted into law. Bathhouses that facilitated anonymous sex were closed, but the public health department made no attempt to trace men's sexual contacts, to quarantine those infected men who refused to protect their partners, or to force men to divulge their HIV status. Certainly, no one was jailed. In fact. Cuba was almost universally condemned for its claim that it had contained the HIV epidemic by quarantining the infected. Thus, the standard public health tactics of infection control, including contact tracing and selective quarantine, were rejected in the early days of the epidemic, when they might have had the most usefulness in stemming the spread of the pandemic. However, the focus of the pandemic shifted. As black people were infected in large numbers, and they became identified with the vectors of the disease, HIV was very early posited to have an origin among people of color, though it was first found among whites. By the late 1980s, medical journals and news media referred to several classes of the HIV infected. There was early and frequent reference to innocent victims of AIDS, which intimated the existence of other. Presumably guilty victims. The innocent included infected children, such as Ryan White, and such sympathetic exemplars as Kimberly Bergales. What they had in common, besides media sympathy, was white skin and virginity. Ryan White was a ten-year-old boy who had been cast out of his school because of his HIV status, 
and whose family had been persecuted by fearful neighbors. This sad tale of cruel discrimination against a sick child was narrated by newspapers and television everywhere, and was punctuated by frequent reminders of his innocent status. He had not contracted HIV from a sexual encounter or injected drug use. Neither had Kimberly Bergalis, another innocent victim, who had been infected by a dentist implicated in the possibly intentional infections of several other patients, patients we never saw, before his demise from HIV disease. Bergalis was constantly profiled, and her courage, religious faith, and ravaged youth made it impossible not to sympathize with her plight. Her virginity, which certified her status as an innocent victim, was mentioned in a high percentage of the news stories describing her plight. But the demographics of HIV infections began to change as HIV preyed upon the marginalized, the Africans, and, in this country, the poor and black. Early newspaper stories on the shifting demographics were given little prominence. Neither were reports that the rural South was emerging as an epicenter of infection. But by 1997, a sea of change had taken place, and news reports informed us that HIV affected a much larger percentage of blacks than whites, that it had become the chief killer of young African Americans, and that most children with HIV were black and or Hispanic. First in the minds of many Americans, and finally in grim reality, as certified by CDC statistics, AIDS had become a black disease. Not all the news about AIDS and blacks is bad, although too often silence greets hopeful news that contradicts AIDS' status as a black disease. For example, although journalists publicize and celebrate hopeful news about white men who have resisted illness despite long-term HIV infections, a resounding media silence followed similar tidings about groups of African women who, by 1997, seemed to have achieved what the best laboratories in the world could not, the power to ward off HIV infection. Over six years, 10% of a group of Nairobi prostitutes, under study, remained uninfected, although each had sex with hundreds of men. The resistant women didn't use condoms or receive medical care any more frequently than their infected counterparts. Scientists aren't sure how their bodies outwitted the virus, but human leukocyte antigens, HLAs, smart proteins that recognize foreign invaders, are probably the chief factor. Many vaccines have been designed by studying people who display puzzling immunities. For example, Edward Jenner first perfected the smallpox vaccine in 1796 after studying milkmaids who became immune after contracting the more benign cowpox. The Nairobi women have the potential to be today's milkmaids, the source of a life-saving vaccine out of Africa. So one might expect these women to be the focus of media and popular speculation. But popular references to Africans' natural immunities have disappeared, although medical research continues to explore their potential as promising domestic pockets of possible disease resistance. American attitudes toward people with AIDS have also mutated from protective to punitive. More restrictive laws have evolved into the litmus test for public health advocates and legislators who wish to be perceived as addressing the pandemic. Testing Children the term innocent victims has largely disappeared from newspaper pages. Not even the infants who were tested for HIV without their mother's knowledge, or the African infants whose mothers lost their prophylactic azithromycin or AZT, when U.S. drug trials ended, are now specified as innocent victims. Children with HIV are increasingly finding that their status is that of involuntary research subjects, not victims. In December 2004, for example, the journal Nature Medicine reported that since the early 1990s, HIV-positive orphans have been the subjects of dozens of national clinical trials 
run by researchers at Columbia University Medical Center and other New York City area hospitals. Mammoth pharmaceutical corporations such as GlaxoSmithKline, the manufacturer of Zidovudine, have sponsored the testing of antiretroviral and other pharmaceuticals on scores of HIV-infected orphans housed in New York City's Incarnation Children's Center, ICC. This institution for the HIV-infected is run by Catholic Charities in Washington Heights, a neighborhood where Columbia University conducted fenfluramine violence studies, as detailed in Chapter 11. The ICC orphans were born to HIV-positive mothers, and their parents either are dead or have been deemed unfit to care for them by the courts. Within ICC's walls, Columbia University Medical Center physicians manage AIDS drug trials approved by the Pediatric AIDS Clinical Trials Group, PACTG, a network that imposes standards for and evaluates clinical trials for the care of HIV-infected children. These trials were supported by the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases and the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development, with the approval of New York's Administration for Children's Services, ACS. Catherine Painter, M.D., the medical director of Incarnation Children's Center, acknowledges that ICC is affiliated with Columbia Presbyterian and receives HIV-infected children from six New York hospitals, Columbia Presbyterian, Harlem Hospital, New York Hospital, St. Luke's Roosevelt, Kings County Hospital in Brooklyn, and SUNY, as well as from outpatient HIV clinics in the city, in the five boroughs, and in Westchester. She also verified that, as was mentioned in Chapter 11, the children are subjects in the testing of experimental drugs. Many of the clinics that refer to us are participating in clinical drug trials, she told the New York Press in 2004. Children participating in a drug trial undergo monitoring, testing, and supply of an experimental drug through their outpatient clinic, and we maintain that treatment here. Thirty-six experiments were conducted at the ICC between 1997 and 2003, and GlaxoSmithKline sponsored four of these. The center's experimental activities are not unique or even unusual for New York, according to the BBC, whose November 2004 television documentary, Guinea Pig Kids, noted that over 23,000 of the city's children are either in foster care or independent homes run mostly by religious organizations on behalf of the local authorities, and almost 99% are black or Hispanic. Researchers and ICC staff characterize these clinical trials as therapeutic, intended for the benefit of the children. And researchers agree that pediatric drugs require testing in children because children metabolize and react to medications differently than adults do. However, children's advocates question the therapeutic nature of these experimental drugs, pointing out that they have debilitating, even fatal side effects, including anemia, muscle wasting, organ failure, fatal destruction of bone marrow, the site of red blood cell production, life-threatening liver diseases, cancers, bodily deformations, brain damage, painful and fatal skin conditions and likely genetic mutations, liver swelling, unsightly fat deposits, and skin necrosis, death and sloughing of the skin. Some of the candidate AIDS medications are being tested to determine their toxicity. Children as young as four were given cocktails of up to seven potent medications, although physicians are normally reluctant to give young children even approved powerful medications. Little, if any, benefit accrued to the infants from these risky procedures, because although some were HIV positive, they were too young to have developed AIDS. One study is of stavudine alone or in combination with didanosine, a combination that has killed adult women. An experimental vaccine administered to children as young as 12 months utilizes live chickenpox virus, 
even though it can trigger the disease itself. A study titled HIV Levels in Cerebrospinal Fluid required that infants undergo a spinal tap, a risky, invasive, and painful procedure. There was even a study on HIV-negative children that used an experimental HIV vaccine. By law, such a non-therapeutic study on healthy children can convey only minimal risk, but the vaccine's risks are unknown. Also, some of the experiments did not involve HIV therapeutics. One drug trial tested a herpes medication for tolerance, safety, and pharmacokinetic information. Another investigated reactions to a double dose of measles vaccine in six-month-old infants. For its part, Columbia University released a statement denying that the drug's side effects were serious enough to warrant discontinuing treatment. However, this should have been the parents' call, not the universities or the ICCs. But guardians and parents who adopted HIV-infected children have found the ICC, ACS, and researchers arrayed against them when they have tried to take children off medications they found to be harmful. In explaining her take on this struggle, Dr. Painter has said, "We're having an increase in referrals over the last years to deal with medication adherence. There are a fair number of children whose HIV illness may be well controlled, but whose families are experiencing difficulty." complying with the child's medication regimen. By referrals, Painter means children who are torn from parents and return to the various agencies when these parents and guardians balk at dispensing the investigational drugs. Federal law gives parents the ultimate right to decide when the promise of an experimental treatment exceeds the risks and side effects, and gives them the right to withdraw a child from a clinical trial at any point in the experiment. But most of these children have no parents, or their parents have been deemed unfit by the courts to care for them. The children are too young to give legal consent to participate in the HIV studies, and their legal guardian is the city, or an allied governmental agency, which is the same entity that has committed to conducting the trial. The New York City Department of Health enrolled the children in drug trials in the early 1990s, and the city's ACS gave permission for the ICC children to be used. The agency receives funds for hosting the trial, and needs a minimal number of subjects. Therefore, it should not also be the arbiter of the children's participation. It is not disinterested and cannot be objective. Yet the agencies are allowed to enroll the children as research subjects en masse, although federal regulations require individual consent for each child. In fact, the ICC forces the medications upon children over the objections of foster or adoptive parents. Mona Newberg, a New York City teacher, adopted her great grandniece and great nephew. And removed them from the ICC in 2002. She refused to sign papers permitting her children to be used in AIDS experiments, but told a journalist in the fall of 2003 that ACS has signed for me when I didn't want to give Sean, her adopted son, drugs. When I said no, the ACS caseworker grabbed the form and said, "I'll sign it. You don't need to." They're always switching medications. They never ask me if it's okay. Jacqueline Herger is another foster parent, and one with a unique perspective. She is an experienced pediatric nurse, who worked at the ICC for years before she fostered two children as a prelude to adopting them. One Saturday morning, ACS came to the door, accused her of child abuse, and seized her children. Her crime. She had withdrawn them from the experimental AIDS medications and insists that they had become happier and healthier. As a medical professional, she is better able than most to ascertain whether the benefit of an experimental drug justifies the harm it is doing the child. But ACS has prevented her from seeing her children. Painter seems to validate Herger's accounts. When she describes the ICC policy toward compliance with the investigational drugs, 
What we're asking of our families and patients in terms of adherence is something beyond 100%. All of their medicines, all the time, whether they have them on hand or not, whether the medication makes them sick or whether they're sick with a concurrent illness. Despite Herger's status as the children's foster mother and her medical training, the ICC trumps parental consent for these children. Such a scenario evokes the question, is the state's chief motivation a desire to maximize the children's health or its own desire to complete AIDS research protocols? The BBC documentary claimed, if the children refuse the drugs, they're held down and have them force-fed. If the children continue to resist, they're taken to Columbia Presbyterian Hospital where a surgeon puts a plastic tube through their abdominal wall into their stomachs. From then on, the drugs are injected directly into their intestines. ICC spokesperson Gerald McKelvey acknowledged that the city sometimes took children from foster parents who had refused to administer the drugs. But he denied to Nature Medicine that children were ever forcibly administered medications. Of course some kids were reluctant, as kids are, to take their medicine, he said. It was not children, however, but recalcitrant parents, some of whom were medical professionals, who were reluctant to administer medications because of the debilitating effects on the children, and the fear that they were being exploited as non-consenting subjects. For several years, U.S. research protocols with African American and Hispanic children who constitute virtually all the American children living with HIV, have exposed an alarming willingness to jeopardize their health and rights. A Public Health Dragnet The legal constraints that had been deemed inappropriately repressive for white gay men in the 1980s and early 1990s have been vigorously applied to African Americans, especially African American men. Increasingly, laws have mandated the testing of whole groups, such as pregnant women and prisoners. At least 29 states punish or incarcerate those who pass the virus on to others, and scores of similar bills are waiting in the wings. It has bothered me that when more punitive laws have come up, it is black people who are affected, observed the late Dr. Walter Shervington, a New Orleans psychiatrist and former president of the National Medical Association. The issue of contact tracing best exemplified the shifting mood. There are two types of such tracing. Voluntary notification programs allow the patient with HIV to notify his partners. But in mandatory programs, health department officials notify the patient's sexual contacts that they are at risk and must be tested. Patients are identified by code, which partially preserves confidentiality, or by the person's name, which affords none. New York State the former infection epicenter, which once championed patient advocacy and privacy protection for AIDS, has legislated a quite restrictive form of mandatory notification. If you test positive for HIV in New York, the doctor must report your name to the state. The county health department obtains the names of your sexual contacts and informs them that they are at risk and need testing. Contact tracing is an uncomfortable but essential technique of infectious disease control because it attempts to bridge a real information gap. The February 1998 Archives of Internal Medicine revealed that four out of every ten HIV-infected persons failed to warn partners of their status and that only 43% of these silent carriers use a condom. Blacks, men or women, are even less likely than whites to alert partners of their HIV-positive status. Prominent public health officials, such as Surgeon General David Satcher, warned almost a decade ago that contact tracing was essential to the early testing and tracking that can reverse the pandemic. 
In 1996, Satcher observed, We're getting to the point where we have to have a better form of identifying and treating AIDS. But to be successful, we have to treat it like other STDs. However, he added, we have to be able to ensure confidentiality. Patient confidentiality is a medically sacred article of faith that physicians never abandon lightly. Why, then, have these laws abandoned the concept? The CDC was affected by pressure from conservatives who controlled the budgets on Capitol Hill, explains attorney Mario Cooper, a Harvard AIDS Institute advisor and the founder of Leading for Life, an advocacy group for blacks with AIDS. But they have made a huge mistake in aggressively pushing it without a fundamental understanding of its impact on people of color. Many in our community don't get tested for STD and AIDS. They see such programs as monolithic institutions that grew out of Tuskegee experiments. Notification laws were also problematic because they relied upon overburdened public health departments. This curiously pathologizing stance toward infectious disease indicts African-American behavior as criminal rather than addressing health behaviors supportively in the more usual public health mode, which utilizes intervention. Today, epidemiological discussions focus on the high rate of AIDS in African-Americans and in Africans, which is necessary and appropriate. But these discussions also pair the high rates with drug use and profligate sexual activity in the face of a resounding silence on other important issues, such as lack of access to medication and medical care, an inequitable economic and human rights climate, and even dangerous medical practices, which are discussed later in this chapter. The dearth of consistent, high-quality care for HIV infection in inner-city areas is simplistically ascribed to black fear and distrust of medical treatment and research. Such problems as limited access to life-saving antiviral drugs get short shrift. Overburdened or bankrupted AIDS drug assistance programs that are charged with distributing effective AIDS medications sometimes find themselves unable to do so, even though the cost of these drugs has fallen dramatically over the past eight years. There is little discussion of how best to lower the high rate of HIV infection in children. Silence governs those risk factors that cannot be laid to a blame-the-victim paradigm that emphasizes patients' high-risk behaviors. This blame-the-victim approach to AIDS control has backfired by instilling denial or a false sense of security in many African Americans. HIV infection has been saddled with so much cultural baggage that many people believe it strikes only the sexually promiscuous, drug-addicted, desperately poor, or immoral people. Many black people cannot believe diseases such as AIDS or hepatitis C can affect someone like me. News accounts feed this misconception by focusing on black people with HIV who live in squalor, have lost custody of their children, and who turn to crimes such as prostitution to feed a drug habit. So do many narrative-driven medical journal accounts. These tragedies are real, but they are far from the whole story. Because a single act can transmit infection, sexually transmitted diseases, STDs, can affect anyone who is sexually active, not just the promiscuous. Church-going grandmothers can be infected as surely as club-hopping Romeos, but they may not realize this and so may not take steps to protect themselves. AIDS in the Laboratory Poorly performed medical research has fed the high rates of infection among African Americans, and it also has fed the low rates of appropriate treatment that have plagued blacks from the first days of the epidemic. The U.S. medical establishment has failed to provide African Americans with equitable attention, testing, medications, and recruitment for medical trials. But these failures have been ascribed to African Americans themselves in the medical literature and provide another manifestation of the blame-the-victim mentality. Misguided research has caused HIV therapy to be withheld from blacks, 
even as it has heavily ladled guilt for the spread of AIDS upon their shoulders. For example, in the early 1990s, a Johns Hopkins study revealed that HIV-positive whites, but not blacks, were doubling their survival time by taking AZT. Conventional wisdom has long laid this disparity at the feet of African Americans by insisting that blacks resisted taking AZT, later to be known as zidovudine, because of fear and distrust engendered by the U.S. PHS syphilis study at Tuskegee. With a singular myopia, scientific and social science researchers have ignored the appalling wealth of other pharmaceutical and infectious disease experimentation with blacks to seize instead upon a single PHS study with very imperfect parallels to the HIV crisis. Celebrated surveys did not ask open-ended questions to determine the roots of black aversion to AZT. Instead, they asked specifically whether the Tuskegee syphilis study was the factor. Popular coverage widely conveyed the assumption that the emotional overreaction of blacks to this single investigation abuse was at fault. But this monomaniac focus upon the Tuskegee syphilis study as the catalyst for AZT aversion ignores some pertinent research history. In February 1991, soon after azitothymidine was embraced as the first effective drug against HIV infection and AIDS, Department of Veterans Affairs researchers informed the FDA that AZT did not work well for black patients as it did for whites. The VA researchers also suggested that because AZT's side effects could imperil health and even life, AZT should be withheld from blacks as an inefficacious and possibly dangerous medication. Alarmed physicians were loath to prescribe AZT to blacks in the face of such ominous findings. The prohibition against using AZT to treat blacks quickly became entrenched in the therapeutic canon. However, the VA study had utilized a relatively low number of African-American patients and had not been designed to ferret out racial differences. This dramatic racial disparity generated research results that were a fluke rather than an authentically disparate racial response. Later, rigorous research unmasked salient errors in the study and revealed that AZT was indeed efficacious for blacks. But this proved too little too late. Physicians remained slow to prescribe AZT to their black patients, and these patients were slow to accept it. No government or medical entity undertook the large-scale public relations effort that would have been necessary to repair the damage done to AZT's image. The reputation of AZT was permanently tarnished in the minds of African Americans, and for a while in the opinions of the physicians who cared for them. As a result, HIV-positive blacks quickly progressed to AIDS, promptly developing the severe opportunistic infections, cancers, neurological damage, and decimated immune system that heralded the syndrome. Medical researchers and physicians, not fearful black patients traumatized by the Tuskegee syphilis study, are responsible for blacks' aversion to AZT. In 1997, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention issued some long-overdue good news about AIDS, a heartening 13% decline in the death rate, the first in the 15-year course of the epidemic. What's more, new combination drug therapies were slowing the progression from HIV to AIDS. These included protease inhibitors such as Invarase, Crixivan, and Norvir. For most HIV-positive people, protease inhibitors promised to parallel insulin use for diabetics, not a cure, but effective management. But once again, African Americans had not shared equitably in either the declining death rate or the distribution of the new drugs. The AIDS death rate for whites fell 21%, but the black death rate dropped only 2%, and the rate for young black women actually rose. At the 6th Annual HIV Conference, San Francisco's mayor, Willie Brown, warned conferees, 
We are now on the threshold of a new set of problems generated by success. Because the drugs are terribly expensive and a whole forgotten class of people are not getting them, including people of color. Dr. Wilbert Jordan, director of the AIDS clinic at Martin Luther King Charles Drew Medical Center in Los Angeles, predicted, Protease inhibitors are very expensive, about $14,000 a year, and the majority of people who won't get them are drug users, especially in the black and Latino populations. The new drugs were too expensive for people on Medicaid, which imposed a monthly cap on drug expenses. HMOs often restricted pharmacy benefits to an average of $3,000 a year, and the demand for the drugs quickly overwhelmed the pharmaceutical company's stores of free drugs for compassionate use. Despite the pharmaceutical company's healthy profits, states were finding themselves strapped by the costs of supplying medication to the poor. The $200 million in federal and state AIDS drug assistance programs, ADAP, that was set aside to provide the drugs to those not poor enough to qualify for Medicaid, was half of what was needed. ADAP funds varied from state to state. New York and California residents enjoyed expansive programs, but only 10% of the HIV positive in Florida qualified. Some states, such as Kansas, resorted to a waiting list. Valerie Papaya Mann, executive director of the AIDS Project of the East Bay, validated fears of inequitable distribution. In San Francisco, on every other corner, there's information about the latest therapies. But in the East Bay, we have people of color, low-wage earners, and less AIDS information. Many doctors serving the indigent are not prescribing the protease inhibitors. My clients, 85% of whom are African American, are still dying and will still die unless there is a loud outcry that says we all should have access to the drugs. Nor was money the only barrier. Early protease inhibitors were taken according to complicated schedules, and they fostered drug resistance when inexpertly prescribed or taken erratically. Physicians and policymakers frequently worried aloud that if the poor and homeless were given protease inhibitors and proved non-compliant, they would abet drug-resistant strains, which would prove impossible to treat. Instead of focusing on education and other routes of increasing compliance, doctors routinely withheld protease inhibitors from people in lower socioeconomic groups, such as the homeless and drug abusers, among whom African Americans were disproportionately represented. Mario Cooper complained, Doctors are selecting people out because of racial issues. Some won't even offer drug abusers the option of taking these drugs. One African-American physician responded, My patients with drug problems are all compliant. It's ridiculous to withhold medication from drug users on the assumption that they won't adhere to the treatment schedule. Who understands the importance of taking drugs on time better than an addict? The prices of life-sustaining HIV medications have fallen dramatically since the fall of 2000 because of international competition between generic and proprietary drug manufacturers. Now the price of AIDS therapy costs as little as $140 annually and is within the reach of all African Americans. The Abandoned Vaccine But new barriers to effective treatment threaten to replace the old ones, and many suspect that at least one is being driven by research biases against black patients. Many African Americans and their medical advocates responded with outraged disbelief in 2003 when AIDSVAX, the first vaccine to enter Phase 3 trials, see Chapter 10 for a description of Phase 1, 2, and 3 clinical trials, was dismissed as worthless and abandoned even though some data indicated that it actually protected blacks and Asians from HIV infection quite efficiently. The New York Times joined other major newspapers in lamenting the trial's failure. Its headline read, Large Trial Finds AIDS Vaccine Fails to Stop Infection. 
and the trial's dramatic success in African Americans and Asians was buried within the story, surrounded by qualifications and vague expressions of skepticism. No stories asked why the trials of AIDS vax, developed by VaxGen of Brisbane, California, were being halted when its efficacy in minority groups ranged from 67 to 78 percent. Among minorities, principally blacks and Asians, only 3.7 percent of vaccinated participants became infected with HIV, in contrast to 9.9 percent of minorities who took a placebo. The vaccine cut the infection rate in blacks by 78 percent, 66.8 percent after statistical refinements. Among the 314 African American volunteers, nine of the 111 subjects who took the placebo, 8.1 percent, became infected, compared to four of the 203 African Americans who received the vaccine. VaxGen said the vaccine protected two thirds of African American, Asian, and mixed race volunteers. Just 500 minority subjects participated, but the results. Were still statistically significant, and carried at most a two percent possibility that the heartening results arose by chance. The statistics look impressive," said Dr. Anthony Fauci, director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, the nation's top infectious disease professional. But among whites, no statistically significant change emerged between vaccinated. And non-vaccinated groups of subjects. Researchers did not yet understand this disparity with regard to the vaccine, but such disparate effects are not unheard of. In clinical trials, a recently tested herpes (HSV2) vaccine worked much better for women than for men, although researchers are not sure why. But although the gender disparities in the herpes vaccine efficacy were accepted. The racial disparities emanating from the HIV vaccine trial were not. This led a team of researchers from the NIH, CDC, University of Washington to review the data. Dr. Dean Fullman of the National Institutes of Health (NIH) reanalyzed the data and determined that a significant result could be obtained by chance about 22 percent of the time when the data from the 15 subgroups. Including African Americans, were evaluated. The researchers concluded that the VaxGen data indicating protection for African Americans were spurious. This contradicted VaxGen's claims that it had tested the minority group data and found only a two percent possibility that the figures showing protection against HIV could have arisen by chance. Fullman explained this by alleging that VaxGen had never performed the necessary tests that would allow it to make this claim. The Fullman study seems to have laid African American hopes for a benefit from the VaxGen vaccine to rest. Experts largely agree. For example, the International AIDS Vaccine Initiative (IAVI) report for February to April 2004 included an article entitled. Vaxgen denouement: No efficacy in racial subgroups, no efficacy in Thai trial. These experts may well be right, and the vaccine's hoped-for effectiveness against HIV in Black and Asian segments of the population may be chimerical, a mere statistical mirage. But there is room for doubt, and it is important medically and socially to commission more exhaustive studies. Before deciding that the benefits are illusory, also compare the rapid dismissal of this purported special racial benefit with the uncritical acceptance of Bidel's supposed special racial efficacy, as detailed in Chapter 13. One can then understand why some wonder if factors other than scientific rigor are driving the decisions. Incorporating larger numbers of African American participants could help resolve any ambiguity. Despite the widespread assumptions that African Americans will not participate in clinical trials, especially HIV trials, some researchers are very successful in recruiting black subjects. Emory University professor Otis Brawley, M.D., 
consistently recruited a large percentage of black research subjects while he was director of the Office of Special Populations Research at the National Cancer Institute. Doctors LaSalle L'Enfant and Clarence Grimm, among others, regularly meet or exceed their ambitious goals for minority recruitment in clinical trials. A New York Times article by Linda Villarosa has documented successes in African-American recruitment by scientists such as Dr. Beryl Coblin, principal investigator of Project Archive, and Elmerlene Robertson, an outreach worker at the University of Illinois at Chicago. They recruited hundreds of HIV trial subjects, 84% of whom were black women. Such programs demonstrate that even more blacks can be recruited when others invest in the trust building that has worked for them and adopt large-scale recruitment efforts. Social justice demands continued evaluation of AIDS vax, even if it does help only minorities. After all, African Americans do not represent a minority in the AIDS crisis. They constitute the majority of the people with AIDS in this country. Also, research abounds for infectious disease therapies that work well for whites and not for blacks. For example, beta interferon research escalates steadily, despite the fact that the drug is much less likely to rid infection from African Americans with hepatitis C than from their white counterparts. Funds and resources are constantly spent on refinements of the drug, as they well should be, because doing so helps protect a good portion of the population. However, more research and resources should go into finding therapeutics that work for African Americans, who suffer disproportionately from HIV infection. Also, should the factor that heralds AIDS vac success in minorities prove real, not an artifact, it may not be biological or racial at all. It may well be a behavioral or environmental factor that can be adapted to other ethnic groups as well. Therefore, if this vaccine is ultimately shown to work for minority group members, a way might be found for it to protect whites. Even should the effectiveness prove to have a biological basis, it will probably, like most racial features, prove to be very imperfectly correlated with race. Whites will benefit from it, too. Finally, the world is watching our decision on AIDS vax. The World Health Organization mounted a 3 by 5 initiative to treat 3 million people with AIDS by 2005, and an effective vaccine would be an essential tool in the global struggle with AIDS. But we have an ugly history to overcome. The United States has consistently tested candidate medications tailored exclusively to the needs of the developed world by using the bodies of poor third-world denizens, who are desperate for any type of medical attention. We have a moral obligation and a redeeming moral opportunity to ensure that the vaccines we design and adopt are vaccines that work for the most endangered populations. Enabling the production of such vaccines for the medically underserved at home is a good place to start. Chapter 14. The Machine Age. African American Martyrs to Surgical Technology. It was cheaper to use niggers than cats because they were everywhere and cheap experimental animals. Harry Bailey, M.D., C. 1977, on his Neurosurgical Research at Tulane University. It has become appallingly obvious that our technology has exceeded our humanity. Albert Einstein James Quinn was only 52 when he died in 2002, but he had suffered as no man had ever suffered before. No one had ever been implanted with the same version of an experimental artificial heart, and no one had suffered his constellation of dread sequelae. He was apparently doomed by heart failure within six months. So on November 5th, his wife, Irene, said that Quinn had agreed to be implanted with an artificial heart that was intended to make him freely mobile and that was described to him as his last chance at a meaningful life. His surgeon, Dr. Louis E. Samuels, spoke triumphantly of Quinn having lived with his abiocor artificial heart longer than anyone had expected. 
nine months. But Irene remembered James's post-surgical experience as a life extended, but overrun by pain, disappointment, and despair. Quinn suffered a stroke the very next month that weakened his left side and left him with a tentative, halting gait. He soon grew unable to walk even short distances. A deeply religious man, he had hoped to go home to his wife, family, and church, but instead he remained tethered by exhaustion to a bed in a hospital suite, bound by a medical lifeline that sustained him, after a fashion, through a series of strokes and pneumonias. Quinn himself, when asked about his life with an artificial heart, was unambiguous. This is nothing, nothing like I thought it would be. If I had to do it over again, I wouldn't do it. No, ma'am. I would take my chances on life. Finally, Quinn lay brain dead, which, as the doctors explained to Irene Quinn, simply meant dead. Her husband's brain was already gone, dooming any attempt to resurrect his body, they said, and the Abiocor heart still beat only because it was a machine whose computerized power source fueled its futile rhythm. All that remained, the doctors told Mrs. Quinn, was to unplug the machine from the insensate body that would never again think, move, feel, see, or speak. So Mrs. Quinn gathered her minister, friends, and family to join the surgical staff in the 8th floor cardiac ICU. After Quinn's minister gave a brief eulogy, his cousin sang the Lord's Prayer, and Dr. Samuels had his nurse turn off the console that supplied power to Quinn's heart. Suddenly, Quinn sat bolt upright and thrust his arms out as if to the heavens, before crossing his hands and lying back down. You're killing him, screamed Irene Quinn. He wasn't ready. Mrs. Quinn maintains that she and her husband had been deceived by the Abiocor Corporation, by the doctors who implanted the heart, and even by the patient advocate who was charged with helping them to negotiate the experimental treatment procedure. The advocate was supposed to explain to the Quinns what life would be like with the experimental device implanted. But Mrs. Quinn now says that the patient advocate was actually an advocate for the hospital and the company, not for her husband. She sued Abiocor, and in June 2003 she and the company reached a $125,000 settlement. Hope and Artifice James Quinn was the second of six patients to be implanted with Abiocor hearts and the second to suffer strokes. Robert Tools, who was also black, received the first model in the Jewish hospital in Louisville, Kentucky, and died in July 2001, five months after the implantation. The medical coverage of Tool's implantation stressed his role as a pioneer because he was the first to receive an artificial heart that was fully self-contained and implantable. The Abiocor device, like the heart, is a softball-sized pump that, like the heart, resides fully within the chest without any protruding tubes or wires. But the Abiocor is a machine powered by batteries and an experimental one at that. Although the coverage of Tools' new heart was almost universally positive, many African-American news media took a divergent stance, asking whether Tools had been selected for an exceedingly risky and untried surgery because he was black, and by implication, expendable. However, no media outlets asked another important question. Should self-contained artificial hearts become FDA-approved and go on the market with a hefty price tag, will African Americans be able to afford them? Or will they be shut out of the technology that they helped to perfect? The same question can be asked of other bionic technologies being devised to replace diseased or damaged eyes, ears, and limbs. Geography, tradition, and culture intersect to make blacks likely research subjects for new technologies. But race and economics tend to place them outside the marketplace for these same technologies when they are perfected. This is a consistent pattern with novel surgical technologies. 
Marion Sims's vesico-vaginal fistula research subjects were black slaves, and today groups of poor black women are least likely to benefit from the surgery. Today's highly visible role of blacks in testing heart transplantation technology parallels a deluge of medical journal articles documenting how blacks are less likely than whites to receive high-tech cardiac interventions once they are perfected and become the standard of care. The media coverage has also failed to question the significance of two successive trials with black patients. When Quinn's heart was implanted, media outlets treated his story separately from the experience of Robert Tools, thus ignoring its significance as part of a pattern. At this point, African Americans, who make up 12.3 percent of the population, constituted 33 percent of the implantees. Almost three times their representation in the population. It is interesting that the incipient pattern was all but ignored in the United States, because other countries plagued by black-white racial tensions, such as South Africa under apartheid, have faced the same questions. Pioneering surgeons there are well aware of the suspicions raised by such use of black subjects. For example, the first potential donor for the world's first heart transplant. Chosen by South African surgical pioneer Christian Barnard, was a black man, but Barnard's colleagues warned him that if the experiment went awry, he would go down in history as an African Mengele. So he waited for the heart of a white subject. Abiocor's experimental protocol permits it to recruit its subjects from patients with end-stage heart failure, whose chance of dying within thirty days is at least seventy percent. The company is supposed to approach only those people who have no other treatment options. By June 2005, all 14 patients implanted with the heart had died, two immediately following surgery. The Abiocor heart failed in two cases. Twelve patients survived for two to 17 months, but even for those who lived past a few months, doubts reigned about the quality of their extended lives. Yet. Abiomed asked the FDA's permission to sell the heart as a humanitarian device exemption, under a program that allows the sale of devices to patients who have no other options. When the FDA advisory panel denied this request, its chief Julie Swain questioned whether the Abiocor was actually prolonging life, not prolonging death. Proponents see it as the subject's chance, however slim. For a longer life, and as a necessary step toward a device that may one day save millions from heart failure, which kills African Americans at the same rate as whites. Critics point to the dismal post-surgical record of crippling strokes and pneumonia, and the poor quality of life inflicted upon its subjects. Finally, there is the fact that some, like the Quins, were obviously expecting a very different post-surgical experience. Such expectations are an unaddressed feature of experimental remedies that, like the Abiocor artificial heart, are offered to desperate patients with only months to live. Patients may find any chance at life irresistible, and may not hear caveats about the limitations of the therapies, even if they are offered. But are such warnings offered in a fair and intelligible manner? Abiocor's consent form. Warn the Quins that death and disability are possible outcomes, but so do consent forms for gallbladder removal, nose jobs, and many other procedures that are considered relatively safe and routine. Other elements of Abiocor's consent form could be read as encouraging the hopes that the Quins entertained. The informed consent process consists of much more than obtaining a patient's signature on a piece of paper. Informed consent is an ongoing process of patient notification and education. The investigator must explain the process in exhaustive detail to the patient, must divulge any financial or other interests that she has in the experiment, and must answer all the subject's questions. The scientist must also make sure the subject knows all the known risks. And must inform the subject of new risks as such emerge or become known. 
The researchers must also tell the subject that he can quit the experiment at any time. But such a guarantee is meaningless in an all-or-nothing experimental venture such as the abiocore tests. Quitting the experiment means dying. Several studies have revealed that certain flaws tend to characterize consent forms. The forms use technical language and scientific jargon, which makes patients further dependent upon an interpretation by the investigators conducting the study. The forms tend to exaggerate benefits and to underplay risks, presenting an overly optimistic view regarding quality of life during and after the experiment. Such understatement is typical of how the medical jargon helps to distort the portrayal of the likely quality of life. For example, the use of such words as discomfort and fatigue may mask the potential for severe pain and crippling exhaustion. Such errors can mislead patients like James Quinn into unmet expectations from their experimental devices. But most of all, when the desperately ill are confronted with extreme measures and heroic experimental ventures, they risk confusing research with therapy, and so do their doctors. Patients rarely understand that physicians conducting the research are primarily interested in the research not an individual patient's survival and quality of life. Witness the disparity between James and Irene Quinn's despairing assessment of Quinn's tenure on the Abiocor heart. This is nothing, nothing like I thought it would be. And his physician's buoyant claim that Quinn had survived for nine months. Abiocor also took a step that escalates the ethical debate. It asked the FDA to approve the experimental implantation of artificial hearts without the informed consent of the patient. The company wished to expand its pool of subjects by widening the experimental criteria to include patients who suffer massive heart attacks, even if they are unconscious or otherwise unable to consent. The Abiocor company said it will encourage patients to select a health proxy, who is usually, but not always, a relative to offer consent on the part of the patient. This, however, is not consent by the patient, and moreover, it is an unprecedented and wholly inappropriate role for a health proxy, who assumes responsibilities that devolve around therapeutic treatment decisions, not those that relate to radical experimental devices. African Americans are at least 20% less likely than whites to select a health proxy or to elect any type of advanced directive. Therefore, even in the scenario promulgated by Abiocor, an African American is more likely than a white to be implanted with an experimental artificial heart unwittingly and without input from any trusted person who speaks for him. Such a step would be an unconscionable erosion of informed consent, and it would disproportionately affect African Americans, who are least likely to have a health proxy and are most likely to be treated in an emergency room. It would also be dangerous, because although the company had hoped to begin marketing the heart in 2005, technical problems haunt the Abiocor heart. The hazards of the Abiocor heart were illustrated by the September 2004 death of Don Graham, the 13th person implanted. After only five months of implantation, Graham, a white subject, died as a result of an unspecified malfunction of the device, according to the Abiocor official Andrea Tenbroke. The 14th patient implanted died in 2004. The implantees lived for six months on average, and only one ever left the hospital. An FDA committee ruled against the heart's approval in 2004. Involuntary Infusion Abiocor's request to conscript unconscious patients in extremists as experimental subjects is not unprecedented. At least 20 U.S. emergency rooms have been using another new experimental technology, artificial blood, for years without patient consent. Detroit hospitals have been quietly experimenting with a commercial blood substitute called polyheme, which is derived from human blood. To test this substance, 
emergency medical technicians and participating hospitals infuse it at random into severely injured, mostly unconscious ER patients who cannot give consent. Patients who require a blood infusion alternatively receive polyheme and blood during their first 12 hours in the ER. A similar blood substitute called Hemopure, consisting of purified hemoglobin derived from cow's blood, was first tested on moribund emergency room patients, but in South Africa. Hemopure's manufacturers say it is screened for the mad cow prion that causes bovine spongiform encephalopathy, BSE, and Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, CJD, in humans. But there are concerns about other emerging diseases. Nevertheless, it was approved for South Africa use in 2001 and is used principally in hospital emergency departments that serve black township patients. A safe blood substitute is devoutly to be wished because it would enable transfusions without the need to match types and it would allow patients to avoid the risk of illnesses such as HIV, HCV, and other blood-borne pathogens. People with sickle cell anemia who need transfusions will face no hemoglobin incompatibilities, and surgery will become safer for Jehovah's Witnesses, whose religion prohibits the ingestion or infusion of blood. A safe blood substitute will replenish the stores of blood banks, which run low with regularity in large cities, and will serve ambulances that cannot stock blood because of its 42-hour shelf life. Hemopure lasts for two years at room temperature. But administering substances such as polyheme at random to accident victims and to emergency room patients without their permission is a troubling step. First, if polyheme, like the earlier substitute, proves injurious or fatal to some, this result will be unnecessary because human blood would have treated them without experimental risk. Any injury will have been compounded by the failure to have sought the patient's permission. Also, the random administration serves the experiment's needs for randomization, but does not constitute good medical care, which should be predicated upon the individual patient's needs. Such emergency room research is likely to be conducted with blacks, not whites. In the 1980s, Department of Health and Human Services data confirmed that black Americans are more likely than other Americans to use emergency departments for their medical care. And both a 2001 study in the Yale Journal of Health Policy, Law, and Ethics and a September 2002 study in Academic Emergency Medicine confirm that this trend continues. Early test results revealed that subjects who received polyheme instead of blood suffered more adverse effects, such as shock, respiratory failure, and pneumonia, and a 49% higher death rate. Despite this deeply troubling finding, in May 2007, the federal government launched much more of the same, a $50 million, five-year, 11-site project to be managed by the Resuscitation Outcomes Consortium. It will subject approximately 21,000 patients to medical experiments without first asking their permission. The FDA has approved at least 15 such non-consensual research projects since 1996, when it began to allow researchers to dispense with asking patient consent for experimental treatment in life-or-death scenarios. This disproportionate use of black bodies to perfect cutting-edge medical technology is hardly novel. Even medieval medical lore entertained the belief that black bodies were suitable for use in experimental treatments. For example, a medieval engraving by 15th century artist Girolamo de Cremona, entitled Saints Cosmos and Damien Transplanting a Leg, shows the transplantation of a black leg onto a white body. The story focuses upon the miracle of a saint made whole by the amputation of an infected leg, and its replacement by another. But some who view it will focus instead upon the black grafted leg, wondering about its provenance. Did it come from a truly dead body? In the background of the painting, which still hangs in the museum of the Church of San Marco in Florence, the artist is painting a black man with one leg entombed in a casket. 
500 years later, in 1935, University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine gastroenterologist William Osler Abbott was developing a way to rapidly intubate the human intestine by inserting a tube from mouth to rectum that would enable doctors to treat intestinal disorders more efficiently. Testing the device entailed getting men to swallow 12 feet of rubber tubing, then submit to radiation scans to track the intubation. Jobless white men turned their noses up at the disgusting work and paltry pay. But through his black janitor, Harry, Abbott found poor black men who would submit for 50 cents an hour, possibly because he failed to explain how dangerous the repeated radiation exposures were. Abbott consistently referred to his subject pool as my animals, as when he cackled during a postprandial speech to Philadelphia's Shiraka Club, a group of physicians with an interest in literature. I'm sure my animals had a larger intake of corn liquor, pork chops, and chewing tobacco than the white rats in the medical school, but at least they were human. Abbott went on to describe how, once, a fluoroscopy revealed a bullet lodged in a subject's muscle, leading the doctor to muse, Such events led me to wish at times that I could keep my animals in metabolism cages. Those boys may have been short on morals, but they were long on gut. At least Abbott's despised subjects were consenting, if not informed. Researchers have also tested cutting-edge technologies without the permission and sometimes without the knowledge of the subject. For example, in his memoir, As I Remember Him, The Story of R.S., Harvard microbiologist Hans Zinsner recalls that when he needed specimens of live lice for his research on typhus, he approached a Boston policeman who obligingly arrested the old coon that sells pencils down near the South Station, forcibly taking the vendor to the station house. There, Zinsa retrieved his lice at leisure. Despite the man's protests that, I'm an American citizen and I got my rights. I don't know what you saw talking about the cause of science. The police threatened him with jail if he did not permit Zinsa to harvest his lice for medical research. The use of engineered human cells for medical treatment is another example of medical technology devised through research on blacks, but from which they benefit less often than whites. In 1951, the science of cell line culture was founded with usually long-lived cervical cells from black Baltimore housewife and cancer patient Henrietta Lacks. Her cells were conventionally named HeLa after the two initial letters of her first and last names. Without the knowledge or consent of Lax or her family, George Gay, M.D., of Johns Hopkins Hospital, harvested her cells and used them to transform medicine. Vaccines could now be tested and lengthy experiments completed that would have been unthinkable a few months earlier. One advance was immediate and dramatic. The Salk polio vaccine was tested and perfected with HeLa cells produced by Tuskegee Institute Laboratories in 1952, only a year after Henrietta Lacks died. Today, the science of cell line culture has enabled cultivation and therapy with stem cells, immature cells that can develop into many other types of needed cells, including red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. Today, Many Americans and most scientists hail research with stem cells as the key to taming disease. The only identified group to oppose stem cell research are African Americans, 44% of whom are opposed to their use. This attitude may be driven by the racial disparity in current stem cell treatments, such as bone marrow transplants, because African American patients are less likely than whites to match with a donor. In the 1950s and 1960s, some surgeons still were quite candid about using black bodies bought cheaply for testing for new technologies. In 1955, Dr. Harry Bailey was a promising and ambitious young Australian psychiatrist who was remembered by friends and foes alike as possessed of a prominent arrogant streak. As a World Health Organization traveling research fellow, Bailey had worked in several countries and in Chicago 
before he arrived in New Orleans for a fateful collaboration with Dr. Robert Heath at Tulane University. Dr. Heath offered Bailey a researcher's dream, bold, adventurous projects, a surfeit of docile black subjects, a cadre of researchers as ambitious, arrogant, and ruthless as himself, and a deluge of funding, courtesy of the Central Intelligence Agency, which equipped, oversaw, and bankrolled their research. The CIA charged the researchers with conducting extensive, ambitious mind control research because it was concerned that the Soviet Union and other U.S. enemies might have learned to control behavior via brainwashing. Among their many science fiction neurosurgical exploits was the array of electrodes that Bailey and Heath devised and then implanted into the brains of black subjects for as long as three years each. The team used the electrodes to deliver charges to the limbic system of the brain. This group of related brain structures includes the amygdala, the hippocampus, and the septum, which are key to emotions and judgment. By stimulating these areas, Bailey evoked pleasure, pain, joy, anger, sexual arousal, and other powerful emotions in his black subjects at will. The electrodes were designed to facilitate stimulation of the brain's pleasure centers, either by a remote operator or by the subject himself, using a transistorized self-stimulator unit worn on the patient's belt. Bailey did some of these experiments on black prisoners in New Orleans, Louisiana State Penitentiary, but made no mention of how he gained access to other hospitalized patients for such experiments, or whether any sort of consent had been sought. Neither he nor Heath ever mentioned what they told the patients but Bailey reminisced about his methods at Tulane when speaking to a group of nurses in Chelmsford, back in his native Australia, twenty years later. Well now, this goes back to America. When I was working in America in New Orleans, there was experimental work being done there on cats, where they found that if you put electrodes down on the anterior part of the brain, in the septal region between the two hemispheres, and down, right deep down, sort of here, put electrodes in here, that you struck a inaudible, which had something to do with screwing and orgasm and pleasure and satisfaction. And if they put a wire in this and took it out and put it onto a push button, the cat would very quickly know that if it pressed the button, it got a little chop, and this was sort of a little orgasm. And so the cat would go pop again and get the taste of it, and the cat would go pop, 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 pop. Here was something important. What did you make of it? So in New Orleans, where it was cheaper to use niggers than cats, because they were everywhere and cheap experimental animals, there wasn't much working there. The people we have been picking for the operation had really been at the bottom of the can. Nothing is going to help them. Shoot them is the only thing. So they started to use them. Negroes. Patients in hospitals. And so the same area, little box, was put on their paws with a button. They just went around, pop, 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 all the time continuous orgasms. Bailey also tested LSD and the drug bulbocapnine, which can cause catatonia and stupor, on African-American prisoners at the Louisiana State Penitentiary. According to one CIA memo, the agency wished to know whether bulbocapnine could produce aphasia, the loss of speech, anesthesia, memory loss, or a sabotaging of willpower in persons with a weak type of central nervous system. Decades later, some survivors sued the federal government and the CIA, which settled out of court and agreed to pay $750,000 to seven former mind control victims. After his return to Australia, Bailey opened a deep sleep therapy clinic for depression and a wide variety of other psychiatric complaints at Chelmsford Hospital in Sydney which he operated between 1963 and 1979. The deep sleep therapy technique is a misnomer for patient abuse that Bailey practiced by placing thousands of patients with a wide variety of psychiatric symptoms into a barbiturate in coast coma for two weeks, during which time he administered repeated electroshock therapy and implanted electrodes and even metal plates into many of their brains without their knowledge or consent. 
Many patients deteriorated dramatically, but they learned only years later from news accounts what their doctor had done to them. He sexually abused some of the women patients. Scores of patients died, although Bailey concealed the true number by arranging for many worsening patients to be shipped off to other hospitals, where they died without ever regaining consciousness. Australian courts attributed at least 65 of his patients' deaths to unlawful and negligent treatment. But rather than face a criminal trial, Bailey committed suicide in 1985 with Tuanol, a barbiturate that he had used to destroy the minds of his victims. In his 1967 work, Human Guinea Pigs, physician Morris H. Papworth chronicled the use of black subjects to perfect new medical technologies. For example, he described an event in the 1962 experimental perfection of the new technique of translumbar aortography. A 31-year-old negress had abdominal pains and urinary symptoms, and because the diagnosis was in doubt, it was decided to submit her to aortography. However, the needle, instead of entering the abdominal aorta, was accidentally pushed into the spinal canal, and the contrast medium was injected into the meninges, the protective covering of the brain and upper spinal cord. Forty-five minutes later, severe lumbar pain was followed by convulsion, and the patient died in two hours. Postmortem showed a tuberculous left kidney, which could have been successfully treated. This chapter has described how, in a sparsely examined subtext of surgical research, African-American bodies have served to refine technologies from vesico-vaginal fistula to artificial hearts. But unfortunately, once perfected, the distribution of that technology has not been colorblind. Blacks are likely to have less access to the technology. Safe, non-exploitative research into surgical technology is in everyone's best interest. But for African Americans to remain open to such research, medical policies and practices will have to do a better job of shielding black Americans from abuse. Chapter 15. Aberrant Wars American Bioterrorism Targets Blacks The development of molecular medicine based on our new understanding of genomics will allow a vast range of new weaponry to be developed. Among that range could be biological weapons specifically targeted at particular ethnic groups. Professor Malcolm Dando, Bradford University, Scotland, 1999 I must confirm that the structure of the Chemical and Biological Warfare Project was based on the U.S. system. That's where we learnt the most. Walter Basson, M.D., the Mengele of South Africa. During segregation, the long, last gasp of American apartheid, the legal standard of separate but equal meant more than racial separation. It meant inequality sanctioned by law and enforced by violence and terror. In southern states such as Florida and Georgia, segregation meant inferior education, nearly non-existent health care, and dilapidated housing that was infested by vermin, glazed with lead, and for blacks only. But as the multiracial civil rights movement gained momentum, proud symbols of the dawning new age rose. In Miami, Florida, the state built a spacious, modern, 466-unit addition to a sprawling 1946 housing complex in the summer of 1951. Unlike the older portions of the complex, it was open to blacks. This pristine symbol of hope was named Carver Village, after Dr. George Washington Carver, America's best-loved scientist. The glistening new buildings, in a fledgling town of the same name, remained black-only dwellings in the summer of 1951, 
But Carver Village was the largest, most impressive new minority housing development in the nation. This distinction was quickly eclipsed, however, by the complex's prominence as one of the bloodiest battlegrounds of the civil rights movement. Carver Village amounted to a desegregation of the larging housing complex, and this precipitated Klan organizing drives in Miami, white motorcades accompanied by rock throwing and the shooting of a black man. On September 22nd, two 100 pound boxes of dynamite blasted an untenanted building at the complex. In October, three bombs tore through Jewish schools and synagogues in the city. When threats, rallies, lynching, and drive-by shootings failed to keep Carver Village residents from demanding places at the local polls and lunch counters, the Ku Klux Klan escalated its murderous assaults. On November 30th and December 2nd, 1951, more dynamite blasts rocked Carver Village, leaving huge areas bombed out and uninhabitable. Another bomb was left on the steps of a Catholic church that was the spiritual home of anti-segregationists. And, the Miami Herald reported, floggings were reported in Orange County. December was a particularly bloody month. Dynamite blasts blew out windows and leveled walls of the Miami Hebrew Synagogue and Tiferet Israel Synagogue to punish Jewish sympathizers. And this incendiary violence was followed by the Christmas Day bombing assassination of Harry T. Moore, head of the Florida NAACP. Open racial warfare in the streets began to punctuate the exchange of acerbic racial rhetoric. But by 1960, unnoticed amid Carver Village's raucous racial strife, the dramatic bloodletting had been married to another silent species of violence, this time at the hands of the U.S. government. The U.S. Army and the CIA, like the Klan, had Carver Village in their sights. Despite U.S. insistence that it was only developing defensive biological weapons, the Central Intelligence Agency in 1952 entered into a partnership to produce chemical and biological weapons with first strike capability. The Army's Special Operations Division Laboratories at Fort Detrick, Maryland, served as the site of the Joint Army-CIA program dubbed M.K. Naomi. Fort Detrick's Army Chemical Corps Laboratory bred more than four million mosquitoes per day and released them in hordes around Florida, including near Carver Village. This was an experiment to determine whether these droning syringes on the wing disease vectors in medical parlance, could be used as first-strike biological weapons to spread yellow fever and other infectious diseases, ostensibly among foreign troops during wartime. This was not the government's first local exercise in such biological, friendly fire. A similar 1995 experiment had also targeted a black area. But because it bordered a white development, people of both races were sickened. Such exposures had already tripled Florida's whooping cough cases within a year, resulting in a dozen deaths after a whooping cough virus was released in Palmetto, on Florida's west coast. Carver Village was more precisely targeted and was subjected to the same strain, which drove up 1955 infection and death rates. And 8% of these 1,080 whooping cough cases affected children 9 years old and under. By 1960, Carver Village residents had been plagued by a rash of mysterious illnesses, including the symptoms of dengue and yellow fever, and deaths. An analysis of the records of MK Ultra, of which MK Naomi was a part, suggests that the agency released various biological agents, from mosquitoes to bacteria, in hundreds of such dispersals, and the large number of exposures makes it less surprising that mosquitoes were also unleashed upon another all-black site called Carver Village, this one in Georgia's Chatham County. Savannah is the county seat. Longtime Carver Village, Georgia resident Dorothy Pelote, former president of the Carver Heights Mission Improvement Organization, recalls that in 1955, 
young white man came to our house and talked with me and my husband. They said they were doing a study on mosquitoes and wanted to place a trap in our backyard to see how far they had spread in our area. But they didn't go into detail. They lied. They said one thing when they were really doing something else. I had figured that they were from the health department. Later, when people started getting sick and dying, I spoke with several people who recalled those boxes being placed in their backyards. After the study, they came back and got the boxes from our backyard. In 1979, Pilot also told the Atlanta Journal that between April and November 1956, the Army conducted a survey of residents to determine how many had been bitten by mosquitoes. But nothing was revealed to us until the 80s. I could not believe it, but those people used us as guinea pigs. After the story broke in the 1980s, victims came forward, but news accounts tended not to name them. In 1956, for example, one unnamed black woman had fainted after a swarming dark cloud of mosquitoes covered her thickly. She had to be taken to a hospital, where medical workers wondered at the bite marks covering her body. Twenty years later, she still could not walk unassisted. The phrase, human guinea pigs, is frequently a prelude to hyperbole. But Dorothy Pelote sounds far too businesslike to be a conspiracy theorist. Her speech is crisp, and her responses are unfailingly concise and on point, even impatient, as she recalls the events of half a century ago without hesitation or ambiguity. But then, she has relived those events often. In the 1960s, she organized the residents in an attempt to understand the mosquito experiments, twenty years before evidence of their true nature surfaced. The spikes in local disease and deaths convinced the Army CIA consortium that the infected mosquitoes would indeed make an effective biological weapon against the Soviets, who had no medical capability for organizing massive vaccination programs. But for years, the CIA denied that it had unleashed such biological agents against its own citizens, despite the dramatic leap in illnesses and death rates, and despite the testimony of Pelote and other Georgia Carver Village residents. The government agents could plead innocence because they knew that there was no evidence. In 1973, MK Ultra's director, Dr. Sidney Gottlieb, decided to sweep up the program's paper trail, citing his agency's burgeoning paper problem. One can argue that he really intended to erase all traces of MK Ultra's nefarious experimentation in the wake of the intense media and popular scrutiny of Cold War medical aggression by the government against its own people. During the late 1960s and the 1970s, as has been detailed in earlier chapters, the media revelations of the government's unethical prison experimentation, the Tuskegee syphilis study, and the XYY experiments with black boys in Baltimore, outraged the nation. Such research scandals were generating headlines and restrictive new laws. Reporters were alive to the news value of just this sort of Frankensteinian research that Gottlieb's team had been promulgating with tax dollars. From the electrodes implanted in the brains of black prisoners by Harris Bailey, M.D., to the mosquitoes that invaded Carter Village. Gottlieb was not eager to join his erstwhile colleagues in the Klieg Lights. Also, the new legal restrictions had ended the carnival-like laissez-faire research atmosphere marked by generous funding and few questions. These developments had driven most MK Ultra researchers to search for other, less controversial sources of federal money, and others, such as Bailey, were no longer active in America. It was in this atmosphere that Gottlieb oversaw the destruction of agency and individual case files. In 1975, CIA Director William E. Colby acknowledged that the agency discarded most MK Ultra documents, including those of its subset, MK Naomi, by 1973, rendering them very incomplete. With them vanished not only the proof but the institutional memories of yesterday's research abuses. 
It was as if they had never existed. But some residents of the Florida and of the Georgia exposure sites had not forgotten. They knew they had suddenly begun to sicken, and some had died of mysterious ailments after 1953. And some remembered being visited by government representatives, who made unusual requests around that time the sicknesses began. Something was amiss. Dorothy Pelote put the two occurrences together and became the point woman, seeking answers to what she was convinced was the poisoning of her community. However, she had no proof. That is, she had no proof for more than a quarter of a century, when American Citizens for Honesty in Government, a subcommittee of the Church of Scientology, launched a dogged, ambitious investigation report into MK Ultra's activities. American Citizens for Honesty in Government collected the heavily censored documents and collated them with known biological exposures, then released a report that included copies of the damning originals. They repeatedly used Freedom of Information Act requests to obtain the detritus of Gottlieb's purge, only to discover that all that escaped destruction were some folders full of the most mundane material imaginable. Train schedules, restaurant checks, and receipts from a wide variety of drug stores, laboratory and biological supply houses, hardware stores, and restaurants were all that remained of the top secret activities for researchers. But the few receipts for biological agents inspired the resourceful, detail-oriented reporters to decipher the more ordinary receipts in order to retrace the trail of domestic bioterrorism. They showed how circled train timetables and train ticket receipts corresponded to journeys made to Carver Village, Florida, the CIA headquarters, and the repositories of biological agents. Receipts for test animals, chemicals, and even the hiring of a crop duster dovetailed with the spread of biological agents. For example, signed, itemized receipts were issued for such items as cultures of Haemophilus pertussis, a whooping cough pathogen, in January 1955, the year that Florida whooping cough cases tripled. The documents also include physicians' bills for attention to injuries suffered by laboratory workers who handled bacteria, as well as receipts for formaldehyde and lime for burying dead lab animals, Lysol for decontaminating protective gear, nasal filters for handling microbes, and the aforementioned crop duster for field dissemination. Some receipts were stamped M.K. Naomi. Others bore the signature of scientists who were managing the project. Despite a 1969 presidential order prohibiting the production or storing of biological warfare agents, MK Ultra receipts for biological and laboratory supplies revealed that the dissemination of disease-carrying mosquitoes in Florida beginning in 1955 and 1956 triggered a long history of domestic bioterrorism by the U.S. government against its own citizens through at least 1972. Not until early 1980 did the Scientologists' research group finish piecing together its research and publish a report, which detailed, among other things, how in 1955 to 1956, the residents of Florida's Carver Village had been visited with a plague of Aedes aegypti mosquitoes. Swarms bred by the Army Chemical Corps at Fort Detrick, Maryland, carried, among other things, yellow fever and dengue fever. A surviving November 9, 1962, M.K. Ultra document described payments for drugs and other materials, including the development and testing of B.W., biological warfare, harassment systems, and for large-scale production of microorganisms. Despite the checkered reputation of the Church of Scientology, regarded by many as more cult than church, the extrapolations made by subcommittee members, linking the innocuous-looking MK Ultra receipts to the deadly campaign against black Floridians, were so meticulously drawn that the rigor of the reporting gained the respect of the nation's premier periodicals. 
In 1979, the story was taken up by the New York Times, the Christian Science Monitor, and the Washington Post, which, on March 11, 1980, described how disease-causing agents, one that could touch off undulant fever, brucellosis, and another that could bring on tularemia, were mass-produced. And there were many opportunities to utilize such germs, with unwitting American citizens serving as test subjects. These newspapers supplied some additional evidence of how these Americans had become targets of domestic bioterrorism research. As in many other terrorist incidents, M.K. Naomi targeted an ethnically distinct group, African Americans. The New York Times wrote that the Army Chemical Corps also deployed contaminated homing pigeons in the area during the 1950s and had mounted biological warfare tests on oat crops in the predominantly black Virgin Islands. According to the Times, at least one test caused oat crops to be infected with cereal rust, a destructive grain disease. Contrast reports on the egregious assaults on the health of black Floridians, Georgians, and Virgin Islanders in the 1950s and 1960s to a 1969 report that details how the government abandoned its plans to test zinc-cadmium sprays in northern Virginia to determine the extent of fallout in chemical and biological warfare, the same ostensible purpose as the Carver Village exposures. In the latter case, concern about the possible health effects upon another group of residents, bald eagles in their nesting area, stayed the hand of government scientists. Unfortunately, these southern exposures were no isolated incidents. For decades before and after, blacks have been subjected to U.S.-mediated bioterrorism perpetrated by American scientists at home and abroad. Lately, the word terrorism has been bandied about widely. It has come to encompass anything from a frank physical assault to an enforced political agenda that differs from the subject's. But terrorism is best defined more narrowly, as a threat or the use of violence, including kidnapping, extortion, assault, and murder, by an individual or organization that targets innocent civilians. In contrast to mere criminality, terrorism is employed to further ideological, political, or religious goals. Living Weapons Bioterrorism employs chemical or biological agents such as microbes and poisons in the service of terrorism. Biological weapons often consist of disease-carrying organisms, usually microorganisms such as bacteria, viruses, fungi, or derivatives from humans, animals, or plants. These may exist in nature or may be produced by labs. Either way, they sicken or kill via infection or poisoning. But nuclear weapons and other chemical agents are also agents of bioterrorism because they can poison biological entities, for example, via radiation poisoning, as well as kill them outright. Bioterrorism can kill people directly, or it can kill by destroying or polluting the water, animals, and plant life upon which people depend. During World War II, the United States and Great Britain undertook the training of South African military personnel in chemical and biological weapons, CBW, development and strategy, a relationship that was to deepen and continue with ominous implications for black South Africans. Even during the Korean conflict, the United States Armed Forces unequivocally documented its efforts with regard to psychological and biological warfare. Major General Robert L. Lee, Director of Plans, U.S. Air Force, noted on March 17, 1953, that the Psychological Warfare Division will direct and supervise covert operations in the scope of unconventional BW weapons, biological warfare, and CW, chemical warfare, operations and programs. The post-war American agricultural program produced a large amount of weaponized agents. The 1950s scientists favored distribution in bombs filled with a chemical and feather mix, which gave way to aerosol methods. 
These, however, were dwarfed by the effectiveness of the Soviets' hoof-and-mouth rinderpest and African swine fever mixtures, which targeted livestock. During this period, as we have seen, the Floridian communities of Palmetto and Carver Village were army targets of disease-carrying mosquitoes. Research and development on the use of wheat rust, rice blast and rye blast, foot and mouth, and rinderpest against plants and animals was supplemented by the experimental development of porcine brucellosis, anthrax, and psittacosis to be used against humans. But by 1969, the United States would declare that it had ceased development of new biological warfare agents. The defoliant Agent Orange constituted a biological friendly fire incident when its use backfired by triggering a variety of persistent health problems in American servicemen and servicewomen in Vietnam. The Geneva Convention banned CBW in 1963, but evidence suggests that some nations, such as South Africa, never ceased using these weapons. The refinement of weaponized biological and chemical agents by South Africa, the Soviet Union, Israel, and Iraq ushered in the current age. Throughout the 1970s, South Africa was accused of unleashing anthrax against Zimbabwe in the Rhodesian Civil War, and the Soviets were reported to have used glanders against Afghanistan in the 1980s. Race and Ricin Bioterrorism is often a murderous expression of ethnic hatred. In the United States and in South Africa under apartheid, this hatred has been racial in nature, whether white Rhodesians poison communities of its black majority or white American Christian supremacists modeled on the Klan targeted African Americans. Sometimes the ethnic element lurks below the ideological surface, but U.S. groups with frankly racial political agendas often mount baldly racial attacks. The chief aims of today's violent cults are not only political and social fanaticism, but also genocide. Unsurprisingly, right-wing extremists devise most domestic acts of bioterror against blacks. For example, in 1987, the Arkansas white Christian supremacist group known as the Covenant, the Sword, and the Arm of the Lord amassed 30 gallons of potassium cyanide to poison urban water supplies throughout the nation. They relied upon God, they said, to ensure that only blacks, Jews, and non-believers would expire. Their stated aim was to topple the federal government and hasten the second coming of the presumably white Gentile Messiah. Before the Covenant could complete this curious act of biological faith, the FBI infiltrated it and arrested its ringleaders. In 1989, yet another group of violent racial extremists deployed a gas bomb that injured eight people in the Atlanta office of the NAACP. These acts of domestic bioterror continued unabated through the end of the century. FBI infiltrators foiled the April 1991 attack on the nation's water supply that the right-wing Patriots Council of Minnesota planned to undertake with ample stores of the deadly toxin ricin it had manufactured from castor beans. In 1995, yet another American neo-Nazi group stockpiled bubonic plague, apparently purchased from a Maryland firm that provides biological agents for scientific research. But even leftist radicals have targeted blacks through CBW. In fact, the first legally proven fatality from domestic bioterrorism was the 1973 murder of West Oakland School Superintendent Dr. Marcus A. Foster, an African American, who was felled by a cyanide-tipped bullet from the arsenal of the Symbionese Liberation Army. According to the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, the FBI had mounted 74 investigations involving domestic chemical and biological warfare and nuclear attacks by 1997. The next year, cases ballooned to 181 investigations. Approximately 40 of these were deemed credible threats. 
but the press reports have tended not to characterize such coordinated domestic genocidal aggressions as bioterrorism, but merely as bizarre weapon attacks by the lunatic fringe. Small, violent groups of every stripe embrace CBW as the poor man's nuclear weapon. Easier, cheaper, and churning more pervasive anxiety than a gun or a bomb. Today, the most notorious pathogens that threaten humans are Yersinia pestis, which causes bubonic plague, Bacillus anthracis, which causes anthrax, and viruses such as variola, the cause of smallpox, and hemorrhagic fevers such as Lassa, Marburg, Ebola, and Hanton. Most of these have been considered for weaponization. The Color of Counterterrorism the terrorists felling of the World Trade Center towers and concomitant attack upon the Pentagon were followed a month later by anthrax attacks, in which five people died and thirteen were sickened. When anthrax was found in mail addressed to several congresspersons and contamination was suspected, Congress was immediately shut down and lawmakers fled the buildings, which were immediately closed and sealed, then decontaminated. But at the Brentwood Mail Processing and Distribution Center facility in Washington, D.C., where 92% of the 2,646 workers were black, letters contaminated with bacillus anthracis spores were processed by both machines and human handlers. Four U.S. Postal Service workers at Brentwood fell ill with what was tardily diagnosed as inhalation anthrax. Two died. Many African Americans perceived a clear racial disparity in how the black and white victims of the anthrax attacks were treated. Thousands of D.C. area postal workers may have been exposed to anthrax spores from contaminated letters, such as those mailed to Senators Thomas A. Daschle and Patrick Leahy. Although inhaled anthrax is 89% fatal, a three-day delay intervened before these workers were treated with a 60-day course of antibiotics. Afterward, postal workers were offered the same experimental anthrax vaccine that was being tested on U.S. soldiers without their consent, which is discussed in the epilogue. But instead of a clear recommendation from government physicians, Postal workers were told that making the complex decision to risk the experimental vaccine and its possible side effects was their own responsibility. Prominent epidemiologists gave conflicting advice. Some cited the dangers of side effects, and other experts stressed the need for additional protection, such as adjunct vaccine to discourage the development of anthrax in the exposed because the antibiotics offered protection only up to 60 days. But no one had warned the workers that the 60-day course of antibiotics they accepted would not be sufficient to protect them. And when workers were belatedly told of this and offered the experimental vaccine to supplement the antibiotics, this fed rather than damped their suspicions. This offer of a vaccine also seemed to contradict government assurances that the facilities were perfectly safe. When HHS Secretary Tommy Thompson finally officially recommended the vaccine, suspicion reigned among the black staffers that experimentation, not treatment, was the real goal of vaccine administration. The situation was not improved when Washington, D.C. Health Director Ivan C. A. Walks and Mayor Anthony Williams advised workers to shun the vaccine because of its side effects and unproven efficacy. There was a public perception that people on Capitol Hill got treated quickly and effectively and lost no one, while the perception at Brentwood was that people were ignored and lost two co-workers, said Walks. The coverage by Black Enterprise, a highly respected financial magazine, was entitled Cures for the Privileged? nor did the Washington Post shrink from reporting the racial nature of the distrust. Using words like guinea pigs and references to the Tuskegee experiments, postal workers, many of whom are African American, said that two times now the Bush administration has relegated them to second-class status. 
These are the same guys that told us, when the Dashiell letter went through, that it was perfectly okay to go into Brentwood, said as easily Jaffer, the Postal Service's Vice President for Communications. Meanwhile, four machines at New York City's Morgan Station Center tested positive for anthrax, prompting the union to demand its closure and decontamination before workers returned. They, too, cited the alacrity with which congressional representatives had been evacuated and Congress was adjourned to nullify the risk of contamination. But the USPS responded with a 10-day supply of Cipro, latex gloves, paper masks, and a refusal to test the employees or to close the facility. It's absurd. It's criminal. There are live spores in these machines, protested one union representative who refused to return to work. By November, 30% of the facility's employees had joined him in boycotting the postal facilities. In the end, only the machines, not the building, were decontaminated. The New York Area Metro Postal Union's president, Willie Smith, an astute and plain-spoken everyman, laid the case of resentful postal workers, many of them black. We're simply asking the post office to close the building and make sure it's safe, Smith told the New York Times. I realize that Morgan employees are not Supreme Court justices or senators or congressmen, but they are God's children. They have the same right to life as the aristocrats. No one piece of mail is worth a human life. It remains to be seen how much of the Defense Department's domestic preparedness program's $40 million allocation for 120 U.S. cities will be used to protect the largely African-American postal workers who believe themselves on the front line of domestic bioterrorism threats. White Weapons The racial nature of CBW attacks is hardly confined to U.S. borders, and neither is the key role of U.S. scientists. Iraq's chemical warfare against the Kurds is often given as the most recent use of ethnic bioterror on the global stage, but it is not. The most recent biological warfare was the South African apartheid government's decades-long CBW terror campaign waged against its black majority and against neighboring black states. The physicians who headed South Africa's Chemical and Biological Warfare Program, CBWP, were able to carry out their genocidal bioweapons campaign only with the help of American scientists. The current media obsession with bioterrorism focuses upon violence perpetrated by the politically marginalized upon developing nations. But this focus has obscured the vigor with which powerful governments can wield biological weapons against weak, racially distinct groups. For example, by the 1980s, the South African apartheid regime felt increasingly threatened by opposition abroad. As its scientists and universities were cut off from the global community by academic boycotts and economic divestitures, the black anti-apartheid movement was being joined by persons of other races, and the multi-ethnic African National Congress, ANC, was gaining power and influence. In response, apartheid politicians and scientists funded research and development into exotic biological and chemical weapons for use against the black majority, so that the power of weaponized biologicals might help the white minority to destroy its opponents without firing a shot. Some apartheid-era scientists were skeptical at first, but others were certain that biological weapons could cripple and even kill enough anti-apartheid activists to allow them to control the nation's black majority. Not one of the scores of CBW scientists was black or colored. South Africa's systematic murders via biological agents are important to this book because so many of the scientists involved in crafting South Africa's racist bioterror were Americans. In fact, the science of apartheid could not have existed without the avid participation and guidance of a handful of American scientific renegades. 
The existence of this genocidal medical program was dragged from the shadows only in 1999, when police arrested Dr. Walter Basson, the most powerful medical man in apartheid-era South Africa, on a Johannesburg street for the illicit sale of 1,000 ecstasy pills. Prosecutors allege that he had financed a bizarre assortment of racist bioterror activities by the sale of illicit drugs. But Basson was not merely a crazed drug dealer. As head of South Africa's CBWP, he was a highly respected scientist, a confidant of the Surgeon General, and he held administrative positions at several major hospitals, supervising staff who were shocked to read of his biological doomsday schemes in the pages of Pretoria newspapers. On October 4, 1999, Basson stood trial in Pretoria. Although he was accused of murdering, by the most conservative count, 229 people, all black, with poison, he was charged with only 67 deaths. His accusers included all of his surviving former Confederates. Each testified at his trial that Basson had engineered South Africa's rampant, far-ranging campaign of chemical and biological warfare against its own black citizens and against black denizens of neighboring African states. Basson also faced scores of other fraud, murder, and drug-related charges, which South African newspapers and trial transcripts recounted daily. These charges, which are far too numerous to list in their entirety, included accusations that Basson supervised cadres of government scientists who grew cholera cultures for use in black townships and against anti-apartheid demonstrators, directed the production of huge quantities of narcotics, including ecstasy, to be sprayed upon anti-apartheid demonstrators to pacify them, and supervised the development and use of poisoned foods for use in assassinations. Basson's James Bond armamentarium included umbrellas that fired poisonous darts and hypodermic needles housed within screwdrivers. However, Basson was no lone renegade, as head of South Africa's CBWP, he operated under the aegis of his personal friend, South African Surgeon General Niels Nobel. The CBWP's most dramatic political function was as an assassin of anti-apartheid heroes. One former security police officer testified to the Pretoria High Court that in 1989, Basan poisoned the Reverend Frank Chikani, of the South African Council of Churches, a charismatic anti-apartheid activist, by picking the lock of his suitcase and powdering the reverend's underpants with toxins. No black South African leader was safe from Basson. According to testimony by former CBWP scientists at Basson's trial, Nelson Mandela was still imprisoned when Basson's cadre of scientists plotted to poison him slowly with the heavy metal thallium to render him mentally incapable of managing the nation's anti-apartheid resistance. Shillingly, the well-connected Basson once cooked dinner for an unsuspecting Mandela at a mutual acquaintance's dinner party. But Basson was most adept at designing large-scale weapons of mass destruction, specifically tailored for blacks. Basson concocted a plan to saturate T-shirts with chemical agents, then to distribute the shirts gratis throughout impoverished black townships. Equally reprehensible was the CBWP research on an agent that would temporarily turn a white man's skin black in order to allow agents of the South African Defense Force to infiltrate black groups. Dr. Basson's chemical grasp exceeded the borders of South Africa, targeting blacks in other African countries. In just one incident, Basson's erstwhile lieutenants described how they forced 200 Namibian prisoners onto a plane, injected them with an experimental muscle relaxant that collapsed their lungs, then dumped their bodies from the plane into the sea. The death of activist Stephen Biko is attributed to similar poisoning administered after he was beaten by South African security police and deprived of medical care. 
The Washington Post even traced the 2001 U.S. anthrax attacks to the South Africa's CBWP. Evidence taken from a Frederick, Maryland pond by the FBI suggests that perpetrators handled the deadly bacterium underwater without infecting themselves or releasing the anthrax spores indiscriminately. This technique was devised by the CBWP. The South African bioterrorist campaign depended upon very close relationships with U.S. scientists. Despite the supposed isolation imposed upon South African scientists by the international embargoes of the 1980s and 1990s, Bassan and his minions could not have undertaken biological warfare without the support of the U.S. government. From 1981 until 1993. The United States supported Walter Bassan's weaponization programs by financing close collaborations with U.S. scientists, and by sponsoring Bassan's sojourns to the United States for conferences and education. For example, in 1983, Bassan attended a closed Department of Defense conference on biological and chemical warfare in San Antonio. During his trial. Bassan recounted his participation in a 1981 federal conference in San Antonio with army officers from the United States, West Germany, Japan, Britain, and Canada. He declared, "I must confirm that the structure of the CBWP project was based on the U.S. system. That's where we learnt the most." Bassan says he was also grateful for expert American consultants. Because the CBWP was dependent upon a colorful assortment of American scientists, especially Larry Ford, M.D. of California. Ford and Bassan shared strange research proclivities, acerbic racist sensibilities, and a fascination with scientific genocide. Extant medical and legal documents and the testimony of Bassan's former confederates under oath describe their shocking joint research projects. According to Ford's lawyer, he was a chemical weapons researcher for the U.S. government in the 1980s. In 1987, the United States sent him to South Africa to train microbiologists at the military-run Rudaplat Research Laboratory (RRL), a key component of South Africa's chemical weapons program, and a front for the apartheid South African Defense Force. Ford returned often to teach RRL scientists how to produce biological agents such as anthrax and botulinum toxin for use as weapons against anti-apartheid forces and against blacks in general. He also taught apartheid's defenders how to transform innocuous objects such as doilies and tea bags into biological weapons. His seminar series, A Master Class for Poisoners. Proved popular among South African scientists, who dubbed it Project Larry. Lieutenant General Lothar Nietling, head of the apartheid regime's police forensic laboratory, was in attendance. So was RRL microbiologist Dr. Mike Odendahl, who recalls, Ford spent an entire day showing us how to contaminate ordinary items and turn them into biological weapons. He says Ford gave them ideas about how to infiltrate innocuous objects such as perfume or household items, and place them in close proximity to a potential target. Ford's expertise in the toxicology of everyday life was put to use, as South African physicians busily set about eliminating the enemies of apartheid. Ford was warmly welcomed within the nation's top echelon of medical politicians. For example, the home of former Surgeon General Dr. Niels Nobel is graced by a prominently placed framed photograph of him and Ford posing with a lion that Ford had shot. Back in the United States, Ford's California friends and neighbors praised him as a good Samaritan and devout Mormon to South African journalists who descended in the late 1990s. To inquire into his prominent role in the recently revealed science of genocide. However, his neighbors had occasion to revise those warm sentiments on March 11, 2000. That weekend, 
four dozen area families had to be evacuated when police searching the grounds of Ford's Irvine home discovered 28 containers of firearms, deadly biological agents, and live ammunition. Ford himself was dead, having shot himself on March 2nd as police closed in to question him about the attempted murder of his business partner, Patrick Riley. Ford's suicide, the discovery of his biological weapons cache, and the unveiling of his ties to Basson, Nobel, and Project Coast, described below, all raised FBI suspicions that a multitude of American crimes utilizing bioweapons had been committed in South Africa by Ford and other U.S. scientists. Accordingly, the FBI has undertaken a weapons of mass destruction investigation. Ford's suicide spared him from his scheduled appearance to give testimony at the U.S. leg of Walter Basson's trial, where Basson faced 61 charges which encompassed murder, drug trafficking, and fraud. The CBWP's ultimate goal was the development of a pigmentation weapon that would kill or harm only black people. As apartheid waned and the legal web closed upon Basson, his former associates say that he feverishly turned his attention to the production of the unthinkable, a deadly virus that would infect only blacks. The CBWP dubbed this key endeavor Project Coast. But was this ever a real threat? How practicable were Bassan's hopes to tailor biological weapons against blacks? Very. There is strong evidence from credible sources that the unthinkable has been achieved. The active development of bioweapons against specific ethnic groups, including those specifically tailored to injure blacks, may already be an industry. As early as 1970, the respected Armed Forces Journal Military Review discussed the possibility of devising bioweapons to target racial groups. Dr. Carl A. Larson, head of the Department of Human Genetics at the University of Lund in Sweden, discussed the past targeting of racial minorities and the relative ease with which many of these weapons could be tailored to the genetic vulnerabilities of specific ethnic groups. In fact, a report entitled Biological Testing Involving Human Testing by the Department of Defense's Senate Select Committee on Health and Scientific Research indicates that the United States may have sought to develop such weapons 30 years before the Military Review article. The committee's report documents how a U.S. Navy contract supported the University of California's 1940s tests of airborne fungal spores to spread valley fever. The spores can cause deadly illness by seeding in the lungs and then infecting other body organs. Valley fever kills half of those it sickens, and the university's research found that African Americans and Asians were more susceptible to the deadly fungal infection than whites. Dr. Gerald Horn of Brooklyn College claimed that the Army and Navy investigated the fungus's possible deployment as an ethnic weapon as early as the 1940s, and decades later, at a 1977 congressional hearing. An unnamed Pentagon official recalled how the armed forces spread fungus in the Norfolk Naval Shipyard in Virginia and on a loading dock in Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania. In both work sites, most of the laborers were black, and the official specified that the Mechanicsburg docks were particularly chosen because Negroes are more susceptible to the fungus than whites. Throughout the Cold War, Western newspapers were peppered with sporadic accounts of ethnic and racial bioweapons being developed by South Africa with U.S. assistance. U.S. news media broadly maligned all such reports as misinformation, disseminated by the Soviet Union to embarrass the United States. However, in 1999, a decade after the dissolution of the USSR, the British Medical Association, BMA, warned against ignoring the diverse reports that such weapons were being widely developed. The BMA insisted weapons could theoretically be developed which affect particular versions of genes 
clustered in specific ethnic or family groups. Its January 1999 report, Biotechnology, Weapons, and Humanity, added that the pending completion of the gene identification arm of the Human Genome Project would carry the adverse effect of facilitating the production of such weapons. This warning took on new urgency in the wake of the September 11 attacks and after the completion of the HGP project in 2002. However, interested scientists and nations have not waited for these milestones. A 1998 London Sunday Times story alleged that Israel already has used South Africa's research to develop a genetically specific weapon against Arabs. Such weapons development is not nearly so far-fetched nor so difficult as it sounds. Already, London police have used American scientific expertise to tailor a non-lethal weapon, the mother of all stink bombs, to specific ethnic groups. In 1998, the Pentagon commissioned scientist Pam Dalton from the Manel Chemical Census Center in Philadelphia to test disgusting odors. One question she was trying to answer was whether there were different cultural reactions to bad smells. She tested the odors on five ethnic groups, and she said that the malodorous weapons made volunteers scream and curse after just a few seconds of exposure. If these were released, they would clear an area in seconds. But most ethnic weapons under discussion are less benign. Some could be effectively crafted merely by exploiting existing variations in genetics, lifestyle, habits, health profile, and even diet. Even a low-tech approach can be quite selective. For example, approximately 82% of African Americans live in urban areas, and predominantly black urban areas have an extremely low density of white residents. So, simply striking certain areas of Harlem, East St. Louis, East Palo Alto, or Chicago's South Side, would target blacks with near-surgical precision. One could also lace particular ethnic foods marketed to African Americans with biological toxins. Infusing malt liquors, fortified wines, and African American ethnic delicacies would target blacks as well. Such scenarios may be redolent of paranoia, but the ease with which they could be realized was brought home in 1968 when the Pittsburgh Courier, a black newspaper, reported on incidents that were inspiring a fear of racial genocide among black Americans. In 1967, it reported, a white Sacramento millionaire was convicted of plotting to poison two batches of cut-rate gelatin destined for the shelves of stores in black neighborhoods. When arrested, he divulged his plans to pump cyanide through the air conditioning systems and into the water supplies of exclusively black institutions. But most discussions of bioweapons center on the strategy of selecting toxicants that affect only a selected group or that affect them far more adversely. Such agents do exist. Although toxicologists do not agree about the extent of difference, poison centers when contacted about an instance of a child eating mothballs, will sometimes ask, is he African American? Because G6PD deficiency, an enzymatic variation that is more common among African Americans than whites, enhances the toxicity of naphthalene, the active component in mothballs. Weapons could easily exploit such vulnerabilities. Similarly, if medications marketed to African Americans, such as hydroxyurea for sickle cell anemia or Bidil for blacks and heart failure, were tainted, many blacks, but almost no whites, would constitute the victims. Weaponizing the 1A genotypes of the hepatitis C virus, HCV, coupled with geographic distribution, could target African Americans. And other physiological differences between whites and African Americans could provide a fulcrum for targeted weapons. For example, as Chapter 1 explained, more than 70% of African Americans and 95% of Sub-Saharan Africans lack the Duffy gene, 
which is almost universal in white Americans. Therefore, developing a poison that is harmless in the presence of this gene would also target most African Americans while sparing their white compatriots. Project Coast Under apartheid, a staggering variety of ethnic biowarfare initiatives eclipsed all the tentative musings about racial targeting. South Africa's Project Coast long ago moved from theory to selective racial murder via bioweapons, with the critical assistance of American scientists. In the early 1980s, fears of a black tidal wave drove white scientists to try to develop a variety of means that could ensure the survival of white South Africa. Plans were devised to build a large-scale anthrax production facility at RRL, observed the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. From 1981 to 1993, Walter Basson placed Project Coast under the direction of Dan Goosen, M.D. Goosen told the Washington Post that his division was under orders to perfect agents that would preferentially sabotage blacks' fertility and to devise a silver bullet biological weapon designed to kill only black Africans. Goosen supervised a multitude of biological assaults on black townships, including the release of pathogens and their vectors, such as mosquitoes, to see disease epidemics there, just as the Army and the CIA had released them over Carver Village. Those involved in Project Coast also laced flyers, chocolates, letters, and cigarettes with anthrax, and saturated T-shirts with poisons. Goosen, Basson, and their deputies investigated the use of mandrax, an amphetamine, and ecstasy, for crowd control, infused township water supplies with treatment-resistant strains of cholera, and deployed napalm and phosphorus against blacks in Namibia and Angola during the 1980s. Basson also ordered Goosen to suppress black reproduction surreptitiously and suggested the clandestine addition of contraceptives to townships' drinking water. Basson stressed that this was a direct edict of the South African Surgeon General. Project Coast also set up International Shop, according to a 1989 price list that included salmonella-infused sugar cubes, pesticide-laced beer and peppermints, and a now chillingly familiar threat, envelopes sprinkled with anthrax spores. Only the fall of apartheid cut Basson's efforts short. In its aftermath, the United States and Great Britain asked F. W. de Klerk's apartheid government not to hand over the fruits of Dr. Basson's labor, the biological warfare technology, to the new ANC government. Instead, de Klerk met with Nelson Mandela, who ended the program. After the U.S. anthrax attacks in October 2001, Goosen tried not only to sell Project Coast's research documents, but also to interest the U.S. Department of Defense in a partnership for developing South Africa's repertoire of anthrax vaccines and anti-sera specialized antidotes. According to the Washington Post, Goosen's other offerings to the FBI included modified plague, salmonella, and botulism agents, and anti-sera intended to strengthen resistance to any future bioterrorism attacks. The DOD set up a January 2002 meeting between Goosen and Bioport Corp., a Michigan company that has the sole license to produce military anthrax vaccines, but no agreement was reached. The Americans demurred when confronted with Goosen's voluminous demands, which included a $5 million cash disbursement amnesty, and immigrant status for a wide assortment of apartheid-era researchers, family members, and hangers-on. The United States did, however, quash the sale of the biological weapons to Middle Eastern nations. Thus, Goosen and the other apartheid scientists were forced to take a less lucrative route to amnesty. They confessed their crimes to the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission, TRC. And in this way, they escaped the sort of public high-stakes trial that threatened Bassan with the loss of his medical degree, wealth, and freedom. 
Pretoria bioengineer Dr. Jan Lorenz, who later headed the biotech firm Protechnik, was one of the scientists who confessed and applied for amnesty to the TRC after the fall of apartheid. By doing so, he and his confederates escaped the fines and imprisonment, to say nothing of the death sentences that had befallen their Nazi counterparts a half century earlier. Faced with ruin or confession, the Project Coast and CBWP scientists admitted their years of heinous research in the service of racial genocide. Bassan, their boss, was the lone holdout. He refused to confess or to apologize, evidently hoping that he could beat the charges, even with his former subordinates arrayed against him, giving reams of damning testimony. Despite the implicating confessions by his colleagues and a slew of eyewitnesses to genocide, Judge Willie Hartzenberg dropped the murder charges against Basson in 2002 and rejected the testimony of all 153 witnesses against him. Only Basson had testified in his own defense, and Basson's was the only testimony that the judge accepted. Hartzenberg dismissed all the evidence against him and found Bassan innocent of 46 charges, including murder, drug trafficking, fraud, and theft involving some 37 million rand, 3.7 million in U.S. currency. But he did not stop there. For good measure, Hartzenberg also granted Bassan amnesty. The trial, South Africa's longest, had lasted 30 months, and cost the state 20 million rand, $2 million in U.S. currency. In 2002, the prosecutor's request for a retrial was denied. Standing between Bassan's many accusers and a conviction was Hartzenberg, an apartheid-era judge who was widely viewed as a holdover, nursing, as he did, a strong nostalgia for white minority rule. He had remained on the bench despite an attempt to recuse him before the trial started. Once the trial began, court journalists alleged, Hartzenberg made no secret of who he most admires in his courtroom. Hartzenberg likened Bassan to the Virgin Mary in open court and threw out conspiracy and murder charges that legal analysts insist should have been prosecuted. However, One needs no legal expertise to wonder how Bassan could be innocent when so many of his key lieutenants testified in detail and with consistency about crimes they committed together. Bassan's innocent verdict had been predicted by news analysts, based upon the all-white courtroom players and the pro-Bassan bias of the judge. So Bassan was right to gamble that he would be convicted of no crime and serve no sentence. The judge... The barristers, the journalists, and the scientists, both South African and American, as well as the trial analysts, were all white, leaving one to wonder, who speaks for the black victims of Dr. Death? ANC official Smuts and Goyama resorted to understatement. The justice system has let us down on this case. A September 2005 appellate court decision raised hopes that this bleak failure of the South African legal system may yet be mitigated by some measure of justice. The appeals court found that Hartzenberg had erred in throwing out charges related to the deaths of hundreds of blacks outside of South Africa, those in Namibia, Mozambique, Swaziland, and the United Kingdom, between 1979 and 1989. Citing a real and substantial connection, the court granted South African prosecutors permission to reopen six charges of conspiracy and murder against Bassan in the deaths of ANC members, Southwest African People's Organization, SWAPO, members, and others marked as enemies of the apartheid state. However, in late November 2005, South Africa declined to prosecute, citing the prohibition against double jeopardy. South African prosecutors have abandoned hopes of trying Bassan again. But in 2006, as this book went to press, the legal systems of neighboring nations, such as Namibia, were considering attempts at extradition and trial. As for bioterrorism back in the United States, 
A similar campaign for the truth against government-sponsored bioterrorism was proving equally futile for its black victims. As mentioned earlier, MKUltra, the CIA mind control program that began in 1953, had been exposed by investigative reports as the culprit in the biological assaults on black Floridians, Georgians, and Virgin Islanders. Of course, this was not news to Georgia legislator Dorothy Pallot, whose descriptions of her frustrated attempts to attract governmental recognition of the atrocities at Carver Village opened this chapter. Pallot's grateful neighbors elected her county commissioner, then state representative in 1984, and she never stopped trying to get an acknowledgement of the government's actions in Carver Village and some compensation for her neighbors. In 2004, she explained to me that the exposure by the Church of Scientology and the national news media had failed to bring justice to Carver Village's victims. We had several meetings that were very regularly attended by representatives of various organizations and the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, and our congressman sent someone. We talked about it, but because we were lay people, we needed expert advice, and some people we needed to dialogue with did not show. Later, some people from the government approached me, saying they were going to have congressional hearings, but they never did. They never called me back when I called about it. Pelote is passionate about health issues, large and small, that pollute the lives of those residing in forgotten small communities like Carver Village. Although she may appear unprepossessing to the uninitiated, Pelote has accrued a great deal of political power because her constituents trust her, and she has not been reluctant to wield that power in what she considers their best interests. This has earned her some political enemies, and she has been ridiculed for some of her legislation. For example, she introduced a bill to prevent supermarket baggers from licking their fingers to open recalcitrant plastic bags while packing customers' groceries. Much was also made of murky claims Pelote made regarding the fate of Chandra Levy, the 22-year-old intern who disappeared in 2001. Reports of her affair with California Representative Gary Condit were disclosed at the time. Levy's body was found 13 months later, in a wooded area, as Pelote had predicted. But the Scientologists' report and subsequent mainstream news media accounts of biological agents at Carver Village validated Pelote, and later news reports revealed some projects of which Pelote had never dreamed. For example, MK Ultra scientists had utilized technology in the form of a machine they devised called a biogen. It mass-produced pathogens, including cranking out huge vats of cultures that could cause fatal illnesses. The CIA financial archives include invoices for the maintenance and repair of the machine over a period of 13 years. During that period, the Washington Post speculated, MK Ultra scientists may have produced hundreds of pounds of various biological agents and microorganisms. The biological agents used as friendly fire to test the vulnerabilities of blacks in Carver Village represented just the first wave of governmental domestic bioterrorism. The Biology of Doom, a book by Ed Regis, described how whites as well as blacks were targeted by government-produced pathogens in other cities. In San Francisco, light bulbs filled with purportedly benign bacteria were purposely disseminated in public areas, where they were dropped in the subway system so researchers could study how effectively the pathogens would spread. The Special Operations Division used custom-fitted suitcases in 1964 and 1965 to spray bacteria onto unwitting passengers in Washington, D.C.'s National Airport and in Greyhound bus terminals. The Special Operations Division scientists counted the tickets sold at the time of exposure, and thus were able to determine that the infected passengers spread the bacteria to more than 200 cities. These tests were undertaken to determine the results of using smallpox or other deadly biological agents in public places. But unlike what occurred with the Carver Village exposures, the agents substituted purportedly harmless bacteria 
called Bacillus subtilis, a bacillus in a rod-shaped bacterium that grows in the presence of air. However, B. subtilis is not harmless. We now know that it triggers respiratory infections, blood poisoning, and food poisoning. Other major cities were not spared. A 1979 report exposed Operation Big City, the CIA's 1956 secret biological warfare experiments that were conducted in the New York subway system in partnership with U.S. Army personnel. These exposures were more democratic than those detailed here and affected people of every race. But still other projects that targeted the Northeast demonstrated the CIA scientists' special interest in targeting African Americans. For example, another round of tests in various East Coast cities sought to validate claims that a species of fungus caused lung disease in blacks more often than in whites. It was sprayed throughout an area where more blacks than whites worked. An army report stated that the purpose of this exposure was to test this vulnerability because within this supply system there are employed large numbers of laborers, including many Negroes, whose incapacitation would seriously affect the operation of the supply system. Senator Paul Wellstone, Democrat, Minnesota, commented, No one should ever have been subjected to these tests, and he helped to mount a congressional investigation into the project's health effects on the subjects. None of these large-scale biological assaults on black Americans has been formally acknowledged by the government. Dorothy Pelote retired in 2001, after nearly three decades in public life, although she remains active in attempting to protect the health of her community. But as she leaves the government arena, and as the affected residents of the nation's Carver Village age and die, a real danger looms that the memory of government-mediated bioterrorism will die with them, unless it happens again. Epilogue Medical Research with Blacks Today The voluntary consent of the human subject is absolutely essential. The Nuremberg Code In this book, I have traced the long, unhappy history of medical research with black Americans. I have detailed how blacks have been convenient, powerless, maligned, and abused subjects of profitable medical research, and also how their treatment has changed over the years. Slaves were physically forced into painful medical bondage. Their bodies were forced onto the stage of medical experiments to lend credence to claims of black inferiority and difference. And black bodies were even conscripted for anatomical dissection after death. Blacks were made subjects of experimentation that served to denigrate their intelligence or to provide distorted justifications for their enslavement. The reproductive rights of blacks also have been subjugated, via fraudulent research up to the present day. Groups of vulnerable blacks, including children, soldiers, and prisoners, have been consistently targeted. Both the federal government and private corporations have devised large-scale research abuses that range from radiation experiments to biological weapons development. This medical ill-usage has not strictly paralleled scientific knowledge. Rather, it has mirrored the larger American cultural beliefs as well as politics and economic trends. Once, black Americans enjoyed the sparsest of legal and social protections, nearly universal abject poverty, and few health care options. But this social and legal landscape has changed dramatically, and so have research practices. Where we are today. Today, the worst abuses are mostly memories, although some forms of abusive research persist, and a few new issues have arisen. However, 
Today's offenses pale beside those our forebears survived. Today, much medical research is more than safe for African Americans. It is necessary. This may seem a strange message for a book that has described so many racial research abuses, but this volume's frankness is an essential prerequisite for asking African Americans to consider participating in medical research. No one can dismiss blacks' historically grounded fear of research and retain any credibility. We must acknowledge the past in order to regain trust and to seize the future. But medical abuse is more than historical fact. Although less rife, it remains a contemporary reality and an ever-present possibility. The challenge is to prepare the way for a new openness to medical research on the part of African Americans, while maximizing their protections from abuse. I do not see how this can be accomplished without candor, because the traditional strategy of ostrich-like denial. Merely heightens mistrust. To gain trust, we must first acknowledge the flagrant abuses of the past, and the subtler ones of the present. Yet much of the popular argument around medical experimentation and African Americans is dictated by culture and politics, not historical fact. The scientific camp includes most physicians, medical researchers, and others of racial groups. Who pride themselves upon their educational sophistication, they tend to deny all present research dangers, and most past ones, dismissing fears as emanating from those who are uneducated about the legal protections governing research, or so credulous as to believe unsubstantiated rumors about the medical targeting of blacks. Mainstream medical scientists, journals, and even some news media. Fail to evaluate these fears in the light of historical and scientific fact, and tend instead to dismiss all such doubts and fears as anti-science. The potentially damping effects on medical research, not the facts, become the focus of most discussions of troubled experiments. Like the medical school professor whose horror at my choice of topics I described in the introduction. Many claim that any acknowledgment of abuse will drive African Americans from sorely needed medical care. However, a steady course of lies and exploitation has already done this. A 2002 American Journal of Law and Medicine article estimated that as many as 20 million Americans have enrolled in formal biomedical studies, but fewer than one percent are African American. Yet the focus on African American fears is misplaced. A January 2006 Public Library of Science study entitled "Are Racial and Ethnic Minorities Less Willing to Participate in Health Research?" examined the consent rates of 20 research studies that reported consent rates by race or ethnicity for more than 70,000 individuals. It found only slightly lower consent rates for blacks compared to non-Hispanic whites. The investigations ranged from interviews to drug treatments to surgical trials. Yet blacks are significantly less likely to be included in clinical trials, which suggests that some factor other than consent is implicated. Studies such as those mentioned in Chapter 11 already show that black children are more likely to be used in non-therapeutic, harmful studies than in therapeutic investigations. Future research may document that this is true for Black adults as well. In short, many scholars, such as Tuskegee Bioethics Center director Dr. Vanessa Northington Gamble, aver that the true focus should not be on the aversion of Black subjects, but rather on the untrustworthiness of American medical research when it comes to studies involving Blacks. This book certainly documents this ethical deficiency. Although the focus of this book is clearly on experimental abuses of a vulnerable population, I do not want to leave the impression that I am advising people to avoid potentially beneficial medical experimentation. Quite the contrary, African Americans desperately need the medical advantages and revelations that only ethical, essentially therapeutic research initiatives can give them. 
the reticence of African Americans is the reasonable and understandable result of a horrendous history, but it lags behind progress. African American absence from research reflects the realities of yesterday, not today. More to the point, the subversion is a reaction black Americans can ill afford. For this book to have the most value, I ask listeners to hold two seemingly contradictory but actually complementary facts in mind. The first is that African Americans must welcome and embark upon medical research as a bridge to fording the gulf that yawns between the health profiles of sickly and franchised blacks and those of healthy, long-lived whites. The second fact is that African Americans must remain wary of research abuses. They are rarer, but the potential for exploitation and abuse still looms. Physicians, patients, and ethicists must also understand that acknowledging abuse and encouraging African Americans to participate in medical research are compatible goals. History and today's deplorable African American health profile tell us clearly that black Americans need both more research and more vigilance. The worst abuses no longer occur, and others are becoming far rarer, in part because the media exposure of racial research scandals has led to public condemnation. This, in turn, has helped to support the enactment of stiffer laws carrying real penalties rather than yesterday's toothless codes, such as that written at Nuremberg. This matrix of legislation is not perfect, but it reduces the unabashed use of African Americans as duped or unwitting research subjects. Socio-political changes have also helped in this regard. There are no more separate but equal hospitals to provide powerless research fodder. There are no more nakedly vulnerable black people without the protection of the law. There are no more hospitals devoid of those black physicians who can protest racial dichotomies in patient treatment. Black physicians, researchers, and journalists now join the white professionals of conscience who have brought such abuses to attention and to a stop. The news media may not always discern and detail the patterns underlying problems with new therapies, but they do regularly expose research abuses. The government has shown itself more likely to close down entire university research programs under the aegis of the FDA when embarrassed by federally sponsored abuse. Closure is a fate that has been suffered by even premier universities, from Duke to Johns Hopkins. Most universities have heeded the message. All this amounts to a limited but real success story. African Americans are no longer the primary targets of research, exploitation, and abuse. Research ethics and policies have evolved to the point where the worst abuses of blacks are but a bad memory. That's the good news. Africa. Continent of Subjects. The bad news is that the racial mythology, the medical exploitation of black bodies for profit, and even the instances of medical sadism that threatened African Americans in the past have been exported to Africa. The recent history of medical research in Africa parallels closely that of African Americans in the United States a century ago. Colonialism and its residual racial and class separations have isolated blacks in hospitals or hospital wards away from whites, just as segregated hospitals once provided exclusively black subjects for white doctors. Laws that offered few or no protections for abused blacks have emboldened unscrupulous physicians and researchers who put curiosity and profits above the rights and welfare of their black patients. Western physicians, scientists, and pharmaceutical companies need large pools of people for Phase I trials, and they have swarmed Africa as they once flocked to prisons. U.S. researchers, who can no longer conduct trials at home without intense scrutiny from the FDA and the news media, have moved their operations to sub-Saharan Africa to exploit the public health vacuum that once condemned black Americans. To get around consent forms and a skeptical public, 
Many researchers are turning their attention to African and other developing countries. Robert F. Murray Jr., M.D., chief of the Division of Medical Genetics at Howard University, has observed. I would say the greatest chance for injury is in the third world, where people don't even know research is going on and don't have a clue. The long history of how Western investigators have taken their more questionable research initiatives to Africa is well documented in works such as Dr. Wolfgang U. Eckert's Medicine und Colonial Imperialismus. In it, Eckert details how, in a ghastly dress rehearsal for Dachau, 19th century German scientists conducted genocidal experiments on Africans, especially the Herero of Namibia. The United States, like Europe, has long used its non white colonies and territories as its laboratories. For example, Richard Strong, M.D., used prisoners in the Philippines to conduct deadly malarial experiments. And Chapter 8 relates how Brazilian, Mexican, and Puerto Rican women have more recently been used for birth control trials that maimed and killed many. Warwick Anderson, M.D., documents how colonizing nations, including the United States, have used often mythical racial differences, including the purported infectious disease immunities of Africans, to further colonial aims and to justify the use of natives as workers in dangerous environments, just as U.S. slave owners once did. In much of Africa, Asia, and South America, a wide understanding has reigned that ethical rules governing medical experimentation were not for natives. Henry Louis Gates, chairman of African American Studies at Harvard University, recalls encountering such persistent racial myths during his undergraduate studies. I was pre-med at Yale and took a year off to work at a mission hospital in Tanzania, where the doctors were all Australians. I was only 21 years old, and I gave anesthesia to patients. I was shocked by the fact that when patients were writhing in pain, the doctors would say, they don't experience pain the same way we do. I was totally disgusted. I complained loudly and called them all racists, of course. But this illustrates how it is always easier to distance oneself from the pain of the other. The use of poor people of color abroad by American scientists today enables researchers to escape both the strictest scrutiny of institutional review boards and the gaze of the FDA, says Murray, who issued a prescient warning in 1994. People are going overseas trying to do research in Africa. They are saying, we don't have to go through all that IRB stuff to study AIDS, sickle cell, and other diseases. This sort of questionable research is now going on in Africa and third world countries because there are plentiful patients, and the scientists are not subject to the same restrictions they are now subjected to here. The third world has become the laboratory of the West and Africans have become the subjects of novel, dangerous therapeutics. In 2002, the hormones of Bushmen were mined for potential weight loss therapies. Human growth factor was tested on pygmies before being used on Western children. And Depo Provera, although a carcinogen, was tested on Zimbabwean women before it was introduced into the United States as a reproductive injection. American firms tested artificial blood on unsuspecting black South African hospital patients at the cost of at least 20 deaths. Harvard tested HIV therapies through research that would have violated ethical requirements for Americans. Some of the research on Africans by Western scientists has been more subtle but equally troubling from an ethical perspective. For example, Trypanosomiasis, or sleeping sickness, kills as many as half those it infects in the Central African regions of Uganda, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Sudan, Ethiopia, Malawi, and Tanzania. Malersoprol, the only effective treatment, is a very toxic compound of arsenic and antifreeze that kills one in five people who take it. By 1995, the pharmaceutical firm Aventus, had completed research demonstrating that its drug, aflornithine, 
was effective against sleeping sickness, although not against cancer, as the firm had hoped. But the company decided to abandon its use against trypanomyces due to high production costs and low profits. It began seeking other profitable uses for the drug, and U.S. researchers soon found one. Eflornithine effectively banished facial hirsutism in women. Aventus and later Bristol Myers Squibb began marketing the drug as Vanica, because many American women were able to part with fifty dollars a month to keep their faces free of hair, while few Africans were able to pay fifty dollars monthly to save their lives. It is completely understandable that the firm should focus its resources upon the profitable depilatory use of their medication, but it is disappointing that it chose not to make the drug available cheaply to Africans in order to vanquish sleeping sickness. Doctors Without Borders forged a coalition, which included Bristol Myers Squibb, Bayer, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, to provide drugs to Africans through 2006. But although sleeping sickness threatens 60 million people, only 7% of these have access to adequate medical treatment. Medications considered far too dangerous or too hopelessly tainted for testing in the West have been introduced into clinical trials with unsuspecting African patients. Within the past decade, even the infamously teratogenic drug thalidomide. Has been tried on Africans as a treatment for leprosy, forty years after it produced twelve thousand horribly deformed babies around the world. FDA researcher Francis O. Kelsey, M.D., refused to approve thalidomide as a treatment for morning sickness in the 1950s because she determined that clinical trials did not demonstrate its safety. Her caution saved most American infants the fate suffered by English and Europeans whose mothers took the drug. Only those U.S. babies whose mothers received thalidomide samples from their physicians were affected. But third world women subjects of thalidomide trials for leprosy and AIDS were not warned of the horrible birth defects the drug can cause. African experimental subjects, like the slaves of antebellum America, are legally vulnerable, relatively powerless, and racially distinct. Like Black Americans after the Civil War. Africans' poor health and vanished healthcare infrastructure make it easier to pass off non-therapeutic research as medical therapy, or to impose participation in research as a condition for therapy. The U.S. physician researchers who descend upon Africa in search of subjects frequently characterize their work as therapy, offering experimental solutions for medical disasters. When physicians offer Africans the same therapeutics they offer Westerners, they can lay claim to unalloyed beneficence. But the Western standard of care is not being offered. Usually, poor Black Africans with no access to medical attention are offered treatments that are new or untried. Sometimes, U.S. researchers appear in the midst of an epidemic against which the stricken Africans have no medication, and offer experimental treatment. During the height of a 1996 meningococcal meningitis epidemic, for example, scientists offered Pfizer's experimental drug Trovin, floxacin, to terrified parents in Kano, Nigeria. Nigerians desperate for medical attention grasped at Trovin's straw. By the time the experiment ended, 200 children were left severely disabled, and 11 were dead. In 2001, at least. 211 Nigerian parents sued New York-based Pfizer Inc., alleging that non-FDA-approved experiments had killed or injured their children, that Pfizer failed to obtain the requisite approval from local leaders, and that the pharmaceutical giant failed to administer standard therapies with proven efficacy, such as Pfizer's own ceftriaxone, to those children who continue to deteriorate after being given Trovan. Peter Ibigbo of Child Rights Africa told Interpress Service, "Our leaders must not allow Nigerians to be used as guinea pigs by any company to make money." Pfizer counters that it treated 90 children with Trovan, and 97 with Ceftriaxone, 
and that it obtained all the necessary approvals. However, Dr. Sadiq Wali, Chief Medical Director of the Amino Kanu Teaching Hospital, says the hospital's Medical Ethics Committee never gave Pfizer the required approval to use the drug at the Infectious Disease Hospital in Kano. Pfizer did not do that. I am not sure if they had the consent of the people used as guinea pigs, because that means informed consent in medical parlance. Such consent has to do with the patients being told the good as well as the side effects of the drugs to be administered, said Dr. Wali. But documenting Trovan's effects on these patients for the lawsuit would prove tricky. The medical records of 350 meningitis patients treated between April and June 1996 have disappeared from the hospital. The dearth of health care in much of Africa and the Third World makes its peoples vulnerable to experimental abuse. One cannot generalize about a continent as large and diverse as Africa. There are wealthy countries as well as poor ones, and a few health-savvy nations, such as Cameroon, could teach us a thing or two about providing health care to all our citizens. But much of sub-Saharan Africa has been devastated by colonial rape and depletion. These have left poor health, a ravaged health care infrastructure, and few physicians in their wake. A mere 750,000 health workers care for the continent's 682 million people. The Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development estimates that this represents a health care force that is as much as 15 times lower than in OECD countries. Only 1.3% of the world's health workers practice in sub-Saharan Africa, but the region harbors fully 25% of the world's disease. A bare minimum of 2.5 health workers is needed for every 1,000 people, but only six African countries meet this standard. Instead, the average in sub-Saharan Africa is 0.8 health workers per 1,000 people, less than one-third the minimal standard. To achieve the minimum health care staffing level will require an infusion of one million health workers into the continent. Safe devices are as scarce as doctors. Reused SUDs, single-use devices, and unsterilized needles help to spread AIDS and other infectious illnesses throughout Africa. The medically damaging injection practices and use of ethically suspect research has fomented a loss of trust in vaccines in Nigeria. Much of the news coverage focuses upon the contentions by suspicious Africans that the administration of Western vaccines spreads HIV and causes sterility. But no matter whether these fears are correct or imaginary, the practical result is unambiguous. Suspicious patients avoid care, and this iatrophobia means that conquer diseases, such as polio, are seeing a resurgence on the continent. A burgeoning research culture is thriving in the midst of this desultory public health activity and therapeutic vacuum. While the continent's wounds go unbound, research is big business in Africa. Seventy billion dollars is spent each year on medical research, but only 10% is devoted to diseases that cause 90% of the global health burden. This dichotomy provides an incubator for research abuses. Surrounded by pain, death, and infection, desperate, medically ignored Africans are confronted with a Hobson's choice, experimental medicine or no medicine at all. Western researchers who conduct investigations in the Third World are supposed to elicit the approval of their home medical institutions. For example, most university policies align with FDA regulations that require treatments given to the control group members must be the standard of care for the treatment of the illness. Thus, if one wanted to test Trovan in Connecticut, the protocol or research plan would stipulate that researchers must give the control group the best drugs known to treat meningitis, a drug such as ceftriaxone. Under some conditions, Generally, when no effective treatment for a condition exists, control group members receive a placebo, an inert substance or a sham technique 
that does not offer any intrinsic therapeutic value, but allows scientists to compare results between a treated and an untreated group. But placebo studies, which are falling out of favor in the West, are completely inappropriate for serious diseases for which effective treatment exists. You cannot ethically justify withholding, for example, an efficacious drug such as AZT from HIV-positive people or people at high risk of contracting HIV just to determine whether protease inhibitors work better than nothing. You must give the tested group protease inhibitors and the control group either AZT or the best-known standard therapy. Tossing the people in the control group placebos, vitamins, or antibiotics would doom the control group, and so would be an unacceptable ethical breach, at least in the West. However, American IRBs treat Africans as second-class subjects and employ different standards for evaluating study designs in Africa than those used in the United States. Requiring evidence that the drug being administered meets or exceeds the standard of medical care is de rigueur for Western trials. But university IRBs now employ an ethical sleight of hand to stipulate that the tested drug must meet or exceed the standard of care in the country where the study is being evaluated. In impoverished, medically underserved sub-Saharan African countries, that standard of care has historically tended to be nothing. Americans who conduct research in African venues are supposed to seek the consent of their subjects. But this has never been a popular move, as the exasperated 1964 complaint of Dr. Francis D. Moore, a Harvard surgeon whose photograph had graced the cover of Time a year earlier, illustrates. Several years ago, an individual from this country went to Nigeria to try out a new measles vaccine on a lot of small children. Now, how exactly are you going to explain to a black African jungle mother the fact that measles vaccine occasionally produces encephalitis, but that more important than that, it might sensitize the child for the rest of his life to some other protein in the vaccine? We know now that any sort of immune response excites cross-reactions. For example, if a person develops a heightened immune reaction to some specific antigen, such as typhoid, he will be found to have other high titers against nonspecific antigens at the same time. In fact, there is a suspicion that some of the so-called autoimmune diseases are aroused by exposure of the reticuloendothelial system to completely different antigens. The possibility therefore arises that measles vaccines applied to thousands and thousands of children might excite in some of them such diseases as thyroiditis and ulcerative colitis. Can you imagine trying to explain that to a jungle mother? One of the greatest assets of a good doctor is the ability to look a patient in the eye and have the patient go along with him on a hazardous course of treatment. The same quality is exhibited by a medical experimenter when he looks at a patient and says that he thinks everything is all right. Moore avoided the troublesome task of individual disclosure and consent, and so do many researchers in Africa today, who do not want to take the time to translate their proposal into the local language and culture. They do not want to explain to hundreds or thousands of subjects such risks as iatrogenic encephalitis and sensitization, concepts that would have been as murky to a Connecticut homemaker in 1964 as they were to Moore's jungle mother. These scientists do not want to risk having the subjects reject their experiment once they understand the possible health costs. Neither do they especially want to explain why they are testing a new therapeutic approach to HIV thousands of miles away from the millions of cases in their own country. Moore doesn't mention this sort of question in his tirade against informed consent, but I suspect that it is the more difficult of the questions his jungle mother might put to him today. The Erosion of Consent Unlike the disastrous Third World research trends, medical research with black Americans has lost so much of its historically abusive nature that black Americans should embrace new medical research. 
after judicious inquiries of their own into any study they are considering. But there are still issues that must be addressed, and until these problems are rectified, black Americans must embrace medical research warily. These issues include the recent erosion of informed consent, the need for better quality research into black health issues, the overemphasis upon genetic research in non-genetic issues, and the government's distortion of research with black Americans to further political and ideological ends. It is the most fundamental tenet of medical ethics and human decency that the subjects volunteer for the experiment after being informed of its nature and hazards. This is the clear dividing line between criminal and what may be non-criminal. If the experimental subjects cannot be said to have volunteered, then the inquiry need proceed no further. So testified Andrew Ivey, M.D., chief witness for the prosecution in the Nuremberg doctor's trial. The Nuremberg Code was instituted in August 1947 by Americans judging 23 physicians and scientists to ensure that the horrors of abusive medical experimentation never again be visited upon the world. Its very first line is unambiguous. The consent of the subject is absolutely essential. But American research culture increasingly disagrees. In October 1996, the Department of Health and Human Services passed 21 CFR 50.24, a regulation that robbed seriously ill emergency room patients of the right to informed consent. This allows researchers to legally enroll such patients in medical research studies and test experimental therapies on them without their consent. The emergency room deaths began the very next year, on April 1, 1997, when the Occupational Health and Hygiene Plan, OHHP, suspended a U.S. clinical trial that had enrolled unwitting patients in a clinical trial of diasporin cross-linked hemoglobin, DCLHB, for treating shock. So many more people who received the experimental treatment died than those receiving standard care that the trial had to be stopped early. These people had never given their consent to participate in the study that killed them. Yet today the practice of experimenting with non-consenting emergency room patients continues. For example, when they need a blood transfusion, unconscious patients brought into some emergency rooms are as likely to be given an artificial substitute as blood, without their knowledge. Also, the Abiocor company proposes to implant their complication-ridden model of a self-contained artificial heart into a wide variety of heart attack patients, who are brought into emergency rooms if they meet certain, rather wide, research criteria, again, without their permission or knowledge. And informed consent is also being attacked more insidiously in assaults upon existing laws. Various ethicists who are experts in human medical experimentation, such as J. Katz, M.D., and George Annis, J.D., worry that the vague language of federal regulations governing human medical experimentation is being interpreted in a manner that minimizes protections. At the same time, they point out addenda to these regulations that further curtail patient protection and patient autonomy while expanding the types and number of people who can become subjects. The erosion of consent is often presented as a partial surrender or a compromise between the needs of researchers for subjects and a small loss to a patient autonomy. Or it is presented behind the mask of futility. In such scenarios, it is argued, the patient is unconscious and cannot agree or disagree to partaking of a possibly life-saving experimental treatment, so his doctors should decide for him. In such cases, research is conflated with treatment to justify removing informed consent from the equation but these scenarios are false and misleading. It is not necessary to waive informed consent in order to provide the unconscious with treatment. Laws already exist that permit doctors to offer the best available treatment to patients who are comatose, unconscious, under age, 
or in other ways unable to consent to treatment. But these laws do not extend to experimentation, and rightly so. Treatment focuses upon the patient's needs. Experimentation focuses upon the researcher's needs. No matter how much those researchers may invoke possible or future benefits for patients. In fact, these studies are typically randomized, which means that the computer, not the doctor, determines which experimental therapy will be administered. This may not be the best treatment for the patient, nor the therapy the patient would choose. Once one loses the right to be told what one is about to undergo, to agree or to refuse participation, research policy gains momentum on a very slippery slope. This book documents the depths to which researchers have stooped to bypass the consent of the subject. In fact, African Americans first became favored subjects because during the antebellum period they did not enjoy legal protections and researchers did not need their consent. This vulnerability also persists today in other settings where blacks are overrepresented, such as military ground troops. In 1990, The Department of Defense (DoD) sought and obtained from the Food and Drug Administration a waiver of the informed consent requirements for human medical experimentation. Under Rule 21 CFR 50.23d, soldiers suddenly lost the protection of the informed consent provisions that give other Americans the right to say no to experimental medications. The DoD forced them to accept experimental drugs. Including pyridostigmine bromide, a putative prophylactic against nerve gas attack, and the pentavalent botulinum toxoid vaccine for botulism. In 1998, with FDA permission, the DoD anthrax vaccination immunization program (AVIP) also began immunizing 2.4 million soldiers against the potential threat of airborne anthrax. At least 900,000 troops have been immunized to date, but citing devastating side effects and deaths that have been validated by amendments to the medication warning labels, hundreds of soldiers have refused to comply. At least 100 of whom have been court-martialed, and many have been forced to leave the military. One of these was Jamikia Barber, who, while stationed in Colorado, Was ordered to accept an anthrax vaccination in preparation for a transfer to Korea. She disobeyed that order on the grounds that the vaccination may not be safe for females of childbearing age. Black soldiers, such as Barber, are twice as common in ground troops as in American society, and so are especially vulnerable to measures such as forced vaccinations. In late 2003. Judge Emmett G. Sullivan of the United States District Court in Washington, D.C., noted that the Supreme Court had ruled that U.S. combat troops could no longer be compelled to take the experimental anthrax vaccinations. The FDA responded by rapidly elevating the anthrax vaccine from a questionable investigational drug to an approved therapeutic, allowing the DoD to sidestep the intent of the law. And restoring the soldiers to a state of investigative servitude, investigative, because the data collection and evaluation of the anthrax vaccine risks, including death, will continue among soldiers. Fortunately, in 2004, Judge Sullivan ordered the DoD to stop forcing anthrax vaccines on U.S. military personnel. Barber's lawsuit against the Army continues. Today. African Americans are at greater risks than whites of being conscripted into such research without giving their consent, because blacks are more likely than whites to receive their health care from emergency rooms. However, this coin of research vulnerability has an obverse. We also need more and better research into black health care. Such high-quality research has begun to emerge, but as Chapter 14 points out. It has also taken some wrong turns. For example, research into black ailments and medications, such as that conducted in support of the black heart failure drug Bidil, is sometimes sloppy and illogical, 
and in other cases it is based on the thinnest of premises. The long history of flawed science in the service of preconceived notions is being supplemented by new, insufficiently questioned racial theories of disease. Adopting these unquestioningly, while ignoring important environmental disease factors, not only imperils black health, it also reinforces the idea of blacks as possessing dramatic physiological differences. The inclusion of blacks in quality American medical research is also important for everyone. Why? Many arguments cite the dollar savings or the reduction in disease exposure to the larger society that will emanate from better health care among African Americans. However, I am often uncomfortable with arguments that focus solely on utility, especially when it comes to medicine and health. Such benefits can be elusive or hard to quantify. I believe that caring for people and maximizing their chances at health and happiness are goals that we should pursue for their own sake, because they are the right thing to do. They elevate us spiritually and socially and reaffirm our cohesion and our humanity. But that said, there is no denying that increasing the ethical, reasonably safe research available to African Americans will benefit everyone else. This book has repeatedly demonstrated how the poor health profile spawned by experimental abuse has not only harmed blacks, but has spilled over to harm their white compatriots. Pathogens, for instance, are notoriously democratic. Had African Americans not been excluded from early AZT therapy on the basis of flawed HIV treatment clinical trials that largely excluded them, would the number of HIV-infected African Americans be lower today? Would the number of all domestic AIDS cases be lower, considering that black Americans today constitute half of all the HIV-infected? It's too late to know now, but not too late to do better racial recruitment for the next HIV clinical trials. The fallout extends beyond infectious disease. For example, Donna Christian Christensen, M.D., who represents the U.S. Virgin Islands in Congress, has observed that the percentage of black Americans who are insured is lower than that of white Americans, and the cost of caring for these uninsured people raises the rates and health care costs of all Americans. She said, we're getting to the hospital late, using much more expensive care. We're really driving up the costs of health care. In fact, a decade ago, research by Harvard School of Public Health professors Ichiro Kawachi, M.D., and Deborah prothro Stith, M.D., explained this public health phenomenon in detail and even quantified it, emerging with what was popularly referred to as the Robin Hood Index. The shorthand is that public health suffers more in the nations with the greatest inequities in wealth, and that the middle class suffers nearly as much as the poorer from inequities. In the United States, which has, for example, one of the world's greatest disparities in income between the haves and the have-nots, we have not only the greatest health disparities, but the greatest health cost burdens for the mostly white middle class. In short, Whites should care about quality medical research for African Americans because its dearth has generated needless pain, suffering, anger, and costs that continue to permeate the fabric of our entire nation. It is not only a racial tragedy, but also an American tragedy. For their part, African Americans cannot afford passivity. Seneca said, It is part of the cure to wish to be cured. When it comes to medical research, that wish must be awakened in African Americans. African Americans should not shun life-saving research. Indeed, they cannot afford to do so. Instead, they must carefully scrutinize research initiatives before becoming subjects. But we must do more. We must also address the dearth of therapeutic research in areas that affect the health of African Americans most dramatically. What changes are necessary to achieve this? 
Repair the System of Institutional Review Boards, IRBs. IRBs judge the scientific and ethical acceptability of proposed studies on human subjects. However, a string of abusive experiments have revealed that the nation's 5,000 IRBs have failed to perform their role of protecting the public, and African Americans in particular. In June 1998, a Department of Health and Human Services HHS report concluded that IRB staff are inadequately trained, subject to conflicts of interest, and overwhelmed by too many cases. The Office of Protection from Research Risks, OPRR, requires IRBs to have a minimum of five members, at least one of whom must have primarily scientific interests, another of whom must have primarily non-scientific interests, and another of whom must be otherwise unaffiliated with the IRB's institution. But most IRB members are scientists affiliated with the organization in question, and even the lay members tend to have loyalties to the home institution. I propose that each IRB be composed of equal numbers of scientists and peers of the group who will be asked to participate as subjects. Some may object that lay people will be unable to understand enough about scientific experiments to judge their suitability and value. But as a medical communicator, I doubt this. I know many skilled and motivated scientists who routinely convey complex information to many people, although to do so may require some preparation and effort. Moreover, if a project cannot be explained to laypersons in an IRB meeting, how does a researcher propose to explain it to the potential subjects, as he must do by law? I also propose that each IRB include a medical ethicist and, if possible, a medical historian. Stop the Erosion of Consent Ban Exceptions to Informed Consent Recognize the right of every patient to say yes or no as an absolute value and cease designating groups such as soldiers, unconscious emergency room patients, and third-world experimental subjects as appropriate subjects without their input. When physicians are faced with a patient who is unable to consent because of his or her medical condition, and whose condition requires treatment before a family member or other proxy can be consulted, I propose that the patient be treated as if the physician had no research protocol to worry about. Treat him or her, but don't enroll that patient in a study. Instead, Use the best known treatment for that particular individual. Institute a Coordinated System of Mandatory Subject Education The NIH and the Office of Research Integrity require that every practicing medical researcher receive education in the ethical and practical conduct of biomedical research. I took such a course at Harvard Medical School in 2004 and found it factually invaluable and culturally revealing. I propose that prospective research subjects be given the same advantage. Every institution that receives government funds to perform research should be required to hold approximately three classes that equip subjects with information about how research is conducted, what risks and benefits are inherent in different types of research, what their legal rights and moral responsibilities are, what sort of questions they should ask, and how they can maximize their chances of getting the desired result from the clinical trial they enter. Except for seriously ill or otherwise incapacitated patients, only people who have completed this course should be eligible to participate in government-funded clinical trials, and only they should be permitted to serve on IRBs. Embrace a single standard of research ethics. We cannot retain moral credibility if we champion human rights in medical research at home and ignore them abroad. Researchers should be made to follow informed consent strictures abroad that are as restrictive as those governing their research on American shores. Pharmaceutical companies should be forced to make life-saving drugs available to people in poor countries, even when this means sacrificing their obese profits for the benefit of human welfare. 
Because the federal government sponsors much of the research that enables pharmaceutical companies to develop vital medications, the federal government should take advantage of its legal right either to force manufacturers to lower their prices or to suspend patent enforcement in poor countries. However, more important than any of the above recommendations is the need for African Americans to set their own research agendas. Black patients must take ownership of medical research issues, as they have done with so many other complex health issues, from AIDS to environmental racism. Already, expert medical organizations have taken leadership roles. The National Center for Bioethics in Research and Healthcare at Tuskegee University provides not only a center for scholars, but also a venue for much-needed lay education on medical research. The National Medical Association has also spearheaded patient education through its project IMPACT, which has helped black Americans to navigate clinical trials safely by providing brochures, websites, and access to experts. African American and other health organizations must continue and expand the work of these pivotal groups. And much of this can be done close to home, through church health fairs, social organizations, and community activism. I challenge African Americans to bring medical research education to the fore of the American health agenda. I challenge you, the reader, to familiarize yourself with the informational documents on this book's website and elsewhere, to join an IRB, to ask the hard questions of physicians who are recruiting in your community, and to join appropriate clinical trials once you have satisfied yourself that they are worthwhile and relatively safe. I challenge African Americans to effect a transformation of our attitudes toward medical research and to demand our place at the table to enjoy the rich bounty of the American medical system in the form of longer, healthier lives. I challenge us to change, because, as Charles Darwin once observed, it is not the strongest species that will survive, nor the most intelligent, but the one most responsive to change. This concludes Medical Apartheid by Harriet A. Washington. Narrated by Ron Butler. Copyright 2006 by Harriet A. Washington. This unabridged audiobook is published by arrangement with Anchor, care of ICM Partners, and was produced in the year 2016 by Tantor Media Incorporated, a division of recorded books, which holds the copyright thereto. Please visit Tantor.com for more information on our growing library of unabridged audiobooks and to take advantage of special offers.